Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? The clerk. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Yes, Mr President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I call the acting leader of the government, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And I seek leave to move a motion relating to the hours of meeting. Leave granted. It is Senator Cash. Thank you. I move that one, the hours of meeting for Monday, the 23rd of August, 2021, be 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. A, divisions may take place between 6:30 p.m. and 7:20 p.m. And B, the question for the adjournment be proposed at 7:20 p.m. Two. The hours of meeting for Tuesday, 24 August 2021, be midday to 8 p.m., and the question for the adjournment be proposed at 7:20 p.m. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I call the senator. I was going to call the clerk unless there's another senator Rustin. I move that the customs amendment banning goods produced by forced labour bill 2021 be considered today at the time for private senators' bills. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Private senators' bills order the day number 79. Customs amendment banning goods produced by forced labour bill 2021. Resumption of second reading debate. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I rise to speak on this uh, very important bill, the, the Custom Amendments Banning Goods Produced by Forced Labour Bill 2021. The purpose of this bill is to ban absolutely the importation of goods that are produced in whole or in part by forced labour, that is, slavery. Estimates of the number of slaves across the world range from some 38 million to 46 million. The use of forced labour within global production chains has emerged as a major humanitarian concern. The issue of modern slavery has also been highlighted by the well-documented human rights abuses perpetrated by the Chinese government against hundreds of thousands of Uyghur people in Xinjiang uh, in Western China. The massive and systematic oppression of the Uyghur people by the Chinese Communist regime is undeniable including the exploitation of detained Uyghurs as a cap captive labour force. Uyghur forced labour plays a key role in Xinjiang's massive cotton production and extends across an array of Chinese industries, including the supply chains of, of global brands. In 2020, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute estimated at least 80,000 Uyghur detainees had been shipped out of Xinjiang and assigned to factories in a range of supply chains, including electronics, textiles and automotive, under a central government policy known as Xinjiang Aid. ASPI identified 27 factories in nine Chinese provinces that are using Uyghur labour transferred from Xinjiang since 2017. Some 83 foreign and Chinese companies uh, allegedly were directly or indirectly benefiting from exploitation of Uyghur workers outside Xinjiang through abusive labour programs. Some of the, the international brands allegedly involved are very well known, including Apple, Esprit, Fila, Abercrombie & Finch, Adidas, 
uh, Amazon, BMW, uh, Gap, H&M, Mark and Spencer's, Nike, North Face, Puma, and Samsung. International action against modern slavery is building. Not only have a growing number of countries enacted laws against modern slavery, there's also increased action to deal with products of forced labour in China. In January this year, the US government implemented an executive order banning the, the importation <coughs> excuse me, of cotton and other products from Xinjiang. <coughs> in July, the US Senate passed a bill to ban the import of all products from Xinjiang. The need for Australia to address this pressing problem caused me to introduce the Customs Amendment banning goods produced by Uyghur Forced Labor Bill 2020 on the 8th of December last year. The purpose of the bill was to amend the Customs Act 1901 to ban the importation of goods uh, produced or manufactured in Xinjiang or else manufactured in China through the use of forced labor. That bill was referred to the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence, Trade and Legislation Committee, chaired by Senator Abetz and Senator Kitching, as deputy chair. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Senator Abetz and Senator Kitching and other members of the committee for their work on that important inquiry. I also wish to thank the many people and organisations that made submissions and gave evidence especially members of the Australian Uyghur community who faced harassment from the Chinese government officials here in Australia and grave threats to family members, relatives and friends in Xinjiang. Now, the committee reported to the Senate on 17 June this year. The committee endorsed without reservation the objectives of my bill and went on to observe that, and I quote, the state-sponsored forced labour to which the Uyghur people have been subjected by the Chinese dictatorship is a grave human rights violation. It is incumbent upon the government to take steps to ensure that Australian businesses and consumers are not in any way complicit in these egregious abuses. The committee took the view that it would be preferable to introduce a global ban on the import of a, uh, to Australia of goods produced by forced labour. However, within the context of a global ban, the committee further highlighted uh, the, uh, to the need for specific action to be taken in relation to Xinjiang's cotton trade. I have expressed my support for the committee's primary recommendation for a local ban and for other recommendations relating to the government, to government policy, administrative and enforcement matters. My concern has always been that action be taken quickly to ensure that Australia's condemnation of the Chinese government's shameful persecution and exploitation of Uyghur people is made absolutely clear. The committee's report is an important step forward, and legislative implementation must not be delayed. There must be an immediate response from the Australian parliament, not, not the usual protracted process of government review that may lead to legislative and administrative action in two or three years. That is not acceptable. Accordingly, rather than amend the original bills, this new bill seeks to implement the committee's primary recommendation without delay. The ban, would, uh, the, the ban would, that this bill would implement is a global in nature and does not specify any geographic origin for its application. The importation into Australia of any goods found to have been produced by forced labour, as already defined by the Criminal Code, will be subject to the penalties that apply to the importation of other imports prohibited by regulation under the Customs Acts, for example, asbestos. The bill is, I acknowledge, something of a blunt instrument, but that's what's needed to thwart modern slavery, especially China's resort to ma the massive use of forced labour. If Australia is to be uh, true to the democratic values we hold, we need to leave the Chinese government in no doubt that its conduct is unconscionable and unacceptable. And this uh, action cannot be further delayed. It must happen within the life of this parliament, indeed within this calendar year. We need to send a very clear political signal to Beijing and to the numerous international brands that have been happy to turn a blind eye to China's massive exploitation of forced labour. 
We need to send that signal right now. Before the Beijing Winter Olympics next February, just six months away, when the Chinese Communist Party intend to bask in a massive international propaganda event. Passage of this bill by the Senate will be an important step forward in the international campaign against modern slavery and in the brutal repression of the Uyghur people in particular. It will send a very clear signal uh, that the CP C CCP's human rights abuses will be called out. I understand that the Labor opposition, the Greens and members of the crossbench are prepared to support this bill. I strongly urge government senators that have been vocal about this issue to do likewise, otherwise their many strong words will be shown to be quite hollow. Passage of this bill through the Senate will hopefully force the hand of government, which so far has been sluggish, indeed most reluctant, to move on the issue. It would be a grave failure on the part of the Australian Parliament as a whole if we do not call out and take action to limit the massive abuses of human rights by the Chinese Communist regime. This bill is part of a growing international campaign against modern slavery and those who profit from such human rights abuses, um, and it will do just that. It will seek to send a very strong message it will seek to contribute to the worldwide effort uh, to stop this abhorrent trade. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Patrick. Uh, Senator Abetz. Thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. Slave labour is a scourge which needs to be rooted out. It is a cruelty inflicted by humans against humans in denial of human values and fundamental human rights. So I congratulate Senator Patrick on this initiative and fully understand that which motivates him in putting this bill before the Senate today. I also want to acknowledge the work of the Secretariat and other committee members of the Senate's Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Legislation Committee that looked at Senator Patrick's bill, crafted uh, a report and made a, a list of some 14 recommendations. For slavery to exist, there must be a procurer of the slaves and a market for them and their work. And the genesis of this bill clearly is the disgust held by, held at the behaviour of the Chinese Communist Party dictatorship's treatment of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang province. One million of their own people in concentration camps, slave labour camps. So this brutal dictatorship is the procurer of the slaves and the market for their labour is both the dictatorship and many businesses which are able to supply on the world market at prices cheaper than competitors because of the slave labour savings. Senator Patrick has outlined a number of those businesses, so I won't have to go through that list again. This is a real and present issue. It is difficult to believe that large businesses aren't aware of this scandalous supply chain. Yet so often we hear from big business moralising on all matter of things, but they don't seem to have the capacity to do so when it hits their uh, bottom uh, line, their profit. Decency and a moral compass should dictate our corporate citizens in this country would not source product from such human rights denying hellholes, but seemingly some do. To their credit, West Farmers have taken a positive, principled, proactive stance. I, for one, salute them for their position, which stands in contrast to the attitude of the Australia-China Business Council, which during a hearing into another matter referred to, I believe quite dismissively, the colour and movement, quote, the colour and movement in Xinjiang province. Indeed, in a hearing on the 10th of June this year, I uh, put to 
the representative of the Australia-China Business Council. Uh, my concern at his use of the word words colorant movement in Xinjiang province. And I asked, would you agree with me that the events occurring there are a little more serious than just colorant movement when you've got one million people in concentration camps and parliament like the Canadian parliament determining that genocide, forced organ harvesting and slave labor are occurring. Would you agree with me that that terminology of colorant movement doesn't really create the full picture of the atrocities that are going on. Regrettably, Madam Deputy President, we got this very weak answer. I would agree that it was a poor choice of words, but neither would I necessarily choose the words that you've chosen. So I'll meet you somewhere in the middle. Just consider that for a moment. One million citizens in slave labor concentration camps forced organ harvesting, the abuses go on, and the China Business Council is unable to acknowledge that the word atrocity should or could be used. And later on, it seeks to dismiss all these uh, human rights abuses as simply reports. And that he wasn't going to use the words because he didn't think it was constructive. And then, when talking about it, he said, we could have a very long and tortuous discussion about this. It really is a matter of regret that the former CEO of that same organisation described our great country as little Australia, as a shag on a rock and diminished our country. But look, that said, Madam Deputy President, this is a bill that uh, is important, one that the government is a uh, supports with the intent of the legislation and acknowledges the importance of the issues. And just in case people are under any misapprehension, there is already in Australia the uh, Modern Slavery Act of 2018 of relative recent origin. And this bill, uh, this act drives business due diligence around supply chains and the government recently also committed $10.6 million to implement Australia's National Action Plan to combat modern slavery 2020-2025, which delivers initiatives to prevent, disrupt, investigate and prosecute modern slavery crimes. As Senator Patrick uh, indicated, his bill originally was only in relation to the Uyghurs on the strength of our report, he accepts that it should have broad application, and that is what this, uh, that is what the government has sought. And I commend Senator Patrick uh, for that amendment to his bill. The government has sought on numerous occasions to assist in the disruption of these supply chains, but it is, uh, Madam Deputy President, uh, considerably difficult for government and sometimes businesses, especially small businesses, to fully understand uh, the degree of the supply chain and where product and from where product is originally sourced. But can I say to the state governments in Tasmania, uh, in Australia, that are seeking to source trains from Xinjiang province? you can be in no doubt as to what is occurring in Xinjiang province and the fact that you are pursuing and continuing to pursue the contracts for the supply of trains and carriages from Xinjiang province when you know what is going on is a matter of, I believe, a national scandal, a national disgrace, which uh, brings a lot of disrepute on yourself um, and your state governments. You should be desisting from assisting the supply chains, from assisting the Communist Party dictatorship in China in circumstances where the depravity of these uh, poor individuals that are making these trains is now so well known.
In the uh, committee's report to the Senate, 14 recommendations were, ma were made, and time does not permit me to go through all of them. But simply to say that this, any legislation of this nature should have broad application, such as the Magnitsky legislation, which uh, another committee on which I sit has brought before the parliament a report suggesting that we should have Magnitsky type legislation. And its origin was in fact the Russian oligarchs and their corruption. But it doesn't only apply to Russia and its oligarchs, it should apply across the board, across the world. Similarly, with slave labor legislation, it should apply across the board to any potential supply chain of this nature. And uh, that the government takes this seriously uh, cannot be in any doubt. So can I conclude my remarks, Deputy President, by saying this is a bill worthy of consideration and support in principle. Until such time as a detailed examination of its various clauses has been undertaken, and we have the whole of government response to the Senate Committee's report, I believe it is premature to deal with this bill on a vote. Senator Patrick himself uh, acknowledged that this was a blunt instrument, and I don't seek to misquote him in relation to that, because I understand the reason and rationale that he used those words. But when dealing with blunt instruments to deal with a horrendous issue, and with that I'm on all fours with Senator Patrick, can I simply say that there does need to be a very deep analysis of every single clause to ensure that there are not any unforeseen uh, consequences or circumstances. So can I say uh, to Senator Patrick and to the Senate uh, that if this bill were to go to a vote, my heart would say yes, but my head would be saying not yet. Good intentions are always to be applauded, and Senator Patrick should be fully applauded for what he is seeking to do uh, with this bill. But life has also taught me that too often on examination, good intentions are exposed as sometimes naive, sometimes counterproductive. I believe that in this case, there is no naivety in that which is being uh, sought and pursued, but there is the possibility of unforeseen consequences or counterproductive outcomes which would not suit the purposes of the originator of this bill. So, Senator Patrick, congratulations on bringing this issue forward, but I would suggest to the Senate that we wait until we get the full government response, we get the analysis of the bill in some detail from the department so that we can move forward in a coherent manner to ensure that the sort of human rights abuses that are occurring 24-7 in Xinjiang province are not simply dismissed as colour and movement, as was so appallingly done by the Australia-China Business Council, but that the matter is taken seriously, that we deal with the issues and ensure that we can wipe out this horrid trade in human misery. So, as I said, my heart says yes to this bill, my head says not yet, and I trust that the Senate will defer a vote of, uh, on this bill and consideration be deferred until all the evidence is together so we have the best possible product to protect the peoples of the world that are submitted to slave labour. I thank the Senate. Thank you, uh, Senator Betts. And just before I call you, uh, Senator Watts, I do want to note that um, Australia is experiencing very difficult times, but it's very pleasing to see women leading our Senate chamber uh, this week. Senator Watt. Could not agree more, Madam Deputy President, including yourself. Um, Madam Deputy President, I rise to contribute to the debate on the customs amendment banning goods produced by forced labour bill. I will say from the outset that Labor will be supporting Senator Patrick's bill 
and I foreshadow that I will move a second reading amendment in the name of Senator Keneally at the end of my contribution. In 2018, the Global Slavery Index estimated that over 40 million individuals across the world were trapped in some form of modern slavery. For nearly 25 million people, that was forced labour, most prominently in Eritrea, Burundi and North Korea, but occurring in nearly every corner of the globe in some way or other. For context, 25 million people is roughly the population of our nation. And yet, I'm sure that there are many here in Australia who are not aware of this horror. We often speak of slavery in the past tense, as if it were a crime against humanity that we've thoroughly consigned to the history books. A scourge that climaxed with the Emancipation Proclamation, something that today can only be found in books and film. And yet, it is the reality for many millions of people around the world who live their lives in bondage. For every one of us, there is one of them, living a life of cruelty and despair. It is not that our abhorrence towards slavery has weakened, but rather that the problem has evolved in a rapidly developing modern world. The current iteration of forced labour and servitude is now hidden and obscured by the complex supply chains of our global trading system. And so, Noting the enormity and complexity of this issue, it is vital that countries like Australia show leadership, particularly in our region, in combating modern slavery and forced labour. Because modern slavery is not foreign to us here. It happens in the Asia-Pacific and it even occurs here in Australia. In 2018, it was estimated that roughly two-thirds of the people trapped in forced labour and slavery lived in the Asia-Pacific region. The same report says that there were roughly 4,300 people in Australia today living in these horrific circumstances. This is an issue that isn't relegated to history or far-flung lands. It happens in our own backyard and in our own community. It is something that the Australian Labor Party has always taken a strong stand against. Labor led the push for an Australian Modern Slavery Act and later moved amendments to the Modern Slavery Bill in 2018 to improve its effectiveness, introduce penalties for non-compliance and establish an independent anti-slavery commission. These amendments were not supported by the Liberal National Government at the time. In the intervening period, the world has witnessed a growing number of horrifying reports of forced labour and human rights violations. Evidently, we as a global community need to do more, and that starts at home. Labor has also taken a strong stance against the exploitation of our airports to smuggle people into the country. Over 130,000 people have been brought to Australia through these loopholes, and many have ended up working in slavery-like conditions in our horticulture sector. These people are being trafficked by organised crime and illegitimate labour hire companies, and many have been subjected to wage theft, abuse and sexual assault while the Go Slow Department of Home Affairs processes their applications. This is a significant problem that has been ignored and denied by those opposite. And so we welcome this private senator's bill today because we recognise that more must be done to combat modern slavery and we fully appreciate how pervasive the problem has become. We also, think, we also thank Senator Patrick for engaging with the committee process and adopting recommendations of the Senate inquiry into this bill. Whilst we support the proposed legislation, we recognise that this bill will only go so far in addressing the problems at hand. The Senate inquiry and key stakeholders have highlighted a number of ways that the bill could be improved to ensure that it is more effective in addressing modern slavery. Firstly, the bill does not address what information or what standard of proof is required to ban a product produced by forced labour. Does the bill require a proven crime beyond reasonable doubt before the government can take action? It is not clear whether this is the standard of proof required or whether some lesser measure would be used. 
It was the view of the committee, as well as key stakeholders, that the standard should be where the evidence reasonably, but not conclusively, indicates that imports were produced in whole or in part by forced labour. This is also the approach taken by the United States government with the Tariff Act. With this standard, the burden would then be shifted back to importers and the producers of the good to demonstrate the absence of forced labour in their supply chain. Without such a standard, the bill may introduce a ban that is unworkable in the real world. Secondly, the bill does not outline an open referral mechanism, another feature employed by Washington in their fight against forced labour. An open referral mechanism would allow anyone to petition the Australian Border Force to investigate allegations of forced labour. Further, this open referral mechanism should then necessitate a transparent process by which the reasons for the acceptance or rejection of a petition would be published. This would increase the practicality of the ban and allow for greater transparency and accountability over its implementation. Thirdly, the bill doesn't provide the Australian Border Force enough power to investigate in instances where they believe goods produced by forced labour are being imported. Without the ability to issue detention orders for specific goods, companies or regions with high risk of forced labour, the ABF is significantly hamstrung in the way it can enforce the ban. Without explicitly outlining these powers in the bill, the ABF's ability to investigate and enforce the ban will be hampered. Fourthly, we must ensure fa fairness in this system. There should be a process by which importers can challenge a finding or order made by the ABF in the investigation of goods produced by forced labour. It is important that importers who can demonstrate that they have taken every reasonable effort to verify the source and the type of labour used and have provided sufficient evidence that the shipped goods were not produced with forced labour or not unfairly, are not unfairly dis disadvantaged. If they cannot satisfy these requirements, the goods should be seized and detained. This, in turn, would create a commercial imperative for importers to have done their own homework before importing a good. If they can provide their proof, they will be able to secure the swift release of their product. And finally, the bill would be improved by specifically articulating transparency measures that should be specifically laid out in the bill. Ideally, in the way of a publicly available register, which outlines the number of investigations, the number of petitions, the number of detention orders and the details of any findings of forced labour. This is what best practice would look like in a bill of this kind. And we acknowledge the work of the Senate committee and a number of stakeholders who have engaged with this process to attempt to achieve the most effective and practical ban possible. Despite what we've outlined above, Labor supports any efforts to combat modern slavery. And so, in moving our second reading amendment, we seek to acknowledge the important work of Senator Patrick and we call on the Morrison government to do more than match the effort and resolve from Labor and the crossbench to combat this horrible crime. It's evident what must be done. The Morrison government needs to work with Labor and the crossbench to amend the Modern Slavery Act to introduce penalties for non-compliance and require mandatory reporting on exposure to specified issues of pressing concern, including Uyghur forced labour. Australia is way behind many of our like-minded partners in addressing forced labour and modern slavery. It is vital that we pursue an effective, country-agnostic approach to address these global problems. Without leadership, our region will continue to be exploited by those who profit from the misery of forced labour. But to effectively address the myriad issues presented by modern slavery, the Morrison government needs to, do, needs to do more than amend laws. The government needs to work with consumers and producers alike to boost, to boost the transparency of global supply chains. This should include work across the Australian Border Force, the Australian Sanctions Office and AUSTRAC with international partners to increase outreach and information sharing. An independent anti-slavery commissioner, which Labor has called for, could lead and should lead this important work. 
the Morrison government should also engage in regular dialogues with unions, industry groups and human rights organisations in order to more quickly identify potential issues and address them properly. Additionally, properly funded research into forced labour is vital if we are to identify and combat the issue. Australia should ratify the International Labor Organization's 2014 Forced Labor Protocol. If Australia wants to speak with global credibility on ending forced labour, it must join the 45 other countries, including the UK, New Zealand, Canada, France and Germany, that have ratified the protocol and fully abide by the ILO's Forced Labor Convention. The Morrison government should consider publishing an annual list of countries, regions, industries and products with a high risk of modern slavery, including forced labour. Companies importing from these places would have the onus placed on them to prove goods are not made with forced labour. It could also consider targeted sanctions on foreign companies, officials and other entities known to be directly profiting from Uyghur forced labour and other human rights abuses. The Morrison government should lead by example and conduct a comprehensive review of its procurement procedures and supply chains and disclose this publicly as part of its existing modern slavery report. This should act as a blueprint for state and territory governments to also review their supply chains and ensure they are not importing goods made, by, made from forced labour, including in Xinjiang. None of my comments here should be a shock to anyone. This is the solution that Labor has long called for to properly address this complex issue. Without these changes, we fear that the millions of people who live their lives in forced labour and slavery will never leave it. It is a stain on our humanity that it exists, and we should do everything that we can to stop it. And so we move our second reading amendment to this effect, and we again reiterate our support for Senator Patrick's bill. We support this legislation and strongly support its intent. Slavery has not been consigned to the history books, but it should be. For the 40 million people around the world living their lives in bondage, including the millions in our region and the thousands in Australia, we owe them all our efforts to outlaw and combat this scourge. Real leadership and resolve is required to make modern slavery a thing of the past. And so I commend this bill to the Senate and I move the second reading amendment in Senator Keneally's name. Thank you. We will now go to Senator Rice remotely. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. And I am very pleased to be here today supporting this bill of Senator Patrick's. It's a very important bill. It's an incredibly important issue, the fact that we have forced labour, that we have slavery continuing today, that slavery is not a thing of the past, of the past that there are 40 million people around the world who are still subject to the appalling conditions of living as bonded labourers, as slaves in forced labour. I thank Senator Patrick for bringing this bill to us and I thank him for modifying the bill from the first version that we saw, which was focused on the atrocities and the appalling conditions suffered by the Uyghurs in China. Because it is important to acknowledge what's going on in China, acknowledge the huge, um, massive attacks on, on Uyghur people's human rights in China. But it's also important to acknowledge that this is not an issue that is just restricted to China. This is not an issue just restricted to the Uyghur population. There are issues of modern slavery, of forced labour all around the world. So I really do thank Senator Patrick for having broadened the extent of the bill which was one of the recommend, one of, uh, recommendation by many of the people who put in submissions to his previous bill. And as Senator Patrick himself acknowledged, acknowledged in his contribution, this bill isn't perfect. And as Senator Watt just told us, there are many ways that this bill could be improved. And the Greens support most of those critiques of the bill and would like to see our legislative framework improve to pick up on many of those issues that Senator Watt just raised. But that does not 
take away from the importance of this bill of putting the issue of forced labour around the world and what the Australian government's response should be fairly and squarely on the agenda, on the table for us today. And yes, this, this bill should be improved, but so should the rest of our framework for addressing human rights. Until we have a legislative framework that puts human rights, the rights of people to be living decent lives, to be not oppressed, the rights of people to have their freedom, to have freedom of speech, to have freedom of movement, freedom of association, until we have a framework that covers that and puts that at the core, not just of our um, foreign policy, it needs to be at the core of our foreign policy, it needs to be at the core of our trade policy, it needs to be at the core of our aid policy. And this bill is an important contribution towards changing our legislative framework for that to occur. And so as such, the Greens are very happy to be supporting it um, as a step forward. As I said, this bill as we know, began with the appalling conditions being suffered by up to a million or more Uyghur people in China. And we have heard so much in this parliament, and quite rightly, as, as to what the conditions that they are. I mean, it's horrific, basically, cultural genocide that's being to undertaken against the Uyghur people with detention of up to a million people, the forced labour that this bill is addressing, reports of systematic rape, and the widespread destruction of, or damaging of thousands of mosques. So whatever we can do as Australians to be addressing this is important, and we need to keep the focus on. We cannot just let it just be put to the side and say, because China are a very you know, large country, a very powerful force in the world, that there's nothing that we can, we can do, because there are things that we can do, and, and we must do them. But as I have said, it's also important that we acknowledge that this isn't just an issue um, focused on China, and we need to broaden it out. And one reason why we need to broaden it out is that we need to make sure that when we are talking about the appalling human rights abuses being meted out by the Chinese government, by that totalitarian regime, it is important that we don't get ourselves into a frame of thinking that it's only China that's doing that because it's not. There are other appalling human rights abuses all around the world, as we know. We, you know I've just spent the, spent the weekend focused on the, the tragic um, circumstances that are currently unfolding in Afghanistan, as I'm sure that many of us have, and that we're going to be hearing a lot more about this week, and the, the rise of the Taliban in Afghanistan, the massive, um, the massacres, the deaths that they are imposing and are likely to be imposing upon people. We've seen the coup in Myanmar. We have seen regimes such as in, in Saudi Arabia. We have got issues all around the world and we need to make sure that they are being addressed. So it's not just a focus just on China. And we've got to be very careful that we um, take whatever action we can to make sure that by having a focus on the actions of the Chinese government, that we don't flame anti-Chinese racism here in Australia. So we've got to put all of our work that we are doing in a framework of respect for human rights everywhere, including in Australia, and respect for the human rights of people of Chinese heritage here in Australia, who we know, with the focus on China over the the last um, year or so, there has been a huge increase in racism directed at people of Chinese heritage in Australia. So it is very important that this bill has been modified. So it's not just focused on, on China, it is focused on slavery, on forced labour, wherever it occurs in the world. And you know, other places in the world where it does occur, as I said, 40 million people who are subject to slavery or um, conditions of forced labour around the world. We have got, in particular, um, for example, a um, state-sanctioned forced labour is particularly com common in the cotton sector in Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan. Each year during the harvest season, citizens are forced out of regular jobs to spend weeks picking cotton at work. In Saudi Arabia, we have millions of migrant workers filling mostly manual, clerical and service jobs in Saudi Arabia, constituting more than 80% of the private sector workforce, governed by an abusive kafala system 
that gives their employees, employers excessive power over their mobility and legal status in the country. And human rights tell us that the system underpins migrant rate workers' vulnerability to a wide range of abuses, from passport confiscation to delayed wages and forced labour. And there is little that's being done to dismantle the kafala system, which is leaving migrant workers in Saudi Arabia at high risk of abuse. And then, in fact, there are other elements of forced labour, such as prison labour and the situation in prisons. In, in, um, exporting prison-produced goods is, um, is illegal under domestic and international trade law. But in the United States, prison labour is a billion-dollar industry. And 37 states allow the use of prison labour by private companies. In eight states, prisoners are not paid for their work in state-run facilities. And the country ride average for inmates receiving the least for their work is 14 cents per hour. And the average for those earning the most is 63 cents per hour. So it's important as Australia that we focus on where forced labour and modern slavery is occurring no matter where it is around the world. As I said, we need to be putting human rights at the forefront, at the core of our foreign policy and of our trade policy. So there is lots more that we can be doing, as well as I'm hoping that the, support, the Senate is indeed going to be supporting this bill today. We need to be increasing the, the powers in our Modern Slavery Act. And our Modern Slavery Act is up for review, and I am hoping that it will be strengthened so it can really address issues of broad issues of modern slavery wherever they're occurring around the world, and particularly requiring it to have mandatory reporting so that that bill actually has some teeth. We must ratify the International Labour Organisation Forced Labour Protocol. It, it's, I don't understand why Australia has not ratified that protocol yet. And more broadly, we need to be changing our, our framework so that we can have a powerful focus on human rights wherever, and human rights abuses wherever they occur in the world. And clearly, the discussion enabling us to have targeted sanctions on human rights abuses wherever they occur in the world. And so across, across party, across the Senate, we've had a focus on the need for Magnitsky legislation, which, as we know, we've had a government response to, which, frankly, is lukewarm. And I'm not convinced that we are going to be toughening up our sanctions regime as we need to, to give us the powers to be taking powerful action against human rights abusers wherever they are in the world. And so as Greens, we will be continuing our, our pressure to be getting really strong Magnitsky legislation to enable us to be effectively imposing targeted sanctions on human rights abusers, no matter where they are from, whether they are Chinese officials who are responsible for the appalling um, conditions that the Uyghurs are living under, whether they are the generals who are responsible for the coup in Myanmar, whether they are people in other parts of the world who are responsible for appalling attacks on human rights ab abuses, whether that is in Russia or in Saudi Arabia or in other parts of the world. I want to conclude by saying that it is, this is a very important bill, but it is important. what is more important is to see it in that context of needing to have a legislative framework, which the Greens have been proposing and will continue to advocate, that puts human rights at the core of our interactions with other countries, whether that's through our foreign policy, through our trade arrangements, through our aid arrangements, so that we can feel that we are doing our utmost to be supporting the rights of people around the world. Because while human rights are being abused, while people are suffering not being able to live their best lives anywhere in the world, we suffer too. As part of that common humanity around the world, we need to be taking action and we need to be taking whatever action we can. And in that context, the Greens are very happy to be supporting Senator Patrick's bill this morning. Thank you. Uh, we will now go remotely to Senator Ferravanti wells uh, Thank you, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President. As a member of the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Legislation Committee, I welcome the opportunity to speak uh, on this bill. 
Um, the purpose of the original bill uh, was to ban the importation of goods from Xinjiang in the People's Republic of China, as well as goods from other parts of the PRC that are produced in whole or part by forced labour. I, like other speakers, am pleased um, that Senator Patrick has expanded uh, the scope of the bill uh, with the insertion of Section 50A, prohibition of the importation of goods, goods produced by forced labour, uh, within the meaning uh, of the criminal code. Um, can I, though, use the opportunity and, and uh, can I uh, associate myself with the comments that have been made uh, by uh, Senator Abetz, but can I particularly focus uh, my comments this morning in relation to um, the work uh, of the report uh, and the work that the committee did uh, on this report, particularly in relation to the massive and the systemic oppression of the Uyghur people by the Chinese um, government. Now, the use of forced labour is defined in the bill by reference to the Criminal Code 1995. The importation into Australia of any goods found to have been produced by forced labour will be subject to the penalties that, are apl that apply to the importation of other goods designated designated as prohibited imports by regulations made under the Custom Act, Customs Act 1901. The bill supports Australia's long-standing commitment to internationally recognised human rights to freedom from slavery and forced labour, such as in Article 8 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and related international conventions against slavery and forced labour. Can I, too, uh, acknowledge and thank Senator Patrick for the work that he has done and thank him for bringing forward uh, this bill. Uh, this is a critical time in the world's dealing with the communist regime in Beijing and accordingly this bill is very timely. Apart from the evidence given by the usual apologists for Beijing, the remainder of the evidence to the committee uh, was very compelling. This is an issue of concern to many Australians, especially given the evidence provided by the president of the Australian Uyghur Tangritha Women's Association that every single Uyghur in Australia has family members and or friends in the concentration and or labour camps. Many respondents pointed to the research of Dr. Adrian Zenz, including his work indicating that there are as many as 1.8 million Uyghurs and other ethnic groups currently subjected to forced labour in the PRC. Dr Darren Byler, postdoctoral researcher at the University of Colorado, told the committee about his research based on interviews with former Xinjiang workers and immediate family members uh, of workers. He states, what I've learned from them through these interviews and through cooperation to open and close access Chinese government documents, such as internal police documents, is that a system of unfree labour is now widespread in Xinjiang and to a certain extent across China. In factories and other institutions, the workers are taught to speak Mandarin and embrace state political ideology all while learning to work on an assembly line or as maintenance workers, cleaners, nannies and cooks in state-directed labour programs. Though some of these new workers referred to as surplus workers were simply farmers from nearby villages, many of them are also relatives of detainees or former detainees themselves. All of them know that, it, that over refusal of these job assignments could result in their internment in camps uh, or imprisonment. Now, the World Uyghur Congress noted that forced labour tended to take place in or around internment camps, prisons and workplaces inside East uh, Turkestan, as well as across China. Now, various submitters to our committee referred to the Australian Strategic Policy Institute ASPE report of March 2020, Uyghurs for Sale, Re-Education, Forced Labour and Surveillance Beyond Xinjiang by Vicky Zhujong Zhu, Daniel Cave, Dr. James Liebold, Kelsey Munro, and Nathan Rusa. Now, other speakers have referred um, to some of the contents of that report, which identified 27 factories in nine Chinese provinces using Uyghur 
forced uh, labour transferred from Xinjiang since 2017. These factories are part of the supply chain for 82 well-known global brands in the technology, clothing and automotive, automo automotive sector. Of note is that the report estimated the transfer of more than 80,000 Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities from Xinjiang to factories across the country between 2017 and 2019 through labour transfer programs under a central government policy known as Xinjiang Aid. ASPE also maintains the Xinjiang Data Project website, which brings together research on the human rights situation of Uyghurs and other minorities in Xinjiang. Furthermore, and I note that this has also been referred to, Chinese, one of those uh, companies, um, um, Chinese uh, rail manufacturer KTK, works with a number of Australian governments in Australia, including the New South Wales and Victorian government, and is being investigated for its links to forced um, labour. Now, what is interesting is that witnesses providing provided troubling evidence of PRC government intimidation in response to the publication of research in this area. Uh, Professor Lee Bold and Ms Munro said that the report had been repeatedly criticised by the Chinese government, seeking to besmirch ASPE as an organisation and its researchers, who have been repeatedly doxxed and threatened while ignoring the substance of the report and the specifics of the evidence. Doxing, I understand, is the practice of releasing a person's private information on the internet. Ms Zhu informed the committee that the PRC had threatened to sue ASPE for libel following the publication um, of the reports. Also, we know that there have been incentives offered to uh, companies to incorporate uh, Uyghur workers into their business. And um, these subsidies... Sorry, do you want... Sorry, that is... Sorry about that. Um, uh, to incorporate Uyghur workers into their business. They reported that the government subsidies include free land, lower electricity costs, low cost loans, transportation subsidies, and even subsidised labour. Um, evidence um, by Professor James Liebold should sound a salutary warning. Um, the fact that the two-way trade between Xinjiang and Australia is not only significant, but also increasingly should be of serious concern to our parliament. The Custom Bureau of the Xinjiang Regional Government releases monthly statistics on the import and export of products between Xinjiang and other countries. He, write, he gave evidence. Much to my surprise, Australia is one of the regime's top trading partners. Over the four years of the brutal crackdown in Xinjiang, Australia's two-way trade with Xinjiang increased by 150%. The vast majority of that trade, about 73%, is the import of goods from Xinjiang into Australia, with imports increasing by 150% um, in 2009 and amounting to 37 uh, million. By comparison, in 2019, neither Canada, Canada nor the UK was among Xinjiang's top 30 trading partners. Germany and Japan imported far less. In fact, in 2019, Australia's imports from Xinjiang actually exceeded that of the United States and com comprised about 2% of Xinjiang's total um, exports. Um, our report canvassed legislative responses by other governments, including the United States, uh, the United Kingdom and Canada. On the private sector front, uh, Be Slavery Free noted that the Better Cotton Initiative, a global not-for-profit organisation and the largest cotton sustainability program in the world, has suspended its activities in Xinjiang in China on the back of concerns over the uh, prevalence of labour abuses in the area. Uh, BSF also noted that actions taken by Woolworths, Kathmandu and PDH brands um, as outlined in their modern slavery statements. Indeed, Woolworths commenced tracing its garment supply chain and Kathmandu noted that the risk of exposure to forced labour was potentially present at all levels of the supply chain. Can I uh, also uh, mention the 
in particular in relation to the issue uh, with uh, Beijing. Uh, the report indicated that there is widespread uh, uh, support for this bill. And it is not surprising, I think, given the change in sentiment that is fast becoming the norm, that it can no longer be business as usual with the communist regime in China. The ongoing threats by Beijing are symptomatic of the predicament that we find ourselves in, noting the years of questionable, if I may say, defective foreign and trade policy have made us vulnerable to economic coercion. Those who have responsibility for our fellow traveller foreign policy were prepared to ignore China's um, commun uh, communist China's skullduggery so long as the rivers of gold continued to flow. Businesses also uh, engaged uh, in uh, extensive trade because the rivers of gold were flowing. And this has proved to be a flawed business model. And if we profess to have a values-based foreign policy, then that includes standing up for issues such as abuse of human rights. And whilst China's bully tactics on different fronts uh, were clear, there was a reluctance to offend China by those leading our foreign and trade policy. And my criticisms in January 2018, though valid, were not welcome. We were never clear what strategy we were adopting with China. And so, therefore, when you are dealing with a bully, it is important that you have the political fortitude to stand up to them. And as I've said, I think that the Australian public will now expect that. Uh, Australians will no longer tolerate business as usual uh, with the communist regime. China is not a democracy. It is a totalitarian regime, and we need to treat them as such. I won't go into the statistics in relation to our mounting trade, suffice to say that having put a third of our trade eggs in the China basket has opened us up to criticism on a range of fronts, especially now the emerging uh, evidence that we are seeing about our um, uh, some of those goods uh, potentially linked to uh, forced uh, labour in Xinjiang and potentially other places. In conclusion, I am pleased the committee endorses without reservation the objectives of the bill. The state, um, as I've uh, indicated in relation to state-sponsored forced labour, in relation to the Uyghurs and, of course, in other parts uh, of the world. Um, I agree that it is incumbent on the government uh, to take steps to ensure that Australian businesses and consumers are not in any way complicit in these egregious ab uh, uh, abuses. Our report made it clear that it is important that we prohibit the import of any goods made wholly or in part with forced labour, regardless of geographic uh, origin. Uh, it is important as part of any uh, process uh, in relation to forced labour that we audit supply chains and ensure that the exposure by Australian businesses um, to these practices are fully audited and also that Australian businesses uh, and importers are given um, clarity in relation to the uh, procedures. Uh, in conclusion, I note that the government supports the intent and acknowledges the importance of, of um, this issue, including the need for transparency and appropriate action uh, in response to the instances of modern slavery and human rights abuses. Uh, Senator Patrick indicated that this is this bill is a blunt instrument, uh, but I would urge the government to accept all the recommendations of the report. I note that there are deficiencies in the Modern Slavery Act, and some of those have been uh, discussed uh, this morning. Um, in its efforts to combat modern slavery, the government has taken a country agnostic, victim centred uh, approach that focuses on supporting um, the best outcomes for victims and addressing modern slavery in supply chains. And I think that um, those changes do need to be made. The evidence. Uh, of widespread use of forced labour for particular classes of product um, from different parts of the world and most especially from Xinjiang necessitate action on this complex issue as a matter of priority.
Thank, Thank you, Madam you. Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator. We will now go remotely to Senator Sheldon. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Customs Amendment banning goods produced by Forced Labor Bill 2021. I thank Senator Patrick for introducing this private member's bill. It is a bill that Labor supports. It should not be controversial to stamp out the use of slavery and forced labor in Australia and around the world. Slavery has not been relegated to the history books. It is a blight that countries around the world to see this, that see this happen too often this very day. As we speak, there are more than 40 million people around the world who have been coerced and forced into slavery-like conditions. Some have, prom have promoted the lie that slavery is not part of our own history in Australia. And I quote, there, is no, there was no slavery in Australia. Well, the person I'm quoting is, of course, the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, on ABC Radio just one year ago. When Morrison said slavery had not existed in Australia, it was covering up the exploitation of more than 62,000 South Sea Islanders. People from Vanuatu, the Solomon Islands, New Caledonia, Papua New Guinea, Tuvalu, Tuvalu Kirib Kirib Kiribati and Fiji. More than 62,000 South Sea Islanders were forcibly brought to Australia. More than 62,000 South Sea Islanders who were kidnapped, tricked, coerced, or threatened into coming into Australia. And they were forced to work as slaves on cane fields in Northern Queensland. Of course, that shameful practice is known as blackbirding. And while it started in the 1840s, it continued until it was illegal in the early 1900s. That is almost 40 years after the 13th Amendment made slavery illegal in the United States. And it was finally made illegal, there was no repatriations. In fact, thousands were deported, often to the wrong islands, where they had no family, no connections, and may not have spoken the local language. The fact is, the Prime Minister of Australia was unaware of this practice as a national embarrassment. There's also the well-documented practice of Indigenous workers being brought and sold as, as chattel uh, property, particularly in the northern Australian pastoral industry. The purchase and sale of indigenous workers and forced labour without pay reportedly continued as recently as the 1950s. Again, the fact that the Prime Minister of Australia was unaware of this practice is incomprehensible. While the open and flagrant use of slavery, forced labour, has thankfully been stamped out, it is something that continues in Australia in the shadows. Make no mistake, there is slavery and forced labour in Australia today. The 2018 Global Slavery Index estimates there are at least 15,000 slaves in Australia. The use of slavery in Australia today is particularly high in the agricultural sector, and it's in construction, domestic work, meat processing, cleaning, hospitality and food services. These are all essential industries, and they've been driven in part by slavery. Many of those 15,000 slaves in Australia today are migrants on temporary visas who are forced into slavery by the threat of deportation by their employer. In 2013, the Fair Work Ombudsman launched its Harvest Trail investigation. Of the 638 horticulture businesses and labour hire companies it investigated, more than half were breaking labour laws, including workers being placed into peace rate arrangements which resulted in them being paid substantially below the Australian minimum wage. A few years later, the Ombudsman went back and reinvestigated 245 of those businesses. Of the 245, 162 of them had disappeared and may be and now phoenixing. And of those that are still operating, almost half of them were still breaking labour laws. So even after getting caught the first time, they were reoffending. We have asked if there were ombudsmen at budget estimates if they are going to check on those repeat offenders a third time. They said no. That isn't a criticism of the Fair Work Ombudsman. They just do have they do not just do not have the resources to enforce labour laws around this country. They do not have the resources to stamp out, stamp out modern slavery in Australia. The only organisations that do have the scale and expertise required are trade unions. 
But the Morrison government is so ideologically opposed to the trade union movement that it will never in a million years give a qualified union representative the power to check that people are being paid what they are legally entitled to. So instead, we have another inquiry in 2019, Migrant Work Task Force, which also found slavery-like conditions in Australia, particularly at shonky labour hire companies. One of the key recommendations was to establish a national labour hire registration scheme. It would focus on four high-risk sectors, horticulture, meat, processing, processing, cleaning and security. Sectors where the 15,000 slaves of Australia today are most likely to be working in. That report was over two years ago and the Morrison government has still not introduced this scheme. We can ensure Mr Morrison has no intention of introducing that scheme before the end of the term of this parliament. And then there is a gig economy where the Morrison government has still done nothing to regulate where Uber workers are dying on the roads for as little as $6.67 an hour. No paid leave, no workers' compensation, and no alternative options in Morrison's, Mr Morrison's economy. Where, if you die at work, Uber will not even contact your family. Uber is now the second largest employer in Australia. This is the future of work Mr Morrison envisages for all Australians, a return to slave-like conditions. Just today, Uber announced a new partnership with the largest employer in Australia, Woolworths, to begin delivering same-hour groceries. We now have the two largest employers in Australia teaming up to exploit workers. A question for Woolworths is this. What steps are you taking to ensure the Uber workers you are using aren't being paid $6.67 an hour? What steps are you taking, Woolworths, to ensure that Uber riders delivering your goods have a safe work environment. And just last week, it was revealed that Uber failed to report 500 incidents, including issues of sexual assault and serious accidents. And this is the company that you are now working with, Woolworths. As the economic employer of those Uber drivers, person at the top of the supply chain, now delivering your products, you owe those riders in your supply chain a duty of care. Now, the Senate Committee on Job Security has heard about forced labour taking place on mine sites in Western Australia. Our electricians have provided evidence they are lured to a remote mine site at one rate of pay. And once they arrive, they are told they can either take the work for a lower rate of pay or they can wait for a week until the next flight without pay. That fits the very definition of forced labour. So slavery and forced labour continues on farms at Uber and mine sites and other workplaces around Australia. Because Mr Morrison doesn't think slavery ever existed in Australia, let alone that exists today under his own prime ministership. I want to commend the Australian Workers' Union and the Unions New South Wales for leading the charge on exposing modern slavery in Australian farms. Unions New South Wales recently released a report with the Migrant Workers Centre titled Working for $9 a Day. It found workers on farms earning less than $1 an hour on peace rates, with some working up to 20 hours per day. Earlier this year, I met one of those workers, a Taiwanese woman called Kate. Kate was receiving $4 an hour to pick oranges on a farm in sub southern Australia and was eating out of a bin to survive. At one farm, Kate was sexually harassed and told she would have to put up with it if she wanted to keep her job. The Australian Workers' Union is seeking to introduce a minimum wage for fruit pickers in the Fair Work Commission. To bring an end to slavery on Australian farms, if Mr Morrison had any interest in addressing slavery on his watch, he would support the Australian Workers' Union in that case. In fact, Mr Morrison was interested in fighting slavery. There is a long list of things he could do. The only progress that has been made on modern slavery in the last eight years of this government has been the result of a massive pressure by the Labor Party, trade union movement, and by civil rights groups. In 2017, Labor announced it would introduce modern slavery legislation if it won the next election. Twelve months later, the Morrison government introduced the Modern Slavery Bill 2018. It was a pale imita imitation of legislation proposed by Labor. 
We've seen so often with Mr Morrison, he takes a Labor idea, waters it down just enough to prevent it from being good policy. Just as we saw with JobKeeper and the rorts by the likes of Jerry Harvey. No action. Labor moved amendments to the Modern Slavery Bill to improve its effectiveness, introduce penalties for non-compliance and establish an independent anti-slavery commissioner. Unfortunately, the Liberal government rejected those amendments. Labor again calls on the Morrison government to work with Labor and the crossbench to amend the Modern Slavery Act to introduce penalties for non-compliance and to require mandatory reporting on exposure to specific issues of pressing concern, such as Whig ass forced labour. Till then, Australia remains well behind many of the global partners in addressing slavery and forced labour. Australia still has not ratified International Labour Organisation's 2014 Forced Labour Protocol. If the Morrison government wants to speak with any global credibility on ending forced labour, it should join the other 45 countries, including New Zealand, the UK, Canada and Germany, and fully ratify the ILO Forced Labour Convention. Instead, we have a modern slavery reporting system that has been treated as a joke by big businesses in Australia. Research from the Australian Council of Superannuation Investors in June found that a majority of the ASX 200 companies were treating it as a tick the box exercise. And we're only disclosing the absolute bare minimum about slavery in their supply chain. A third of ASX 200 companies were potentially non-compliant. In fact, not a single company in the first year of the scheme has reported a single modern slavery incident. Even when they have identified red flags, such as parts ports being seized, wage theft, forced overtime, or recruitment fees charged to workers. Factors that Mr. Morrison watered down slavery laws have turned it into a box ticking exercise. And in the meantime, the world is witnessing a growing number of horrifying reports of forced labor and human rights violations in China. According to the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, 2020 report titled Uyghurs for Sale, more than 80,000 Uyghurs were transferred out of Xinjiang to work in factories across China between 2017-19. Those workers would typically live in segregated dormitories, undergo, undergo organised Mandarin and ideological training, and are subject to constant surveillance. And of course, are forbidden from participating in religious observances. We got for sale report and fired 27 country, uh, factories, 27 factories across nine Chinese provinces that are using Uyghur labour transferred from Xinjiang. These factories claim to be part of a supply chain of 82 high profile brands. If your company is profiting from forced labour or slavery, it's your responsibility to stamp it out. So I call on the following companies identified by this the Strategic Policy Institute to implement and the appropriate slavery policies that means that people are both uh, transparently avoiding a uh, human exploitation and misery at your, um, at your advantage. Now, companies like Amazon, Google, Hawaii, Calvin Klein, Sketches, Sara, H&M, BMW, Jaguar, Land Rover and Mercedes-Benz, Volkswagen. Levi's, Walmart, Costco, Adidas and Nike. Martin Luther King once said that injustices anywhere is a threat to injustice everywhere. If those companies continue to profit from gross injustice and the Morrison government continues to allow them to do so, it's not just the Uyghurs who suffer. It brings down rights and conditions for workers around the world, including here in Australia. So Labor supports this bill. We call on the Morrison government to ratify the ILO Convention on Forced Labour. We call on the Morrison government to publish an annual list of countries, re regions, industries and products with a high risk of modern slavery and forced labour. We call for an independent anti-slavery commissioner. We call for penalties for companies who are non-compliant. We call for targeted sanctions on foreign companies, officials and other entities known to be directly profiteering from forced labour. And we call on the Morrison government to lead by example and conduct a comprehensive review of its own procurement 
and supply chains. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Um, I don't see Senator Fawcett um, coming online, so we will move on to Senator Vane. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, no one in this place would be surprised to know that uh, we on the government benches believe that slavery in any form is an abhorrent practice that must be eliminated. No one, no matter their race, age, sex, gender, nationality or ethnicity, should be subject to having their basic freedoms taken away from them. The Morrison government believes in freedom of the individual and the importance of this in a good society. The, the government does support the intent and acknowledges the importance of this issue in this bill, including the need for transparency and appropriate action in response to instances of modern slavery and <clears throat> human rights abuses. However, the government does not support all aspects of the proposed bill and instead recommends that the departments continue working with domestic stakeholders and international counterparts to uh, address modern slavery wherever it is identified and collectively respond to reduce and eliminate its practice, including through a review of the Modern Slavery Act 2018. This act creates a robust transparency framework to drive business action and to identify and address modern slavery in global supply chains. Now, there's no doubt, Madam Acting Deputy President, that, uh, you know, that business has a large job ahead of it. With 3,000 companies in Australia due to report, it's uh, um, absolutely amazing the work that our companies are doing. With an estimated 40 million men, women and children living in modern slavery today, and it can be found in almost every country in the world according to the, the uh, International Labor Organization and the Walk Free Foundation, who I'll come back to later. And with increasingly globalized trade, it, it almost affects every business through those interconnected supply chains. Now, this is not limited to just one region. This is a whole of the world problem. And the interconnectedness of those supply chains is an incredibly difficult thing to unwind and to get transparency of. But that doesn't mean that it shouldn't be doing it. And you know, I thank the, um, the resources industry for the work they're doing in, in this space. Uh, you know, the, given the global nature of, su of supply chains for uh, minerals and resources companies, they're leading some of the, the best transparency work on this. And uh, I um, call out and thank Mr Andrew Forrest uh, for the work he's doing, th not only through his mining company, um, but uh, also through the Walk Free Foundation that he founded and funds, and the important work they're doing in bringing transparency to supply chains, not just in the mining industry, but right across the globe with their, with their anti-slavery um, index. The government, however, goes further. We take a country agnostic, victim-centred approach that focuses on supporting the best outcomes for victims and addressing modern su slavery in supply chains. This reflects the reality that modern slavery can take many forms and exist in any sector, supply chain or country. However, Senator Patrick's explanatory memorandum highlights an area of concern over which the, the government has held deep concerns, and that is the, the widely reported state-mandated forced labour occurring in Xinjiang. The government made a submission to the parliamentary inquiry into this bill uh, on 15th of March this year, which outlines our response to combating modern slavery. In addition to administering the Act, <coughs> which drives business uh, due diligence around supply chains, the government has recently also committed $10.6 million to implement Australia's na national action plan, uh, which delivers initiatives to prevent, disrupt, investigate and prosecute modern slavery crimes. The Department of Home Affairs and with them one of their agencies, the Australian Border Force, as well as the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, 
were all participants in, in the whole of government submission to the Senate Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Legislation Committee's inquiry into this bill. The government, Australian government, through that submission, notes that the intention of the bill, as expressed in its explanatory memorandum, is to take a strong stand against the well-documented human rights abuses uh, of hundreds of thousands of Uyghur people in the Xinjiang province. The Australian government acknowledges the intent and importance of the issue, including the need for transparency and appropriate actions in response to all instances of modern slavery and human rights abuses. However, the government does not su uh, support all aspects of the bill and it is working with domestic stakeholders and international counterparts to bring to light modern slavery wherever it is identified and collectively respond to and reduce and eliminate its practice. The government consistently raises concerns about the treatment of Uyghurs and other minorities in China and in other countries, including at ministerial level, both directly with China and in multilateral forums. Reports of forced labour are a key element of Australia's international advocacy, and the government jointly with other countries continue to urge China to allow meaningful and un unfettered access to Xinjiang for independent international observers. The government is committed to tackling modern slavery, including forced labour. The landmark Modern Slavery Act of 2018 established a robust transparency framework to drive business, business action to identify and address modern slavery risks in those supply chains. As I said, those supply chains are incredibly complex. They're interconnected and crisscross the world with it's, and until everyone's being transparent, it's hard for everyone to be completely transparent. But those actions must continue. The government notes the recent report of the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade's inquiry into the use of sanctions to address human rights abuse and is considering its response to the report and its recommendations. The government is committed to monitoring, evaluating, <clears throat> and reviewing its actions to combat modern slavery to ensure it is delivering a targeted, effective response. In particular, the government will continue to monitor reports of forced labour globally, including in Xinjiang, and assess Australia's policy settings and engage with stakeholders and partners with a view to supporting international efforts to reduce the risk of modern slavery, including forced labour in Australia's supply chains. The Modern Slavery Act, which entered into force in 1st of January 2019, aims to combat modern slavery in global supply chains of Australian goods and services by increasing supply chain transparency and holding large businesses publicly accountable for their actions to combat modern slavery. It does this by providing public visibility to businesses, civil society, um, NGOs and consumers of modern slavery risks identified and actions taken to address those risks by those reporting entities. The Act requires large entities operating in Australia, that is companies with a turnover of over $100 million annually, to prepare a re uh, an annual modern slavery statement. Those statements set out their actions to identify and address modern slavery risks in their global operations and supply chains. The government estimates that approximately 3,000 entities will be required to report under that Act, including globally, including globally recognised brands and the Commonwealth. Many of these entities are likely to have supply chains links with China, including in the textiles, electronics and vehicle manufacturing sectors. Under the Act, the uh, government has established an online register of modern slavery statements. The register is a government-run central depository of all statements submitted under the Act. The government published the first tranche of those statements on the 27th of November last year, 2020, and continues to regularly publish tranches of statements as they are received. To date, approximately 400 statements have been published on the register. In implementing the Act, Madam Deputy, Pre Acting Deputy President, the government has engaged proactively with business and civil society to provide detailed, comprehensive and practical guidance to support entities to understand modern slavery risks in supply chains and operations and to take actions 
to address these risks and report on those actions in compliance with the Act. To support an understanding of modern slavery risk in compliance with the Act, the government actively undertakes outreach to Australian entities on risks related to modern slavery and supply chains. Agencies, including Border Force and DFAT, engage closely with peak bodies and individual businesses, both in Australia and overseas, as well as officials from state and territory governments to raise awareness of relevant supply chain risks. The government encourages Australian companies and institutions to conduct uh, appropriate due diligence specific to their industries to satisfy themselves at board level that their commercial and other arrangements are consistent with legislation and international standards. Australia's approach to combating modern slavery is grounded in the United Nations guiding principles for business and human rights or the UNGPs, as they're called. In line with those principles, the government encourages entities to work collabor collaboratively with suppliers to address modern slavery risks and ensure responses prioritise the best in interests of victims, no matter where they are. The government takes a country agnostic approach in its efforts to address modern slavery. In this way, the government recognises that all instances of modern slavery whether a forced labour, serv servitude or forced marriage in any country or region are all egregious and necessary to address. The government is committed to ensuring the Act provides a strong and effective mechanism for addressing modern slavery risks under the Act and the government reports annually to the parliament on the implementation of and compliance with the Act. The government is required to review the Act in 2022, next year, which including whether, including whether it is necessary to amend the Act to improve its operation. This will include consideration of compliance, penalties and other complementary measures. The government will consider bringing forward, if required, further legislation. Modern slavery can affect any country, and the United Nations estimates that there are more than 40 million victims of modern slavery worldwide. Over half of these are exploited in Asia and the Pacific, in the Asia Pacific region, in which supply chains of significant numbers, a significant number of businesses, large businesses, operating in Australia are based. Modern slavery in supply chains also distorts global markets, undercuts responsible businesses, and poses significant legal and reputational risks for companies. Like Senator Patrick, the government is concerned that there may be parts of Australian businesses rel re relying on supply chains that have links to slavery. This government is committed to ensuring that no matter where the practice of slavery or forced labour occurs, Australian businesses are not linked to it in any manner. While this government believes in and appreciates the intent of this bill put forward by Senator Patrick, the bill, as it currently stands, cannot be supported. Eliminating slavery and human rights abuses is a global necessity as a society. and We must ensure that we are not inadvertently supporting it. This is why we are conducting a review of the Modern Slavery Act next year. As I've said, the Modern Slavery Act creates a framework for business to drive them to act in ways that eliminate slavery from their supply chains and their operations. When this was introduced, it was a world first step which demonstrated the government's commitment to taking real and serious action to combat modern slavery. As it currently stands, large businesses are already required under the Modern Slavery Act to identify how their operations and supply chains may contribute to modern slavery and explain what they are doing to address those risks, no matter where that risk occurs. This increased transparency creates a level playing field for large businesses to disclose their modern slavery risks. I believe that if we're going to do something, especially for an, in, an issue as important as this, it must be done right. I note the intention of the bill is to take strong, a strong stand against the documented human rights abuses of hundreds of thousands of Uyghur people in Xinjiang province in China. And as the Minister for Foreign Affairs and Minister for Women, Senator, Maurice Payne has said, Australia is deeply concerned by the reports of human rights violations and abuses in Xinjiang. However, modern slavery risks are not limited to any single region or country, and business action to assess and address these risks should not be limited to, to any geographic re region. 
I don't think anyone, there would be anyone here in the chamber today or in this parliament that would not support the intention of this bill, of being ensuring that we are not supporting slavery anywhere in the world. However, as I said earlier, I believe if we're going to act against this issue, it must be done right to ensure that it properly addresses the issue globally. Thank you, Senator Van, and I call Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Customs Amendment banning goods produced by Forced Labor Bill of 2021. Um, and in doing so, uh, I wish to thank Senator Patrick for the consideration he has given to the feedback provided by Labor Senators and others through the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Legislation Committee following its inquiry into the previous iteration of this bill. Certainly, the narrow focus of the Customs Amendment banning goods produced by Uyghur Forced Labour Bill of 2020 responded to a very real and concerning matter, namely the forced servitude of the Uyghur people and others of the Communist Party of China. Nonetheless, as abhorrent as that example is, sadly the Uyghurs are not the only other people throughout the world subject to such practices by oppressive governments and it is right, any legislation which should come from this parliament would address this as well. This new bill implements the committee's recommendation by amending to the Customs Act to impose an absolute ban on the importation of goods produced in whole or in part by forced labour. It is general in nature and does not specify any geographic origin for its application. Now, should this bill become law, as I hope it will, along with the amendments that will be proposed by Senator Keneally, it will ensure that goods which are produced by those who are subject to servitude will be subject to penalties akin to those applied to the importation of other goods designated as prohibited imports under the Customs Act. As a regional power, Australia has an important role to play in combating the scourge of modern slavery. Globally, but also most particularly in our region, the Asia Pacific. Labor has always been committed to showing leadership on this issue, which is why we on this side campaigned for an Australian Modern Slavery Act, moved amendments to the Modern Slavery Bill in 2018 to improve its effectiveness introduced penalties for non-compliance and sought to establish an independent anti-slavery commissioner. Unfortunately, those on the Treasury benches have shirked away from our nation's responsibility on this very important issue. The government has not supported our amendments and as the facts of the conditions facing the Uyghur people and others throughout the world have become known, they have failed to act. As mentioned by Senator Watt, it was estimated by the Global Slavery Index in 2018 that there were approximately 40 million people living in modern slavery conditions, with over half of these being forced, being in forced labour specifically. We would never accept workers in our country being subject to such conditions in the manufacturing of Australian goods. And thankfully, with the presence of strong unions, we can safeguard against such conditions from developing. It is why I support the need for a free and democratic trade union movement, not just here in Australia, but right around the world. However, whilst we may set this standard for ourselves, it is important that we apply the same standard to those goods which, whilst produced abroad, nonetheless make their way into many Australian homes and businesses. No Australian home should have wire goods with it that have been made by forced labour. No Australian businesses should be supplied by manufacturers who engage in forced labour practices. And for that matter, no state government of this country should continue with the purchase of train parts from Chinese suppliers that are linked to the exploited Uyghur workers, because it would cost too much to find simply another contractor. There is no denying that it can sometimes be difficult to call out the behaviour of others. To do so often requires great courage, and for some who lack this courage, the task may appear too great. 
when former Prime Minister Bob Hawke called out the massacre of democracy protesters by the Communist Party of China in Tiananmen Square and offered sanctuary to Chinese visa holders in Australia, this took courage. Australia should never be a country that lacks courage. We have a very proud history of leadership. We should be true to this legacy and how we govern our actions today. The conditions of Uyghur people in Xinjiang province in the People's Republic of China are unacceptable. And under the leadership of the Communist Party, Uyghurs, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz and other Muslim groups are subjected to extensive state-sponsored repression and human rights abuses, including mass arbitrary detention, rape, sterilisation, political indoctrination, cultural destruction and mass surveillance. This is not a contention, this is not an assertion, it is simply the fact. A 2020 report released by the Australian Strategic Policy Institute found that there were 27 factories in nine Chinese provinces under Uyghur labour forcibly transferred from Xinjiang since 2017. And according to the ASPI, these factories form part of the supply chain of 82 well-known global brands in the technology, clothing and automotive sectors. As Dr Michael Clark, an, asso an associate professor at the Australian National University focused on the history and politics of Xinjiang, he told the committee inquiry on earlier that the iteration of this bill, that in Xinjiang it is the site of, la of the largest mass repress repressing of an ethnic and or religious minority in the world today. And I'm pleased to see that the international condemnation of this behaviour has been growing. In July 2020, the United Kingdom delivered a cross-regional statement on Hong Kong and Xinjiang on behalf of 27 countries that, among others, mattered. It called for the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights to be allowed meaningful access to Xinjiang to assess the circumstances of the Uyghur people. In October 2020, at the United Nations Committee on Social, Humanitarian and Cultural Issues, Germany delivered a statement on behalf of 39 countries criticising the treatment of Muslim ethnic groups in Xinjiang. Later, in March 2021, the European Union, Britain, Canada and the United States of America launched coordinated sanctions against Chinese officials involved with human rights abuses in Xinjiang. We must also do our bit. This is an issue that cannot be ignored. And again, I reiterate, whilst the case of Xinjiang is particularly egregious, forced labour is not just limited to this part of the world. It is in many others, Eritrea, North Korea and Burundi. It is in parts of the world near and far. And wherever it is, it must not be tolerated. Wherever it is, we must stand up. That is why I support this bill. Whilst it is not in itself a total solution, as, Murray, as Senator Watt has well articulated, and whilst Labor will seek to make amendments to improve its operation, it is a positive first step, and which is why I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Senator Keneally. I move that the question now be put. The question is that the question now be put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question now is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Watt be agreed. Are those of that opinion say aye? aye. Those against say no? no. I think the ayes have it. Is a division required? Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I just draw to the attention of the Senate that because of the pandemic context in which we're operating, there has been discussion between WHIPs about how to manage um, uh, divisions in the chamber, and it's the President's desire to manage them as best we can, avoiding the physical participation of senators as far as possible. So if I might share with you, Chair, uh, it's the government's position to oppose the second reading amendment, and I also understand and have it in written form that it's uh, Senator Hanson and Senator Roberts' 
position to oppose the second reading amendment as well. And it may well be at this point an opportune time to identify what other senators may be opposing the amendment and then what, other, what senators might be supporting the second reading amendment. Thank you very much, Senator Smith. Um, it's, it's news to me, but at the moment, could you just hold for a moment? I'll take some advice from the clerk. Where are we? So if I can uh, ask the opposition whip to indicate uh, if, if you are willing to proceed in the way that has been outlined by Senator Smith, or if in this first instance we proceed with a division and give um, the whip sufficient time to clarify the position. Senator Carr. Sorry, Madam Deputy. On the basis of what's just been indicated to the chamber, it was clear that, uh, that this division would be lost by the opposition. So long as it's recorded what our position is in terms of the motion, I think it would be acceptable to proceed without a formal division uh, at the, on this particular question. Thank you, Senator Carr. I see other senators seeking the call. I might go first to Senator Seawitt. Can I indicate that the Greens do support uh, this second reader amendment? Thank you, Senator Seawitt. Senator Patrick. Uh, can I support that I'm, uh, can I indicate I'm supporting uh, Labor's second reading amendment? Thank you. Senator Smith. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, so uh, with those positions now known to the chamber and consistent with the pairing arrangements, uh, the second reading amendment will have been uh, negatived. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, thank you for that assertion. In this instance, I might actually take uh, a confirmation from the whip for the the Labor Party, that that is your view at this point of time Th That as well. would be correct on the basis of what's been indicated on the floor of the chamber. Thank you. Uh, in that case, in this extraordinary situation, I declare the amendment lost. The clerk. So the question is that the bill be now read a second time. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against? No. I think the ayes have it. No, no. Is the division required? Um, Madam Acting Deputy President, can I Senator just have Smith. it recorded that the government uh, opposes the second reading? Senator. Senator, Senator Carr. We understand this is a division that should be carried. Uh, Senator Smith, is that agreed? That's agreed. Right. Given the agreement between the whips and no further objection in the chamber, I declare that carried. Okay. The clerk. Oh, wait. Sorry. We, I do believe there's further comment there. Um, Senator Patrick. I am supporting my own bill. <laughs> and, and Senator Seaworth. And um, although I did shout aye, um, I just wanted to make sure that the Greens are recorded as supporting this um, bill. Thank you, Senator Seaworth. Now we move on to the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Customs Act 1901 and for related purposes. So no amendments have been circulated. Senator Patrick. Um, if there's no uh, amendments and no committee stage, I move that the bill be read a third time. So the question is that the bill be read a third time. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against? The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Customs Act 1901 and for related purposes. And do we have someone seeking a call on next? We just 
Senator Roberts, if you can hold, we're just going to move to the next bill with the clerk. Thanks. Senator Smith. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy Chair, it may well be that uh, Senator Roberts would like uh, the position of uh, One Nation recorded on the on Senator Patrick's private senator's bill. I, I believe we may have completed. Madam Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to have Hansard note that we supported Senator Patrick's bill. Your comment was? My comment was I think you'll find that Senator Hanson uh, supported private Senator Patrick's private senator's bill, uh, and it's probably prudent to have that position recorded in the Hansard, but that's for Senator Roberts to Thank disclose. You. Thank you, Senator Smith. Okay. Senator Roberts, are you seeking the call? Yes, I seek leave to have Hansard note that uh, Senator Hanson and I support Senator Patrick's uh, bill. Thank you. That's we true. voted. That matter's noted. Thank you, Senator Roberts. The clerk. Government business order of the day number one, offshore petroleum and greenhouse gas storage amendment, titles administration and other measures bill 2021 and a related bill, resumption of second reading debate and on the amendment moved by Senator Brown. I believe Senator Patrick, you, you are the first listed speaker for this matter. Um, I, I might ask to be moved down the list of just getting, just moving from this other bill, if that's okay. Okay. Senator Patrick. Okay. Thank you. I rise to speak on the uh, OPGGSA uh, Act uh, amendment. And I note that this amendment basically uh, is to deal with uh, a number of different problems uh, that have been created uh, by uh, the conduct of a number of, uh, a number of uh, oil and gas companies. I want to first start by saying that. Uh, we have a really big problem in this, in this country, a really big problem, and that is that we are having our resources um, produced, extracted and, and turned into, in the case of LNG, uh, into liquid, uh, liquefied form uh, and shipped off overseas and getting almost no return. So in 1819, we know that the uh, that uh, $62 billion, $62 billion of oil and gas was exported from this country, and the Australian taxpayer, the, the owner of the resources, in return got $1 billion in PRRT. $62 billion of the taxpayer's resource being shift or, shifted off overseas, and the taxpayer gets $1 billion. That's it. Now, if people don't recognise that that is a problem, then uh, we are beyond help. The situation uh, is that uh, with, with all of our oil and gas wealth, if we were to look at how others have done, particularly places like Norway, places like Qatar, in relation to the oil and gas that they extract from their economic uh, exclusion zones or from their territories, um, they have done substantially better than us. In Norway, they have over a trillion dollars in their sovereign wealth uh, fund, and all of that, or most of that, has come from the return that they get from the extraction of uh, the citizens of Norway's uh, resources uh, underneath the sea, underneath the North Sea. We have just done a really poor job. Uh, in fact. Uh, uh, a, a committee that's looking into oil and gas and whether or not we're maximising the benefit for Australians found that uh, it's likely that uh, on the numbers the return to the taxpayer on our oil and gas is minus 36 per cent. So we actually lose money by, uh, by extracting oil and gas because we end up subsidising through tax uh, 
uh, uh, write-offs and, and other uh, such support, the oil and gas industry, who are mostly mo multinationals, who then take the resource and send it off overseas. ExxonMobil, $42 billion in accordance with its tax transparency data of, uh, of revenue over the last five or so years, and they've paid not a, not a cent, not a cent in corporate tax. If anyone doesn't see that there's a problem with this, and, and uh, you know, I'm sure the, 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 uh, the Greens will stand up quite rightly and say that, that uh, as well as not getting any money for it, as well as having to subsidise the industry, of course all of that oil and gas then goes off to overseas to be, uh, to be uh, consumed and, and used to, and producing carbon emissions. Now, um, you know, there might be some argument if the, Australian, if the Australian population were getting huge benefits from this and had been getting huge benefits from this, but there is basically no reason whatsoever for us to want to in any way produce oil and gas in this country because nothing comes back to the taxpayer. It's a fundamental problem. Now, my understanding uh, uh, of uh, the, the nature of this bill is it seeks to close off a loophole seeks to close off a loophole um, in relation to stranded assets. Now, uh, a, a good example of uh, where this has been a problem is in the, uh, in the case of the Northern Endeavour. The Northern Endeavour was owned by a uh, related company to Woodside. Uh, then a few years ago what, uh, what they did is they sold the, the, ten the, the tenement, in fact, quite legally correctly, they sold the company that owned the tenement. Had they sought to sell the tenement, that would have invoked a whole range of analysis by uh, Nopta to make sure that the, the company that was taking it over was financially sound. But the, uh, in, instead, it was just a, a change of shareholding at the company level. And uh, lo and behold, we ended up with a company, a company called Noga, uh, Northern Oil and Gas Australia, uh, owning, the, owning the asset of the Northern Endeavour and indeed the tenement. And uh, the, the, the allegation is that they didn't have the capital to, uh, uh, to actually operate the field. And what we saw happen was in uh, uh, 2019. Nopsema issued a prohibition notice against the company after a, a component fell onto the deck. So it was a safety issue, and I, and I genuinely understand it was a safety issue. But uh, the company uh, basically then was put in a position where it didn't have any cash flow because it wasn't producing oil, and it didn't really have a pathway out of uh, the, the prohibition notice. For, for three or four months, the company operated. Uh, trying to remedy the situation, and what happened was um, the, the company ended up having to go into administration. So just the story thus far, Woodside sells uh, an ageing asset to a company at a peppercorn price. That company operates to a point where they get a prohibition notice. That drives them into liquidation. The interesting thing is here, I had a conversation with uh, Nopsema at uh, at estimates uh, back in, I think it was October uh, of uh, 2019, saying if you don't help this company come out of uh, the, the prohibition that it's in, if you don't lay out on the table what they need to fix with the platform, then what will happen is the, um, uh, the uh, company will go into administration and the taxpayer will end up carrying the can, having to deal with an asset and uh, all of the different uh, uh, structures on the seabed, and uh, you know that would cost hundreds of millions of dollars. And Nopsema at the time said to me, the head of Nopsema, Mr. Smith, said to me, "No, that won't happen, Senator." Well, you know what? A month later, it did. It did happen. The company went into administration, and of course, that ended up. We ended up with a situation where uh, the taxpayer has had to take over the operation of the Northern Endeavour. So we have right now in the Timor Sea, we have a vessel, um, uh, an FPSO, 
that is being operated by the Australian taxpayer in lighthouse mode, costing something of the order of $10 million a month. It might be somewhere between five and ten. Okay? And, uh, that's an astounding fact. Eighty million dollars, I think, was in the in the, uh, the last count was the money, uh, the taxpayers' money that had been spent operating a vessel on lighthouse mode, and that does not include the cost to uh, that doesn't include the cost to, to remedy uh, the vessel, to, to remove the vessel, uh, and uh, to return the seafloor back to its original state. That's likely to run into a billion dollars. Now, of course, the government has announced that it's going to try and claw that back from uh, from, from from the industry. Okay, but uh, I can tell you that the the events that took place with the Northern Endeavour, which are the uh, driving factor behind this bill, were known before Northern Endeavour, the Northern Endeavour situation occurred. So it's quite. Uh, unexplainable how we got into this mess, how the taxpayer has borne the cost of all of this. So, whilst I will be supporting uh, this bill, I, I can't not mention the, uh, the, the total failure of government in terms of dealing with this whole circumstance. I say that with a bit of help, uh, with far less than the money that had been spent, this, this vessel could have been kept in production, could have kept employing Australians, could have kept contributing to uh, our fuel security situation because of the storage that was on, that, uh, on the Northern Endeavour uh, as a vessel. And uh, uh, unfortunately, this has just been a big sink for the Australian taxpayer. Not a good situation. So, uh, in the end, I'll be supporting this bill, but I will foreshadow um, that uh, in, the, in the committee stage I will be moving an amendment that looks at transparency. And I'll talk to that amendment uh, when, when the time comes. But uh, to give you a bit of a tip, um, it simply deals with things like production data, requiring a company to, to basically say, um, this is how much I am producing. This is how much I'm producing this much. This is how much is left in the, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, tenement. Useful information to shareholders, useful information to, uh, to uh, the Australian taxpayer, who actually are the owners of the, uh, of the resource. So um, I know that, uh, that some on the other side may, may say, well, that's, uh, that's company information. But you know what? When you come along, and you talk to the Australian government and you say, look, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to extract some resource from your EEZ, there's a, there's a cost to that in terms of your transparency with the Australian public. And I will, uh, uh, when we get to that uh, point uh, in the committee stage, I'll certainly be drawing out uh, the findings of ACIL Allen in relation to whether or not this information should be held secret. Anyway, I won't uh, delay the chamber any further. I will be supporting the bill, but uh, I will also be moving amendments to it. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Small. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And can I acknowledge uh, at the outset um, that I am a former uh, Woodside employee? You know, that's a matter of public record, but it is important, I think, to be transparent with the You and Mr Downer. Um, <laughs> and uh, look, can I also acknowledge, the, uh, frankly, the decency and integrity of Senator Wish Wilson? Uh, who, in um, a wide-ranging uh, assessment of the bill that I mostly disagree with, did have the honesty to acknowledge that um, Woodside, a company that features very relevantly in this conversation, was uh, a very significant Australian taxpayer, uh, indeed contributing $4.9 billion in income tax and royalties uh, in the five years 2013 to 18, and then more recently $493 million in 2018, $583 million in 2019 and $707 million in 2020. So uh, I think that is important context as we consider this bill, uh, which does uh, make the necessary legislative changes to the Act to implement some aspects of the Department's enhanced decommissioning framework and the relevant recommendations uh, from the independent review into the circumstances leading to the administration and liquidation of Northern Oil and Gas Australia, otherwise known as the Walker Review. Uh, as part 
of the Morrison government. I do support these very important steps in the right direction, but as a Western Australian, as someone who was part of the industry and as a taxpayer, I am concerned that the conversation can't stop here. Decommissioning is uh, a very significant issue for the nation, and indeed uh, we must take steps to ensure that Australian taxpayers and Australians derive the maximum benefit from the exploitation of these resources. With that, I totally agree with Senator Patrick. I suspect we might disagree on the mechanisms. So, what have we got so far? We've got a bill that provides a trailing liability uh, by expanding the remedial directions and provisions in the Act. That requires any former title holder or related person, which is a broadening of the definition, to carry out decommissioning if the current or immediate former title holder is unable to do so. Whilst that is a measure of last resort, where all other regulatory options have been exhausted, it does aim to ensure that the risks and liabilities of petroleum exploitation remain the responsibility of those who have been involved in the project. The bill increases regulatory oversight and scrutiny by providing for specific decision-making criteria to ensure that the entities are, and importantly remain, suitable to undertake petroleum project activities. So, in all, this bill is very sensible in taking those steps towards ensuring that the situation we are seeing with Niagara and the Northern Endeavour is not repeated. However, with light of my, or in light of my comments that this is just the beginning, let me outline some of the important facts. The decommissioning liability in Australia has been modelled at more than $60 billion of expenditure over the next 30 years. Assets in the North West Shelf and Bass Strait comprise the vast majority, some 73 per cent, of that estimated $60 billion liability. There is an opportunity to materially reduce this cost with smart regulation, industry cooperation and the adoption of best practice here in Australia. Australian legislation, in my view, does not provide adequate guidance on the decommissioning options that are most in tune with international best practice. And I fear that the, the impact is to Australian taxpayers if we don't amend the current statute position on the mandatory removal of all infrastructure, which I do acknowledge uh, is, uh, is worked around by NOPSEMA, who use regulatory processes to appropriately approve alternative arrangements. In her last contribution on this bill, Senator Brown, on behalf of the Labor Party, did clearly articulate how little they understand of the resources industry and how their concern is with partisan politics on this issue and not being wedged uh, by the Greens, uh, where their interests are not in, in acting on behalf of Australian taxpayers who fundamentally forego potentially 58 cents in the dollar, where decommissioning spend is deductible against both company income tax and PRRT, meaning that a significant proportion of decommissioning costs as much as $17.8 billion in the next 10 years alone is borne by Australian taxpayers through taxation relief, perfectly lawfully and perfectly legitimately. That's a massive number—$17.8 billion in the next 10 years. The economic benefit, when you consider that liability, is premised on the regulatory default of full removal of all infrastructure, um, particularly as it relates uh, to the removal of long-distance export pipelines and interfield pipelines uh, we're talking about steel and concrete here um, where clear alternatives exist internationally by limiting decommissioning activities to the preparation disconnection cleaning and site remediation to leave all inter export and interfield pipelines in place would save some nine billion dollars on the overall liability alone these are pipelines that have existed on the seafloor for some 40 years in cases that have formed natural habitats and attract not only industry through enhanced fish stocks but are important to local communities in regional Australia in, su in supporting the community recreation that's associated in those areas. That is the magnitude of what we're talking about here. Billions of dollars of foregone tax revenue, an impact to the environment that makes no sense whatsoever and an impact to our regional Australian communities. 
Implementing alternative arrangements for pipelines alone would save the taxpayer some $5.2 billion. In terms of the environmental impact, because at the end of the day everyone that comes to this place enjoys Australia's pristine ocean environment. As a Western Australian who has visited Exmouth and Coral Bay uh, on the site of the, the uh, world-famous Ningaloo Reef, I associate with that deeply. But that oil and gas infrastructure we're talking about is often underwater for decades, covered in marine life. Requiring operators to fully remove that infrastructure doesn't always make environmental sense. Few studies of the environmental impact of leaving that infrastructure offshore in situ in Australia have been completed, and that's a problem. However, studies from comparable international environments are already available. Under controlled guidelines, there is reasonable evidence already available which shows that in some circumstances leaving offshore infrastructure in situ or partially removing it is not only sufficient but in fact better for the ocean environment as compared to complete removal. There are multiple factors which need to be weighed and that makes decommissioning a complex matter. It shouldn't be a partisan political football because of the impact to Australians. Some examples of those uh, environmental benefits include attracting uh, uh, fish at all stages, whether adult, larval or juvenile fish, uh, including commercially significant species, providing a spawning habitat, habitat for marine life, introducing hard, services, which, hard surfaces which allow for greater marine biodiversity. Marine life that thrives in varying depths often settles along vertical infrastructure in locations that would not normally be available due to the prevailing water depth. Infrastructure can provide shelter, protection from fisheries and a natural protection thereby enhancing production levels of certain commissionally significant fish species within a region. Creating those artificial reefs uh, also provides fishing, tourism and community amenity in, in regional Australia. The concern that any proposed change to the Act permitting in situ decommissioning is inconsistent uh, with our obligations as a signatory to the London Convention is frankly rubbish. Indeed, the United Kingdom has uh, world best practice legislation to deal with decommissioning liabilities uh, and they are, of course, where the London Protocol was signed. In fact, the UK's decommissioning legislation, which requires that uh, uh, it, uh, a consideration and advice on alternatives to abandoning or decommissioning where it comes to the installation or pipelines, such as reusing or preserving it, is enshrined in United Kingdom's legislation. That's what we're talking about here. Other jurisdictions who have already taken steps to recognise not only the environmental but the economic, community and social factors that this issue raises. Considering that the United Kingdom is not alone in this, with the United States, Norway and Japan already employing these best practices, the Australian oil and gas industry is in need of further legislative reform. Those other nations are slightly ahead of Australia's industry because their oil and gas assets are slightly older. Therefore, they're further advanced in the decommissioning phase of their infrastructure life cycle, but they are tangible examples that show that these improved decommissioning methods can be sustainably implemented. It's noteworthy also that the United Kingdom, not only, but also Norway, the United States and Japan are fellow signatories to the London Protocol. So whilst I understand that this bill is an important and positive step to develop a solution to prevent recurrence of the Northern Endeavour situation. It's important, in my view, that the research and advice to the department pulled together, uh, along with consultation with industry experts and stakeholders, should be considered, invested in and warrants further consideration. This legislation is a step in the right direction, but it is not the destination for which Australian taxpayers need us to get. When you consider the looming task of a maturing offshore oil and gas industry, assets and the related uh, financial liabilities associated, these growing demands do require our attention quite urgently. That number of $17.8 billion 
of taxation revenue foregone in the next 10 years sticks very clearly in my mind when it comes to paying for the sorts of services and investments that Australia needs as we move beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. I've welcomed this uh, legislation and I, I'm here to advocate that we further consider in a more holistic way the needs of decommissioning so that it is uh, balancing environmental, economic, social and community factors in what is a complex a nuanced area of Australian legislation. I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Small. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy President. And, um, and I have no declaration of having worked for any of the big um, oil or mining companies across this country. I'm just a humble teacher and a lecturer in education from the Central Coast and a small business family background. But nonetheless, I understand what it means when you come into government to have a really good look at what's going on, to get in the race early, not wait to the last minute, see what's going on and prevent the situation that we are coming in here to correct today. And make no mistake, this is a correction of a failure of government to see what was going on and to bring in a timely bill a long, long time before this day to prevent the matter that it's seeking to use as a historical moment for a change going forward. Well, you know, there are lots of concerns about retrospective legislation. You can understand why there's pressure against that. But the only reason there would be pressure for this to be retrospective is because the government weren't on the job. Anything that really matters, they don't do until it's too late. And then they do it in the most untidy way. So let's just have a look at this bill, which does seek to do something good, finally, but is once again too little, too late by a government who are obsessed with announcements over actually doing the day job of showing up properly, planning and delivering legislation in a timely way to benefit the people of Australia. And the bill on this one, the cost to the Australian people of this delay, is $200 million. So it costs when you don't show up. It costs when you don't get to the starting line. It costs when you don't do your day job and you're the government. So, Mr. President, I rise today to speak on the Offshore Petroleum Gas House, Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment, Titles Administration and Other Measures Bill. And it is, as I said, a, a reform in dealing with offshore equipment and infrastructure that helps prevent companies from actually dodging their corporate responsibility to do what every kid learns even at preschool, to clean up after yourself after they've extracted the nation's uh, resource wealth. Even Senator Small, in his contribution just before I stood, spoke about Australia being behind, not just because our assets are a little younger than those assets of the UK, Norway, US and Japan, but because this government doesn't think it needs to do stuff to protect Australia. It just needs to show up, be in power, give itself a few little pockets of money that it can rot and send out, and that'll do. That's good enough. Well, it's not good enough. This piece of legislation is particularly relevant when we consider the recent debacle surrounding the Northern Endeavour. Now, this was an oil vessel that was anchored in the Timor Sea, beautiful part of the country. Um, but it's going to cost the taxpayers, as I said, $200 million to clean up after its inexperienced owner purchased the platform from Woodside. That owner, Northern Oil and Gas Australia, Proprietary Limited, was then forced to close after the National Offshore Petroleum Safety and Environmental Management Authority, known as NOPSEMA, found that there were actually a lot of significant environmental and safety concerns that were associated with the, um, the Northern Endeavour. So what were those concerns? Well, one was corrosion, another the ability to respond to an oil spill, another faulty fire suppression system and a significant risk of a major incident occurring. And remember where this is? In the Timor Sea. You don't have to be a mining executive to have some sense of value not just of what's under the seabed, but of the value of the sea itself and its amazing uh, environmental um, asset base. 
Um, the decision unfortunately forces um, the, pay the taxpayer to fund the cost of decommissioning and the environmental cleanup, and it leads to calls for a change to the regime by which titles are transferred. So essentially, the company that was big, Woodside, that owned it and could have paid for a cleanup, got rid of it just before, just in the nick of time, according to their calculations, before it went to a smaller company that was unable to do the maintenance and the cleanup. So, What's the impact? Well, unfortunately, it forces the taxpayer to fund the cost of decommissioning and the environmental cleanup, and it leads to calls to change the regime by which that title transfer from a big, smart company with a whole lot of lawyers and an awful lot of money to a smaller company with less assets and perhaps a lot of innovation, desire and enterprise, but less capacity to do the job of cleanup. And it's clear, retrospectively, that Noga didn't have the experience or the capital necessary to effectively manage the title. <coughs> Clearly, the current um, legislative framework is totally insufficient and sensible reform is needed. Now, the bill establishes four key reforms to the current regime. It provides for oversight of changes that occur in control of titles and now includes offshore projects being transferred via the sale of shares. So somebody's going to be watching. Um, Senator O'Neill. Um, oh, sorry. We're ahead of time. I was just going to say we're at the hard marker, but we're already there. My apologies. Please continue. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Um, the bill also includes electronic lodgement of applications and provides for expanded information gathering powers to aim to suppress the suitability uh, to assess the suitability of entities wishing to enter the title regime. So somebody's going to be watching. Previously, they weren't. Finally, <laughs> and most importantly, it expands existing powers to recall previous title holders and demission, uh, decommission infrastructure and remediate the marine environment if the current title holder is unable to do so. So if you are responsible for it and somebody else gets it and they do and, and it starts to fall apart, you, you don't just sort of hand over your responsibility. That's really what's going on with uh, one of the core parts of this bill. So the last reform uh, I mentioned there I hope will, I'm hopeful will change the industry attitude by increasing the due diligence that's required of companies when they decide that they're going to offload the title. They can't just dump the problem on the next person and run with the profits away. And there's nothing wrong about profit making from investment in oil and gas. There is innovation there, there's resource needs in our communities. But people who are in those responsible roles as the leaders of these big companies, multinational companies too frequently, not Australian owned, cannot cut and run and leave the Australian people with a tax bill. We can't afford to be spending money to clean up for these big companies. They should be doing it themselves. I also note that the federal government has proposed a levy on the industry to fund the decommissioning of the Northern Endeavour. Now, this policy debacle that we're discussing here has led to a new tax on the industry due to the gap in the previous legislation and the fact that the government didn't show up to do its day job around this issue of protecting our environment from leaky assets that are past the use date by date. Now, the new legislation means that those industry players who are doing the right thing, who play by the rules, are not unnecessarily penalised by the short-sighted actions of the few. Well, at least that's the plan. Now, according to the explanatory memorandum, the new regime will ensure um, trailing liability across the entire life of the lease and expands the remedial directions provision in the OPGGS Act to require any formal title holder or related person of a current or former title holder to carry out decommissioning if the current or immediate former title holder is unable to do so. And trailing liability will be a measure of last resort where all other regulatory options have been exhausted. It aims to ensure that the risks and liabilities of petroleum activities remain the responsibility of those who held or had the ability to influence operations under the title and change industry behaviour by increasing the due diligence undertaken by companies regarding who they sell their assets to. I think it's altogether fair and reasonable for those companies who've profited off the extraction of our, petro our petroleum wealth to make their contribution to remediating the site. In the case of Northern Endeavour, it extracted 200 million barrels of oil, nearly $15 billion worth of oil in today's prices. And it's obscene that after that lucrative cargo is collected, the taxes of ordinary average Australian family should have to fork out $200 million to remediate that site. 
A peer of the industry's peak body believes that the cost of rehabilitating all former oil rigs in Australia would cost, as Senator Small indicated, about $60 billion by 2040. So this has got to get right, and it's got to be fixed quickly. This is, in fact, a ticking time bomb for Australian taxpayers, and this legislation goes some way, but not all the way, only some way, to ensuring that this burden doesn't fall on everyday Australians, but rather with the entity responsible for the infrastructure and the associated works that require re rehabilitation. Now, without effective action, we could potentially see the phenomenon I've just been discussing with the Northern <coughs> Endeavour actually proliferating right across the sector, as many mining companies have done, uh, where oil giants dump soon-to-be decommissioned assets onto dollar companies and then abdicate all responsibility for remediation of the sites, leaving taxpayers footing multi-million dollar invoices. In my home state of New South Wales alone, the New South Wales Audit Office found in 2017 that security deposits of the state's 450 mines do not include sufficient contingency given the substantial risks and uncertainties associated with mine rehabilitation and closure to fill in their voids or maintain vegetation when operations cease. Current practices support endeavour and entrepreneurship and jobs, but when you've made your money, and the cleanup needs to be done, it is entirely unreasonable to ask someone else to do the job unless you pay them to do so. Now, Labor will be supporting this bill as tardily as it has arrived. We support it because we believe in corporate responsibility and we absolutely believe in the health of the marine environment. And I want to shout out to people on the Central Coast back home where I haven't been now for six weeks. I'm missing, I'm missing my community and I'm missing seeing that beautiful ocean, the Great Pacific Ocean, every single day. One of the most wonderful things about Australia is our abundant flora and fauna, both on the land and in the sea. An oil spill off the coast would absolutely jeopardise our beloved pristine mar maritime and marine environment, as well as thousands of tourist jobs. Now, fear of an oil spill is why my local community on the Central Coast is so fearful of the development of the PEP 11 exploration permit, which they fear will plot the landscape, block the landscape, as well as put us at risk of an environmental disaster on the Central Coast and not far from Newcastle and Sydney. After a very, very long day, the long, long delay, the uh, local member for Robertson, Ms. Wicks, and Mr. Morrison finally got the message from the community, and then they put a message out via media. Via media um, after years of delay, that they personally oppose PEP 11. But the gap between what this government says and what it then actually does widens by the day. It's more of a chasm, really, than a gap. I do note, however, that neither Mr Morrison nor Mr. Wicks, uh, Ms Wicks have responsibility for making the announcement about PEP 11. That goes to Minister Pitt. Now, Minister Pitt's deafening silence on the matter of PEP 11 licence extensions is very troubling to the people of the Central Coast. And as a true Central Coast resident, I call on Minister Pitt to come clean, issue a public statement and once and for all rule out PEP 11. The Central Coast needs to have this sort of Damocles removed from our head, keep our beaches pristine and unpolluted, <coughs> tell the truth, put it on the record. Put it out in writing so that the community can actually be confident that there's no gap between the weasel words of the Prime Minister and Ms Wicks and the action of the government that uh, Mr Morrison leads. So, Despite the PM's impressionistic effort to look like he's with the Central Coast community, this failure to direct Minister Pitt to end PEP 11 oil threat is real. Minister Pitt has the power to cut PEP 11 out of our lives, out of our environment out of our pristine coastal water, out of our community. Like cancer, PEP 11 needs to be cut right out and now. No mucking about, no ifs, no buts, no hints, no babies, just gone. Once again with the Morrison, dollar, Morrison government, it's a minute late and a dollar short. As always with this government, their lack of leadership, their poor management always has a cost. This offshore petroleum greenhouse gas storage amendment, Titles Administration and Other Measures Bill 2021, should not have been triggered by a potential catastrophe in the Timor Sea. But we do have this legislation. We do have it before us at last. Thankfully, the government 
and perhaps listening to wise public servants who they so often seem to ignore, ignore has come to the table in an effort to prevent future disasters. It still is going to cost the Australian people $200 million to fix up the Northern Endeavour problem that happened on the watch of this government. Well, it's supposed to be on the watch of this government. They actually weren't watching. I commend the bill to the floor of the House, but I do note in doing so that there was an announcement uh, of an industry-wide levy of 48 cents a barrel, which I referred to in my previous remarks. But to the best of my knowledge, there is no bill, which would be a Treasury bill, that has been brought to the parliament to actually do the next <coughs> vital you, step of the parliament. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Deputy President. And I rise to speak on the offshore petroleum and greenhouse gas storage amendment Cross-boundary greenhouse gas titles and other measures bill 2019 and the offshore petroleum greenhouse gas storage regulatory levies amendment miscellaneous measures bill also of 2019. Uh, now these bills strengthen Australia's offshore oil and gas regulatory regime by ensuring that the decommissioning of oil rigs managed and uh, costs, the immense costs of that decommissioning doesn't fall to the taxpayer. Uh, and it also clarifies the application of levies in relation to cross-boundary greenhouse gas titles. Now, these bills came about after the owner of the Northern Endeavour, Northern Oil and Gas, went into liquidation in February last year after being shut down the previous year by the offshore oil and gas regulator after it found corrosion issues that could lead to a major accident causing multiple fatalities and environmental damage. Now, of course, the facility was previously owned by Woodside, which had sold the Northern Endeavour to Northern Oil and Gas as a late in life asset just three years prior to the shutdown. Uh, so this is really only part of the fix, this bill, with Appia's mm -hmm. own data being that the cost liability uh, in our offshore waters runs to some $60 billion over the next 30 years. So Woodside is, once again, getting off lightly. They've spread their liabilities right across the entire gas industry. And the Greens will support this legislation because extracting any tax from the gas industry is like getting blood from a stone, um, particularly when the uh, Australian Tax Office has called the gas industry systemic non-payers of tax. So billions in subsidies to the gas industry uh, freebies to avoid paying the petroleum resources rent tax. What a dud deal the gas industry is for the Australian taxpayer, not to mention the climate, which I'll talk about at length shortly. So whilst we will be supporting this bill, we're not going to gloss over what Woodside is getting away with here. They donate at least $110,000 each year to each major party, uh, year in and year out. Over the last decade, $2.1 million has been handed over by Woodside to the Liberal, National and Labor parties. Quite a lot of influence. Now, remember when the Howard government planted a bug in the cabinet room of East Timor's cabinet? It was for the commercial advantage of Woodside. Foreign Minister at the time, Alexander Downer, then of course went to work for Woodside after leaving Parliament. Australia spied on a vulnerable foreign government to advance the interests of this gas company. And the only ones that are now paying the price for that are, of course, Witness Kay and Bernard Caleri for exposing it. Um, this government then scrapped the carbon price, which Woodside, as Australia's ninth biggest polluter, had to pay, saving the company millions a year yet again. And now this bill will save Woodside a bucket load yet again. Now, we're in this mess because Woodside offloaded an old rig, the Northern Endeavour, to a fly-by nighter who went bankrupt within a very short time of acquiring the assets. So Woodside could conveniently avoid the decommissioning costs. So Woodside have privatised the profits and socialised the losses, as so often happens in the mining industry. Any sense of justice said that they should, says that they should pay the full costs, but a long-term levy on the industry decommissioning is the next best solution. There are so many gaps in the government's knowledge. We need a forensic audit of orphan wells and temporary plugs because the government doesn't know where they all are. Now, who's responsible for those? 
And how many more of these assets are there going to be for future generations to decommission? There's hundreds of production platforms around this country, including uh, Bass Strait off the coast of Tasmania. And even Victoria's iconic 12 apostles are now under assault. The Victorian Labor government is on the brink of allowing new gas drilling on Kirang Warren country in the Port Campbell National Park, right near the 12 apostles, which comes just weeks after the federal Liberal government uh, opened up vast areas for drilling just six kilometres from the 12 apostles. The Victorian state government immediately should withdraw support for the new gas, uh, new gas drilling in our pristine oceans. Um, and on land, including at the 12 Apostles National Park. The Victorian State Government should reject the application by Beach Energy to begin gas production in Victorian waters on the doorstep of the 12 Apostles. It should retract its support for the Liberal Government's plans to drill for gas in the Commonwealth waters surrounding the 12 Apostles Marine Park. And frankly, it should reinstate the moratorium on onshore gas drilling to protect both farms and bushland and the climate uh, from new gas. So on that mention of climate, I foreshadow that I will be moving a second reading amendment, standing in my name, to the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment Titles Administration and Other Measures Bill 2021, uh, which adds to the end of the motion, having regard to the role emissions from offshore petroleum projects play in atmospheric warming, then it notes the recent report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that the planet is warming at the fastest rate in at least 2,000 years, rapidly approaching one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels. Notes the recent statement by the International Energy Agency that new coal, oil and gas projects, including offshore petroleum projects, must cease by 2021 if we hope to limit global temperature rise to one and a half degrees and calls on the government to act urgently on the IPCC and IEA's warnings. So I'll be uh, moving that second reading <clears throat> once we come to that uh, stage. I understand there's already a second reading amendment before the chair. But the IEA don't issue those sorts of warnings lightly. They are a fairly conservative agency and that is a clear call by then to get out of uh, coal, oil and gas and to not have any new coal, oil and gas uh, by the end of this year. And the IPCC report, which was released a fortnight or so ago, is again a clear, dark warning. It's a warning after a long series of warnings, and it is just absolutely terrifying. It shows that the world is heating uh, faster than scientists previously thought. The sea level rise um, is rising faster in Australia than in the rest of the world, and that the world's hotter now than it has been in the last 125,000 years. The IPCC report shows that we're on track for more frequent and more intense heat waves, uh, floods, fires, droughts. Australia has the most to lose, but our government is doing the least to stop it. The Paris Agreement says that we should aim to limit global warming to one and a half degrees, um, but it, it also warns, the IPCC report warns that we might hit that one and a half degrees within a decade, much sooner than previously projected. At one and a half degrees, those extreme drought events become twice as likely to occur. The most extreme heat waves, the ones that we only used to see once a century or twice a century, would happen almost every five years. And at one and a half degrees, we will lose most of what's left of the Great Barrier Reef after having already lost 50% of its coral cover with three successive bleaching events over the last uh, six years. The IPCC report makes it clear that if we don't have huge cuts to pollution soon, and that means by 2030, not by fictitious 2050, if we don't have those deep cuts, that one and a half degrees or even two degrees could be out of reach. We're in a world uh, and we're risking a world where climate change could become unstoppable and the world could become uninhabitable. The tipping points are fast approaching. The collapse of the ice sheet at our poles, the dieback, of the Amazon and our uh, boreal forests, the shutdown of our ocean currents, the melting of the Arctic permafrost. The warning is perfectly clear. And after that IPCC report coming on the heels of the IEA's strong call for no new oil and gas, a failure to have 2030 targets on the opposition side and a failure to lift our pathetic 
uh, existing government 2030 targets is criminal negligence. Mr Morrison is failing to protect Australians from the climate crisis and he is putting lives at risk. Mr Morrison's 2030 targets are a death sentence and the so-called opposition is letting him off the hook by continuing to not have 2030 targets at all. 2030 is the deadline for the climate and if we haven't done enough by then, then I fear it will be too late. Australia has already warmed by 1.4 degrees and we are more vulnerable than other countries uh, to extreme weather. Now, Mr Morrison should be out leading the charge for global action, but instead he's uh, fibbing and spinning about his own failure to act and the world knows it. It's I don't hold a hose writ large. And last month, in the middle of the G7 meeting, which was mostly uh, focused on talking about taking climate action, the Prime Minister nipped out of that, uh, of that global meeting and video linked into the Perth conference of, the, um, of APIA, the Petroleum uh, Production and Exploration Association, the gas lobby. He videoed into the gas lobby's conference in Perth and he announced 80,000 square kilometres of new ocean permits for the fossil fuel industry uh, to be burnt and produce carbon dioxide and add to global warming in a climate emergency when the rest of the world is in a meeting that's focused on taking action on the climate. That was our Prime Minister. This is our government. So there is a long way to go before we see determined and realistic action from the Morrison government when it comes to climate change. I suspect that it will take a fresh government and the Greens in the balance of power for any semblance of science-based climate policy to be delivered. Um, but on the occasion of these uh, particular bills, um, we are pleased that they are finally taking a step in the right direction, albeit a tiny and belated one. And we stand ready uh, to work with both parties to address the climate crisis as always. Um, this isn't going away. And what we see is a legacy of bad behaviour by the fossil fuel industry who don't pay their fair share of tax get a whole a lot of handouts uh, by taxpayers, uh, from taxpayers by this government after making very generous donations to both sides of politics. It is a quintessential example of regulatory capture um, and in fact it's a plutocracy. The mining companies have been effectively running the parliament for decades and it's about time that we ended those donations from that dirty sector and um, transitioned out fossil fuel fuels um, embraced the uh, fantastic economic opportunities of a fast and deep transition to renewable energy with all of the jobs and economic stimulus that that could provide and finally heeded the science on the climate crisis to save what's left of this precious and beautiful planet that we all share not just for future generations but for the other species that we share it with and for the people who are already experiencing the effects of climate change now our northern neighbors whose food producing land is becoming uh, too saline to produce food in. This isn't some future problem. This is not 2030's problem. This is now's problem. It's certainly not 2050's problem, as this government would have us believe. So um, we welcome that we have a, a skerrick of action taken on the offshore gas industry, offshore oil and gas industry, cleaning up their own mess. Um, frankly, it's laughable that we even need legislation. They should have been cleaning up their own mess um, for decades without the need for um, this legislature to tell them to do so. But here we are and we will be welcoming um, and supporting these bills. So I will be, um, as I foreshadowed, moving that second reading amendment, which calls for meaningful action on the climate crisis uh, if we are to have any hope of a livable future. And I hope and implore um, parties in the chamber to support that. <coughs> Thanks so much, Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Bay. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment, Titles, Administration and Other Measures Bill 2021, and the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Regulatory Levies Amendment Bill 2021. The Australian offshore oil and gas industry is subject to the, some of the world's most stringent and rigorous environmental regulation. The industry is committed to adhering to these regulations and operating in an environmentally safe manner. As I've worked with many energy companies across my career, both upstream and downstream, I've seen firsthand 
how hard those companies work to ensure that, their environment, that the environment is protected throughout their operations. The industry currently applies some of the most extensive environmental management strategies to ensure their operations are conducted safely and responsibly. It is clear that the industry works to the highest standards and has a long history of world-class responsible environmental management. It is important to recognise that Australia's offshore oil and gas industry has supported Australia's energy security and economic activity for over 50 years. Our economy has benefited from the export earnings, investment and employment opportunities that it has delivered for Australians. In my home state of Victoria, there are 23 offshore platforms and installations in the Bass Strait. This includes the new Marlin V platform and the Kipper subsea wells, which feed a network of around 600 kilometres of underwater pipelines. These projects will provide Australians and Victorians with good jobs and economic support for Australia for decades to come. Just as the creation of the natural gas production and distribution in Victoria in the late 1960s, along with cheap electricity from, from coal down in those basins, made the state a manufacturing powerhouse. With the moratoriums that have been in place in Victoria over recent years, the state is being brought to its knees on energy supply, and we need to correct that. But we need to do it with proper environmental regulation. If we are to properly support our resources sector, we must have the right regulatory framework in place. This allows them to operate efficiently and to the safest standards possible. Having the right regulatory framework in place also ensures that best practice is followed, fo is followed th through the entire life cycle of a project. As Australia's petrol offshore petroleum industry continues to mature, there will be an increased focus on management of mid to late life assets. This includes managing declining production while preparing to decommission offshore facilities, wells and pipelines. This is sensible foresight by the government to deal with normal and expected changes occurring in the industry. There are particular points of the life cycle of, of any industry when regulatory frameworks and practices need to adapt to the changing circumstances. As the times change and the conditions in which we operate change, we must change with it. For the offshore, offshore oil and gas industry, that time is now, and as a government, we are responding accordingly. We must be prepared to deal with the future challenges that we will face as this industry begins to mature to ensure that the taxpayer, shareholders, the workers and the natural environment is protected. These were all important considerations in, 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 which, we, in which these bills will address. It is important that we strike the right balance between investment and managing an industry that is steadily maturing. This government wants to see that an industry that has benefited the nation so greatly is not left out in the cold with outdated regulations. Nor do we want to see the taxpayer or the environment left holding the bad bag either. These bills, complemented, uh, sorry, th these bills um, will strengthen Australia's offshore oil and gas regulatory regime to ensure that emerging decommissioning work facing the industry are able to be managed effectively and the costs of decommissioning an offshore project remain with those who are responsible for carrying out the project. This will importantly ensure that the cost does not fall to the Australian taxpayer at the end of a project's life cycle. In the coming decades, there will be a number of offshore projects which have exhausted their reserves and require decommissioning. This is a normal part of the resource develop development life cycle and, if properly managed, the decommissioning of these projects will not provide the government, or most importantly the taxpayer, with any unforeseen burdens. Fundamentally, that is what these bills intend to do, to manage our resources and related infrastructure effectively. Thankfully, we will see the development of new projects such as the Scarborough, Browse and Bar Barossa gas projects, which will continue to support our economy and energy security in the coming decades. However, these projects that are, however, those projects that are in the latter part of their life cycle need the correct regulatory framework to ensure, uh, in place to ensure that their decommissioning is handled correctly. 
as the industry continues to mature, mature, large companies may move to divest their mature assets to focus on new areas of production potential. Australia can expect to see new entrants to the industry, smaller companies or joint ventures with a, who bring a fresh perspective and a different risk profile. This bill implements aspects of the government's uh, enhanced offshore, and offshore oil and gas decommissioning framework and the relevant recommendations from the independent review into the circumstances leading to the administration and liquidation of Northern Oil and Gas Australia. By amending the Act to enhance regulatory oversight of activities that companies may undertake during the mid to late life of a project, including decommissioning, this bill reduces the risk of another Northern Oil and Gas Australia-like incident from occurring again. For those of you who are unaware of the Northern Oil and Gas Australia incident, in February 2020 this group went into liquidation, leaving the Northern Deva floating production, storage and offtake facility without an operator. This was an unfortunate incident that left the government responsible for ensuring the safety of the facility and conducting critical maintenance work. How the government responded to this incident and the implementation of these bills sends a strong signal to the world that Australia will maintain its global reputation as a safe, reliable and responsible country for offshore oil and gas development. <coughs> this bill, Madam Acting Deputy President, ensures that uh, Madam Deputy President ensures that companies operating in Australia's offshore oil and gas regulatory regime are capable, competent and responsible in managing their offshore projects by ensuring that when projects are decommissioned they are managed effectively and that the associated costs of decommissioning importantly remains with the entity involved. We want to ensure that we have the best oversight framework and that the offshore oil and gas industry manages the current and future decommissioning challenges to ensure that our world-class offshore oil and gas industry remains exactly that, world-class. The first bill provides government oversight of transactions involving a change in the control of a petroleum or greenhouse gas title holder. The sale of an offshore gas project is intended to be captured as a transfer of the title under the Act. However, offshore projects can also be tra transferred by the sale of the shares in a company that owns or operates the project. These transactions are not currently captured by the Act because there is no transfer of interest of the petroleum title or titles. This is essential to ensure that mature assets are transferred in line with government regulation while maintaining an environment that encourages investment. If regulatory approval is not obtained for this type of corporate transaction, significant civil penalties may be imposed. In addition, the title can also be cancelled. This approach is consistent with similar regimes across the Commonwealth. It is also important that regulations provide for trailing liability, and this is what this bill encompasses. By expanding the remedial directions provisions in the Act, any former title holder can be called, up, called upon to carry out decommissioning if the current or immediate former title holder is unable to do so. This, of course, is intended to be a measure of last resort where all other options have been exhausted. However, the Northern Oil and Gas Australia incident reiterated the fact that we, as a government, must be prepared for all scenarios. As the Act stands now, only an immediate former title holder can be directed to decommission and remediate an area. This reduces the environmental health and safety risks associated with the potential abandonment of assets and infrastructure and ensures that risks and liabilities of petroleum activities remain the responsibility for those who have been involved in the development of the project and not the government or taxpayers. This will set the expectation that sellers will undertake appropriate due diligence before selling assets, titles and infrastructure. In this bill, Madam Deputy President, amendments are provided to improve the administration of petroleum and greenhouse gas titles. We want to ensure that while best practice is being followed, assets can be transferred in the most effective manner possible. As I mentioned earlier, as the industry begins to mature, we expect to see new entrants to the industry who bring a different risk profile. By improving the administration of petroleum and, petroleum and greenhouse gas titles, 
we can ensure that the transfer of the, these assets is done without fault and in line with government regulation. The levies bill amends the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Regulatory Levies Act of 2003 to enable NOPSEMA, the National Offshore Petroleum Safety and Environmental Management Authority, to expand existing cost recovery mechanisms to former title holders or related persons when issued a direction. Again, this will ensure that what occurred at the Northern Oil and Gas Australia incident will not occur again. The government has been actively working with key stakeholders in the offshore oil and gas industry to seek advice on reforms to make sure the circumstances surrounding the Northern Endeavour do not happen again. We have a world-class <coughs> offshore oil and gas industry and we intend to keep it that way. Our oceans represent some of the most diverse and pristine ecosystems in the world and this government is committed to ensuring that they are protected. These bills are one layer to the many components we are putting in place to achieve this. Recently, the National Plastics Plan was announced with the aim of reducing the amount of plastics that can impact our environment. In April this year, the Prime Minister announced an additional $100 million investment to ensure that we remain a world leader in marine park management. Our oceans are the lifeblood of the Australian economy. They not only supply um, thousands of jobs around Australia, but play a vital role in maintaining a healthy planet. It is our duty to ensure that, we, that those who rely on the ocean and interact with it, whether for enjoyment or for commercial reasons, do so in a responsible manner. Our resources sector is absolutely vital to our economy and our energy security. Importantly, this government is committed to ensuring that this critical industry has proper regulations around it so it can continue to operate in an environmentally safe manner. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. I rise to speak on the offshore petroleum and greenhouse gas storage amendment, total administration and other measures bill 2021. The purpose of this bill is to stop offshore petroleum companies entering transactions whose dominant purpose is to is avoidance of the decommissioning and remediation costs of end of life assets. The proposed legislation is a regulatory response to Woodside's plan to avoid liabilities in the Timor Sea, which ends with the Australian taxpayer being on the hook for $1.6 billion. The story behind this legislation needs to be put on the record because it's more than a story of incompetence by the regulators and incompetence by a parade of government ministers drawn from the National Party. It is also the story of a government which prefers the interest of its foreign-owned petroleum companies over the interest of the Australian citizens. So let us begin the story. In September 2015, Woodside Petroleum entered into an agreement to dispose of its majority interest in the Laminaria and um, Coralina joint venture, which included the Northern Endeavour, this floating oil production, storage and offtake facility. The Laminaria and Coralina oil leases are located 550 kilometres of Darwin under 340 metres of water in the Timor Sea. By 2014, these oil fields had reduced 100% of their expected production. Woodside decided these petroleum assets had reached the end of their life. Woodside's Timor Sea petroleum assets were unsellable because the liabilities far outweighed any asset value. Woodside considering considered decommissioning these oil assets, but instead came up with a less costly plan. They decided to transfer the assets and liabilities to a small company, which would eventually go bust, leaving the Australian taxpayer with, with the clean-up costs. Entering a transaction whose dominant purpose was the avoidance of billion-dollar clean-up cost made sense. There were no anti-avoidance provisions in the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Act 2006, so what they planned to do was legal. In 2015, Woodside paid a small group of companies $24 million to take over their Timor Sea assets and liabilities. The first act of tra this tragedy had been written. 
a handful of foreign-owned transnational companies which operate in Australia's offshore waters knew Woodside was offloading its liabilities, initially to a small company, but later to the Australian taxpayers. It seems only the regulators and the minister did not understand what was happening. In any case, the industry watched to see if Woodside would get away with their plan. If they did, then it meant it would be okay for them to do the same. The industry did not have to wait long to see if Woodside's sting would work. The second act of this tragedy began when, in July 2019, the National Offshore Petroleum Safety and Environmental Management Authority, not SEMA, issued a prohibition notice on the Northern Endeavour. The owners of the Northern Endeavour pleaded for the prohibition notice to be replaced by an improvement notice, which would have given them time to generate funds and undertake repairs. The owners of the Northern Endeavour showed good faith by spending millions of dollars on repairs, but without any roadmap back to, re back to production, the business went into administration, then liquidation. 250 Australians lost their jobs. In February 2020, the Australian government became liable for up to a billion dollars or more of maintenance and clean-up costs. This event is without precedent. The Northern Endeavour Task Force was established to manage the Northern Endeavour. To date, $200 million has been spent on weekly maintenance costs of this oil ship. $200 million. I understand a further $382 million will be spent between now and mid-2023 when the Northern Endeavour is expected to be towed away. This additional cost is based on the currently weekly maintenance cost of $4 million for a further 96 weeks. So far, we can see the taxpayer on the hook for $582 million, enough to build a 300-bed hospital in regional Queensland. In March 2020, Steve Walker was asked to review the circumstances leading up to the government taking on the TMLC assets previously owned by Woodside Petroleum. In June 2020, the Walker Review was published and made public in September 2020 after a Freedom of Information request. The report, largely written by Nopsema, exonerates Nopsema and is a whitewash. Nopsema initially said health and, and environmental concerns were the reasons for the July 2019 prohibi prohibition notice on the Northern Endeavour but on the 18th of May 2021, they told me health and safety were their concerns. What happened in their environmental concerns? <clears throat> Those environmental concerns disappeared after the government commissioned Woodside to report on the environmental problems arising from the condition of the Northern Endeavour. We will never know what is in that $8.8 .8 million report because it is marked cabinet incompetence. What are they hiding? If not CNMA had commissioned the Woodside report before they issued a prohibition notice to stop production on the Northern Endeavour, then it is reasonable to assume 250 Australians might not have lost their jobs and taxpayers would not have lost $600 million that cannot be recovered. This bill we are debating to pay makes no provision for Woodside to pay for cleaning up the Northern Endeavour. That is the reason why I have proposed an amendment to make the legislation retrospective to the 1st of January 2015. If the legislation operates from the 1st of January 2015, then Woodside would pay for the costs it has avoided. If my Woodside amendment were supported, there would be no need for the proposed industry-wide levy announced in the May 2021 budget. The levy of 48 cents per barrel means the whole industry, not Woodside, would pay to clean up the Northern Endeavour and its associated oil fields. I think it's entirely understandable the industry is resisting this levy. The government is try still trying to persuade the offshore petroleum industry to pay for Woodside's liabilities, and that is the reason why, after 12 months, there is no legislation before the Senate. There is no reason to believe an industry-wide levy will be introduced. Woodside's Petroleum's gift of its liabilities to a small Australian company was like the bottom of the harbour tax schemes, which sent companies into liquidation, leaving the tax commissioner 
as the only creditor. The government closed these schemes by making it a criminal offence to enter them, but this time there is no consequence for Woodside. To understand why the government is willing to let the Australian taxpayer fork out up to a billion dollars in place of Woodside, we need to look at the relationship between Woodside Petroleum National Party ministers. Woodside is a corporate member of the National Party. This means Woodside's Petroleum pays $55,000 a year for special access to National Party ministers who, in a coalition government, traditionally hold the portfolio for offshore petroleum. Woodside Petroleum is not the only petroleum company to be corporate member of the National Party. The conflict of interest, apparent or real, is obvious. Why does the Prime Minister allow this conflict of interest to continue? The government knows much more than it's telling, but its decision not to make this legislation retrospective to catch the Woodside avoidance transaction makes sense, no sense if you genuinely represent the interest of Australians. The Woodside sting means they were able to recently enter into an agreement with BHP with a billion more in assets than they would otherwise have had. It's a lot of money and enough to grease a few palms. Labor intends to support the government to pass this legislation without making it retrospective. And they are doing that because something is better than nothing with an estimated industry liability of $60 billion in cleaning up end-of-life petroleum assets. The government and Labor could get together to make the legislation retrospective and save the taxpayer a couple of billion dollars, but they fear the power of petroleum companies with deep pockets so close to the next federal election. These stories will never be told by the two big parties because too often they prefer their future over the interests of Australians. But we all know one nation never puts its interests before the people of Australia. I'm constantly calling for accountability. In certain estimates a few years ago, I questioned the Minister for Resources, Senator Matt Canavan, with regards to the Northern Endeavour. He was evasive and didn't particularly want to answer my direct questions. Something stinks to high heaven with regards to the Northern Endeavour and you will never convince me otherwise. I will not support the legislation. If my amendment calling for Woodside to pay for costs and not the taxpayers is supported, if the Labor Party opposes my amendment, they also have to tell the Australian taxpayers why. I have questioned for years our oil and gas reserve about our oil and gas resources, about the profits and about the taxes that the multinationals should be paying but don't, only because the government is not pursuing it. There has been a lot of cover-ups that have happened and this is the biggest cover-up I've ever had, that I've ever seen. Woodside is responsible for that, to pay for these costs, not the Australian taxpayer to the tune of billions of dollars. And as I said to you, where is the legislation that is going to impose this levy? We haven't seen it. It's not before that. So it's all smoke and mirrors. It's all talk. So who's going to end up with paying this bill? Is you, the taxpayer, and me, out of my taxes. And that's why we have to stand up to this. And I'm calling on the Labor Party. I'm calling on the crossbenchers. I'm calling on the Greens Party. Let common sense prevail here. A company has done the wrong thing. They got rid of their assets to get out of the clean-up costs. That is the guts of this whole issue that I'm talking about now. So make sure that they have to pay for it. The Australian government expects it of any other Australian to pay for what they are responsible for. And that's all I'm asking. So I hope that the Labor Party does come on, on board with me in this. And I hope that the Liberal Party, the coalition government, sees the common sense in this that they should be paying for it. Because otherwise, I will question again, and I'll continue to question. Why is Woodside a corporate managed incorporation with the National Party? Why are they paying 55000 a year 
to actually have access to the National Party members, ministers, and to, to do with the petroleum and oil, gas. Why? Conflict of interest? Certainly is. Hello. Anyway, the public will judge you as I'm judging you, and you, like I said, I think it stinks to high heaven. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Senator Roberts remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Senator Roberts. Thank you. Thank you. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I note that while the government's bill has some merit, it raises far more questions than it does answers. Before explaining that, I'd like to note that I'm in quarantine. Now, I appreciate very much my staff and the staff at 2020 in uh, Canberra for their patience in setting up their remote parliament for me, despite my uh, uh, lag in, in uh, technology. Nonetheless, I dislike this setup. It is a mockery. I would much prefer travelling to, to Canberra where I can see eyeballs and read faces. What we are going through in our country is a nonsense. It is a complete nonsense. There is a risk, but it is not being managed. And we see the same mismanagement in, this, uh, in, in oil and gas as well. On the 20th of, of September 2019, the Northern Oil and Gas Australia Proprietary Limited, NOGA as it's called, that group of companies went into voluntary administration and subsequently on 7th of February 2020 into liquidation. As a consequence of the Northern Oil and Gas Australia's liquidation, the Commonwealth Government set up the Northern Endeavour Temporary Operations Program, taking control of the Northern Endeavour. And I take it that Australian taxpayers took on the costs until a longer term solution could be agreed to. As usual, this parliament looking after big corporate mates at the, sake, at the, at the cost of taxpayers. Australian taxpayers should not be made to pay the clean-up bills for multinational companies that make huge profits, pay no Australian company taxes, and leave us to fix the mess they left behind. We support a bill that provides for changes to enable the oversight and scrutiny of transactions involving a change of ownership or control of a petroleum or gas title holder through a merger or takeover. The amendment expands existing powers to call back previous title holders to decommission infrastructure and to remediate the marine environment in the title area where the current or immediate former title holder is unable to do so. We support the intention of ensuring that an entity should not transfer its assets to avoid the cost of cleaning up at the end of a profitable project and leaving the cost behind to be paid by taxpayers. The lessons learned from the Northern Endeavour have shown that the current regulatory framework is vulnerable. None of the regular, regulatory controls anticipated the circumstances of a title holder liquidation. Now this is a serious concern and as such events could be repeated as Australia's offshore industry matures and late life assets are likely to be passed from established major oil companies to smaller, less substantial title holders. The concept of trailing liability whereby a title holder would be continually liable, liable for the decommissioning and removal of its offshore assets even after selling its assets, its interests in a title, ensures that someone other than the taxpayer is responsible for the decommissioning liability. And that's exactly as it should be. And with an estimated $60 billion in anticipated decommissioning liabilities falling due over the next 30 years, this government and this parliament must ensure it can call upon former title holders to decommission and to remediate the title area in the unlikely event that the current title holder is unable to do so. Madam Acting Deputy President, we are the world's largest exporters of energy, the largest exporter of liquefied natural gas, second largest exporter of coal. Yet we have the world's highest domestic gas prices and electricity prices. Uh, and electricity prices are three times that of countries who use our coal to generate electricity. Now, why is that? Why can't we use more of our own gas domestically? Who made the deals that cut Australians out? This parliament made those deals over many decades. Why can't we build a transnational pipeline to bring Northwest Shelf gas to the east and convert it to produce liquid fuels like petrol and diesel? This gas is suitable for that. Why can't we use the gas itself to power cars now. Liberal Labor Nationals are clearly in election mode. 
promoting policies and changes that they think will win them votes. The reality is that neither have real plans and real solutions to get us out of COVID in the next year or, or to make the economy safe. This amendment, increasing the responsibility of petroleum gas uh, producers, is an easy vote winner. Where are the hard questions, though, being answered? Liberal Labor nationals lack the will to listen and the courage to do something novel and appropriate for the people of Australia and their national interests. We Australians need alternative leadership that we can trust, and we stand ready to address the big issues and to take a position that puts everyday Australians first. We can be sure that China and our Asian neighbours will continue using hydrocarbon fuels like gas, coal and oil for decades to come, like our natural gas and our coal for decades to come. What's more, China exploits labour, sacrifices the environment, sacrifices worker safety, and yet we still buy their products. And Liberal Labor nationals ignore calls for local manufacturing and industry development, as well as calls to support small business. Other facts that need consideration. The government, and indeed the parliament, repeatedly bets on technology that's unproven, does not provide jobs to replace those lost in coal power generators, and is very expensive. Hydrogen, the latest fad, costs at the moment $6 a kilogram to produce. The government's dream, this parliament's dream, is that they can bring it down to $2 per kilogram. Even at that price, far-fetched though it is, that would still reduce, that would still produce coal, uh, coal for, that would still produce electricity at $200 per megawatt hour. Four times the current cost of coal-fired electricity. Solar. We have a dependence on China for the solar installations, the solar, the solar components, the solar generators. The cost is high. The reliability of, of uh, electricity is atrocious. The stability of electricity is unstable. It's just not there. And we lose jobs. For every job created by solar and wind, we lose 2.2 jobs in the real economy. And as for wind, again, like solar, a dependence on China, high cost, exorbitantly high cost, low reliability, poor reliability, and unsta unstable, and again, losing jobs. Yet we have an abundant clean gas and coal. We should be an energy superpower, as we were when international investors flocked to the Hunter Valley, central Queensland, and Victoria to build aluminium refineries. These jobs are now gone, and under current Liberal Labor Nationals policies, manufacturing industry and jobs are doomed. And if we turn to this amendment again, it's a soft policy for the voters. Why is the government not legislating to protect us from the huge cost of site pollution and cleanups from the renewable energy generators? These sites are not forever. They last 10 to 15 years. That's it. Then they're redundant. They're gone. Actually, the assets are not gone. The eyesores are not gone. The pollution is not gone. But their productive capacity is finished. Eventually, like any machine, these these uh, generators will need to be repaired and replaced, and their components are expensive and highly toxic. For example, boron, gallium arsenide, and cadmium telluride, which could cause serious or permanent injury, such as nausea, skin problems, hypertension, weakness, kidney and liver disorders, heart palpitations, anxiety or depression, and cancers. Australians deserve better, far better. We all deserve to know the facts and the real risks and costs of these fat energies these parasitic malinvestments. Australians need to be shown the agreements and protections that renewable energy produ providers have signed up for. And the generators need to be committed to complementary legislative protections to this amendment. The current legislation must be replicated to capture these energy generators, such as solar and wind power. Remember, we're paying huge government subsidies to them, and yet they're not committed to the long-term protection of our environment. They're a parasitic threat to our precious natural environment. These changes require complementary legislation in the legislation governing renewables to ensure that they do not pollute our land or waterways, our children's playgrounds, our agriculture and crops, or the water we drink. And the taxpayer should not be left with the clean-up bill. Fair is fair. None of us would want to see a farmer given back land after it had been used for solar or wind energy generation, only to find that the toxic waste on it is a safety risk to all, a desert memorial to renewables. This legislation is a band-aid. If Liberal Labor nationals were serious, 
then we would have a level playing field for all energy sources, and with all being judged equally on their quality, reliability, cost. This bill does not go far enough. The National Party's mates intended to leaving the Northern Endeavour clean up to the taxpayer, and the Nationals and Liberals were very quick to agree. That seems to be a pattern. One Nation aims to close this loophole. Senator Lan Hanson has circulated an amendment to ensure that the company that made the vast profits from this project will pay for the cleanup, tabling a retrospective amendment. Any party who does not support this amendment will be supporting pollution and increasing, and that's real pollution, and increasing the bill for taxpayers. This government and Labor must show us it is serious about Northern Endeavour. The government must also go further and present similar legislation to protect us from toxic pollution from renewables. Australia needs alternative leadership that Australians can trust, and we stand ready to address the big issues and to take a position that puts everyday Australians first. One Nation supports the government's amendment, providing our retrospective amendment is adopted. We support cutting all subsidies to renewables and let them compete in a free market economy against hydrocarbon fuels to generate cheap, clean, affordable, reliable electricity for Australian businesses and homes. I want to address some comments made by Senator Waters in her address earlier this morning. All of her comments with regard to climate were based on the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and its lies and propaganda that the Greens wallow in and parade and push with no consequences and no thought for the Australians. No UN cat catastrophic climate uh, forecast has ever come true, not one. There is no basis for any of these UN IPCC claims of the Greens pedal. Never, never has the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change provided the empirical scientific evidence within a framework proving cause and effect that carbon dioxide from human activity will affect the climate and needs to be shut. We will be de de dealing with this in a, in a day fairly soon. Until then, we will continue to expose the government. And we note that today is day 714 since I challenged the Greens, Senator Di Natale, leader at the time, and Senator Waters at the time, to a debate on the empirical scientific evidence that shows carbon dioxide from human activity affects climate and needs to be cut, and a debate on the corruption of climate science by the United Nations and other organisations. It has been 11 years since I first challenged Senator Waters in a public forum where we were both speaking. Every time she has run from me. That's because there is no evidence. Now we have a toxic legacy that we ne will need to clean up in the future from this mess. But in the meantime, coming back to this, this bill, this legislation, we support the bill providing our amendment to make it retrospective to the perpetrators of the, of the Northern, Australia, Northern Oil and Gas Australia disaster are held accountable. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. The Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment Titles Administration and Other Measures Bill 2021 amends the Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Act 2006 to strengthen Australia's offshore oil and gas regulatory regime. The bill strikes an appropriate balance between implementing regulatory safeguards for Australian taxpayers, managing the impost on industry and encouraging continued investment in oil and gas development. I thank senators for the contribution they've made to this bill and I commend the bill to the chamber. Thank you, Senator Rustin. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Brown be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. The question is... Oh, it is. <laughs> Sorry, we have um, a amendment foreshadowed by the Australian Greens that was mentioned by Senator Waters in her contribution. Senator Hanson Young, would you be able to move that uh, second reading amendment on Senator Waters' behalf? Yes, I so move that motion. Thank that you. amendment. 
Thank you very much, Senator Hanson Young. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Hanson Young on behalf of Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, just in the, abs in the uh, um, respect of not calling a division, given the numbers and the difficulties today, uh, I would like the Australian Greens to be recorded and um, uh, perhaps if other parties could put their positions, that would be helpful. Otherwise, I will call a division. Um, thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, Senator Rustin. Uh, the Greens oppose this amendment, uh, and I can also advise. Um, I understand. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, you, we <laughs> the government. Same thing, Sarah. Um, so uh, the government opposes uh, the amendment as put forward on sheet 1386. Uh, and also note that in the absence of him being in the chamber, my understanding is that Senator Patrick supports your amendment. Thank you, Senator Rustin. Senator Watt. Uh, thanks, Madam Deputy President. Labor also opposes Amendment 1386. Thank you very much, Senator Watt. Senator Rustin. Oh, sorry. And in addition to that, can I also advise that my understanding is that um, Senator um, Hanson and Senator Roberts, um, who obviously can speak for themselves, and Senator Griff have also indicated that they oppose this amendment. Thank you, Senator Rustin. I'm just looking at the screens to see if any other senators want to seek the call on that at this point. No. Um, the question now is that the bill be read a second time. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, the question. Sorry, I've called the clerk. Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Amendment, Titles Administration and Other Measures Bill 2021, Offshore Petroleum and Greenhouse Gas Storage Regulatory Levies Amendment Bill 2021. Thank you very much, Clark. Uh, is it the wish of the committee that the bills be taken together and as a whole, there being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bills be agreed to without amendments or requests. And in front of me, I have uh, amendments moved by uh, the um, Pauline Hanson's One Nation and Senator Patrick, who is seeking the call. We have One Nation. I'm in the hands of the chamber. Senator Roberts, do you wish to move the amendments on behalf of One Nation? Oh. Hi. I am here, Chair. Um, I can oh, move that amendment. Senator Hanson, apologies. I, I couldn't yeah. see you on the screen. You may wish to move right. the amendments on behalf of One Nation. Right. So I'm moving the amendment um, <clears throat> to the Oil and Gas House Petroleum Bill um, on behalf of One Nation. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Um, you need to seek leave to move the amendments together. Okay. Seek leave to move the amendment, please. Is leave granted? Yes, leave is granted. Thank you very much. So I move the amendment circulated in the name of One Nation. Do you wish to speak to the amendment, Senator Hanson? Um, just for a few minutes, if I possibly can. You um, thank you. The, the government has put forward to charge this levy of 48 cents a barrel on the oil for cleanup costs. In light of it, um, yes, there are oil companies that have um, not done the right thing, <clears throat> and we do need to protect the environment. But as I've stated, it was all talk in the last budget by the federal government to introduce this levy, which would bring this amount of money into the coffers to clean up future environmental issues. The trouble is we haven't seen that legislation. It hasn't been presented to the floor of parliament. So we're putting a bill forward now that is actually going to charge the levy, but we haven't even put the bill forward of actually putting it in place that we had that bill. So we're putting the cart before the horse. But what I'm saying is Woodside purposely unloaded their assets in the Northern Endeavour so they knew they wouldn't be up for the billions of dollars in costs. 
I investigated about the Northern Endeavour for um, a, quite a time and going back three years ago. At Senate Estimates, I asked the questions of Senator Matt Canavan, who was a Minister of Resources, with regards to it. I was told it was due to environmental issues why it was shut down. There was no clear proof of anything. They said there was none, um, a, an object on the, on the deck of the ship. It was for health and safety reasons. Then they said it's health and safety reasons, so why it shut down, not environmental issues. But the ship was getting at the end of life. That's why Woodside unloaded it and an Australian company took it on. It was shut down and I believe was badly dealt with by Noxema. And I feel that the minister couldn't answer the questions. That needs to be a full investigation into what happened there. With the Australians losing their jobs. What I'm saying is in this legislation, and I know we don't like to do things retrospectively, but the fact is that you can't deny that Woodside unloaded this for $24 million to avoid hundreds of millions, possibly up to a billion dollars to clean that up. Why should it be at the, to the cost of the taxpayer? Why should they have to fork out this money? It is so wrong. Why do we keep protecting Order, these multiple? Senator Hanson, it being 1.30 p.m., the committee will now report progress. And right. we will Thank move you. to two-minute statements. Senator Green, remotely. Thank you very much. Um, I joined the Senate today to speak on the critical situation in Afghanistan where the Taliban have taken control of Kabul and Australian citizens, visa holders and others seeking refuge wait to be rescued and taken to safety. I want to acknowledge the members of the Australian Defence Force who are currently undertaking this mission, in particular the ADF personnel from Townsville's 1st and 3rd Battalions who are contributing to the de deployment. We thank them all for their service and their bravery. We also understand that this is a particularly difficult time for veterans across our country. Please know there is support there if you need it. I join in calling on the government to increase support to these organisations offering support to our veterans during this very difficult time. Finally, to the Afghan families in Australia who are waiting to hear from loved ones and to the people who have waited for many years to be joined by their family, to those who served alongside our soldiers and to the soldiers themselves who have been advocating on their behalf for so many years, we want you to know that you are not forgotten. Like many other MPs and senators, my office is assisting a number of families in this situation, and it is incredibly heartbreaking, and we should be doing everything in our power to play our part in accepting visa holders and refugees. We have a moral obligation to do this. We can't simply say that we wish things were different. It is too late for that. As Jason Skeynes, a veteran from Maryborough in Queensland, who has been trying to get his own Afghan interpreter to safety since 2013, said last week, we don't leave our mates behind and we don't give up on them either. Let's hope that that is true. Thank you, Senator Green. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to talk about the agricultural field days that are currently going on in Western Australia. Agricultural field days, particularly as someone who, who grew up in the bush and has been in and around agriculture uh, for a long time, uh, agricultural field days were always a highlight of the calendar. As a, as a young child, particularly, being able to go to the field days to look at the machinery, to, to interact with uh, uh, other farming members of, of farming communities, to, to see the livestock, the sheepdog trials. Uh, it really was a highlight in every calendar year. And obviously, agricultural field days in some parts of Australia continue to do it very, very tough indeed. Luckily, uh, in, uh, in Western Australia, we, do, we have been able to have an agricultural field day season this year, and we've already had uh, a number 
uh, occur in Western Australia and a, and a large number still uh, to come. And one of the key aspects of preserving those field days and enabling them to go forward has been the Morrison government's program supporting agricultural shows and field days. Help has flowed to agricultural field days across Western Australia, things like installing watering points for sheep and cattle and horse yards at the Brunswick Agricultural Society. Uh, we've upgraded the Nansen Showgrounds dining hall kitchen in the Chapman Valley. We've helped to fit out the ram shed uh, for the, with the purchase and installation of portable sheep pens uh, at, for the Esperance and Districts Agricultural Show. Uh, we've supported the Katanning Agricultural Show, the Calabaran and Districts Agricultural Show, Kununurra, Mount Marshall, and the list goes on and on. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Seawatch. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak about income support during lockdown. If we are going to beat this virus, then we have to pay people to stay at home. Lockdowns are hurting people, particularly on low incomes. It is completely ridiculous to tell people on one hand that they have to stay at home and then not offer some additional support to do so. Last year we had the coronavirus supplement and JobKeeper, which changed many people's lives and enabled them to survive through lockdowns. But the government took those supports away far too early and cruelly impacting many people right now. Punishment and punitive measures do not boost morale. They don't create goodwill in the community and they harm people on low incomes the most. And by not providing people on job seeker payment with extra support, they are punishing them. People are not coping with the impact of extended lockdowns and there's no proper financial support. Lifeline saw its three busiest days in history this month. We cannot ignore the financial stress of going into lockdown on individuals and families, particularly those on low incomes, those on job seeker, trying to, support, trying to survive with no extra support. The Prime Minister must take action to ensure that everybody is properly supported. And the best way to do that would be to reinstate the coronavirus supplement. People cannot survive on $44 a day. If you are told to isolate and have to go and get a coronavirus test, how do you afford to take a taxi or an Uber? If you are, an Im if you are immune compromised, how do you get your groceries delivered? If you are on a low income, of course you are going to try and go out and find additional income because the government is not adequately supporting those on low income in lockdown. It's time to make sure everybody can stay Order, safe Senator at home. Seawitt. Senator Polly. There are over 38,000 small businesses in my home state of Tasmania, employing over 91,000 Tasmanians. That's over a third of the Tasmanian workforce. But this government, the Morrison government, have left them in abeyance without any real support with the lockdown in New South Wales and in Victoria, Tasmanians are feeling the pinch. Now, we uh, have small businesses right across tourism, agriculture, manufacturing, arts, construction, transport and healthcare services. And last week, with the shadow uh, minister for uh, small business, Matt Keogh, uh, I was able to visit with our uh, candidate, Ross Hart, the future member for Bass. Uh, a number of small businesses in my home city. And they were talking about how it was only been their experience in business that has kept them afloat. They talked about the issues that they see within the community and the concerns that they have with these shutdowns and the impact it's having on small businesses in my home state. I wanted to thank Jane Freeman at Balls and Bumpers, Malcolm Leadham and Ms Ranson from Leader and Footwear, and Paul Mishus from Route 66, and thank them for being so welcoming and being prepared to talk about the struggles that they're facing. But they are determined to see this pandemic off. They are working together, and we are seeing Tasmanians supporting each other. But it's this government. Why there are so many people in lockdown across this country rests firmly with Scott Morrison. He has failed to provide vaccines in a timely manner. He has failed to deliver quarantine. He had two jobs. 
Two jobs, that's all he had at this time, and he has failed every single Tasmanian, every single Queenslander, every single Victorian, every single Australian that is locked down now is because of Scott Morrison. Order, Senator Polly. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. With the steady downward trend of education standards for reading, maths and science among Australian children over the last 20 years, the Australian Curriculum Assessment and Reporting Authority, ACARA, needed to deliver a curriculum review that reflected proven teaching methods. Rather than provide a robust review, though, that would turn the tide, ideology got the better of ACARA. Fortunately, ACARA's attempts have been bend as deserved. Back when formal motions were allowed, One Nation put forward two successful motions that highlighted significant fundamental flaws in ACARA's reviewed curriculum. Instead of focusing on proven methods for teaching maths and reading, ACARA thought it more important to demolish a Judeo-Christian Judeo -Christian heritage and the role of Western civilization in Australian society, laws and customs. Australia is proudly a liberal democratic society, and these values should be at the very basis of our national curriculum. I acknowledge that Minister Tudge has ditched the reviewed curriculum. He has recognised that ACARA has tried to turn our curriculum into a tool for indoctrination for left-wing ideologies that denounce Western civilization as something to be ashamed of. Instead, promoting notions of imperialism and repackaging negatively significant and defining Australian historical events. There is an urgent need to lift the educational outcomes for our children. One Nation will continue to monitor the, effects of, uh, the efforts of ACARA to ensure that our cherished Western liberal democracy is enshrined in the national curriculum. It's not an accident that Australia is one of the most sought after places to live. Safeguarding our way of life comes from the teachings we give our children whether at home or through the curriculum. That reminds them of what Australian men and women have defended in past decades, our right to a free society with laws and customs of Judeo-Christian origins. And only when our children know that can they defend and uphold those wonderful values. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to join with so many Australians to express my deep distress and heartbreak over the situation in Afghanistan. Over the last 20 years, Australia has been a steadfast contributor to the fight against terrorism in Afghanistan. Australia joined with the United States, NATO and the international community in Afghanistan in 2001 to help find Osama bin Laden and those responsible for the attacks on September 11, uh, and that was achieved. I acknowledge more than 40,000 Australian Defence Force personnel and civilians who served in Afghanistan, and we honour the 41 soldiers who died and the many Australians wounded in attacks. And of course, we also share with all Afghanistan veterans in what they are enduring at the moment. The Taliban must cease all violence against civilians and adhere to international humanitarian law. Our top priority is the safety and orderly departure of Australian citizens and visa holders. Since 18th of August, we have facilitated approximately 554 people to evacuate from Kabul, and I'm very pleased to say two of those people were Maria and her 11-year-old daughter, Ahiria. They are Australian citizens from Melbourne. I became involved in their case uh, when they contacted me, when their hus um, Maria's husband contacted me uh, late one evening last week. They travelled to Kabul to visit their sick mother and grandmother. Um, they became embroiled in the turmoil very quickly. Their commercial flights were cancelled. And uh, soon after contacting me, they received a message from DFAT. They headed to the airport. They couldn't get to the tarmac because of the chaos and the gunshots. But I'm very pleased to say on their second attempt, with the help of wonderful Australian soldiers, they made it to the plane and they're now are uh, in Perth quarantining. I want to thank our ADF personnel Order, most sincerely Senator for everything Henderson, they're Senator doing. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I, like many others, urge the federal government to massively increase the number of humanitarian visas offered to Afghan refugees. Now, last week, Minister Hawke announced an initial 3,000 places, but this will be within the humanitarian program of 13,750 places already allocated for this year. It will not be extra places. And you have to ask the question, what happens to those poor souls who were in that original 13,750 and will now potentially miss out? 
When the world is witnessing a humanitarian crisis, we have a responsibility to act, if on no other basis than compassion for our fellow humans. Our hasty departure from what is widely considered a failed state has allowed the Taliban to return at a speed which has stunned the world. It is not only interpreters and other locally engaged employees who are now terrified for their lives and very much terrified for their future. Women and girls who will remain are facing the prospect of returning to the days of old, a terrifying fate of sexual slavery, oppression and subjugation. A future where they will be denied an education, denied the ability to move freely in society or to have their voices heard. Those who flee must be able to find safe refuge. Canada, for example, has stepped forward and offered to take 20,000 Afghan refugees on top of their humanitarian program, on top of the program. We should very much be doing the same. After 20 years, we cannot simply walk away. In 2015, Australia responded to the civil war in Syria with 12,000 additional humanitarian places for fleeing refugees. That was the right decision and the humane decision. And it is time now for Australia to do the same and contribute more places of safe haven to those in need. Thank you, Senator Griff. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Well, today Australia is experiencing the third wave of this COVID pandemic, and Prime Minister Morrison is saying that he couldn't possibly have seen it coming. That hindsight is a wonderful thing. There's many whys in hindsight, he says, to anyone who's trying to hold him to account. The problem is that when it comes to the COVID crisis, the Prime Minister already had the benefit of 2020 hindsight, because in 2020, we already knew that vaccines were the way out. And in 2020, we already knew to lock down hard and fast. And in 2020, we knew that we need to find financial support for people and give it to them to stay home and stay safe. And even though we knew all of this, all of last year, even though Victorians had to learn these lessons the hard way, even though the lessons were there for all to see, today we have a Prime Minister who says that he couldn't see them. And to his critics, that hindsight is a wonderful thing. But the Prime Minister didn't need a crystal ball. He just needed to pay attention. Pay attention and get the vaccines that we needed. Pay attention and support the states to go hard and go early. Pay attention and provide that critical ongoing financial support that people need. Uh, and instead, today, we are in the middle of this third wave. Today, businesses are shutting their doors. Today, people are out of work. Today, children are missing school again. Australians need a Prime Minister who will actually act. A Prime Minister who doesn't shy away from the hard decisions, who takes responsibility. They need a Prime Minister who will work at, as hard at his job as every single Australian is Order, working. Order, Senator to Walsh. Senator right O'Sullivan. Over 200 Australians have been vaccinated every minute. The agreement that the National Cabinet reached based on the modelling by the Doherty Institute has set out a clear path back from this pandemic. It's been a game changer. It's a compact that we now have with the Australian people. And it can be summed up by the Prime Minister's comments that Australians will be able to spend Christmas with their families should our vaccination thresholds be reached. And as a nation, we are on track to reach them. We have the doses and we have the infrastructure to administer them, and we have Australians coming forward. Our agreement with the Australian people spells out a clear plan, a, a timeline for when we will be able to reopen life after lockdowns and certainty for businesses and those they employ. But as Proverbs says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. We can't have parts of the nation go rogue. Lockdowns into next year in pursuit of eradication was not part of the plan, but some of our premiers are letting down the side. I'm sure my Queensland colleagues will have something to say about their own state, but in Western Australia we have a premier who's addicted to having his finger over the big red button, waiting to press it at any moment and keep pressing it into next year. Lockdowns and border closures are necessary right now, but they are not sustainable, 
and Australians know that, and they're getting tired of them. And this is why that they, they are stepping up at world record rates to get us to 80 and 70 per cent fully vaccinated. Now, we have one of the highest weekly uptake rates of anywhere else in the world. Now, it's clear that the McGowan government lacks the confidences in our ability to deal with the next stages of reopening. The reality is it's not a case of if but when the Delta strain will breach our borders into Western Australia. As our east coast states are showing, it's almost impossible to shut it down. A vaccination rate of 80 per cent means that we can live Order, with the virus Senator like we do with the flu. Senator Patrick. Thank you. It's unbelievable. Today I asked the Senate to support my private member's bill to ban the import of goods produced with slave labour. How could anyone not support a measure to disrupt this abhorrent trade? How could anyone support a measure uh, to stop Australian companies having to compete with cheap imported goods? Now, the, bu the bill fell out of a bipartisan government controlled uh, or by, from a bipartisan recommendation from a government controlled committee. Thankfully, the Senate supported my bill, but the government didn't. The government didn't, and that is unbelievable. The government wants to talk some more. They want to think about things. They want to ponder. This uh, attempt to deal with uh, modern slavery is going into the same basket as ICAC, the same basket as whistleblower protection. All too hard for this government. The government shies away from any measure that involves integrity or decency. We saw this week Afghan security guards. Government makes a call. Their instinct is wrong. They make the wrong call. They did the same thing in relation to banning Australians or making it a criminal offence for Australians to come back to their own country. Of course, they let that pass, and hopefully, we'll never see that again. Again, a, refuse, a, refuse, a refusal to deal with all of the disrespectful uh, things that happened, particularly to, to women in this place, forced to change their mind. The Prime Minister basically is lacking in moral compass. This was not a good uh, day for the government. Order, Senator Patrick. Uh, Senator Ayres, remotely. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, Senator Patrick's right. Words matter, but deeds matter a lot more. Uh, and today, coalition members, Senator Abetz, Senator Fiorivani Wells, and others spoke up about the anti slavery bill. But no, neither them nor their coalition colleagues voted for it. Uh, and similarly, crises reveal character. And that's true of this Prime Minister. In the full public gaze, in the, in the full public gaze of the COVID pandemic crisis, we see a Prime Minister whose real character is revealed. Not since Billy McMahon, the former member for Holt, has a Prime Minister so visibly, so consistently shrunk from national challenges. Not since then has a Prime Minister been so diminished by his failure to grasp the responsibilities of his job that he and the former member for Holt are contenders for the worst Prime Ministers in Australian history. Whether it's on Afghanistan and the failure over years and years, and latterly months and months, all through this year, when it was clear that we had a special responsibility to Afghans who had worked with Australian troops, on vaccines and the absolute failure to secure supply for Australians, on national quarantine and the bungled incapacity to grasp the responsibility that the Prime Minister has under the Constitution to keep Australians safe on bushfires, where once humiliated, uh, not telling the truth about his overseas holiday, he proceeded to bully Australians and journalists, on not implementing the respect at work recommendations. At every juncture, every crisis, Order, this Senator Prime Minister Ayers. just Senator keeps getting smaller. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. It is a terrifying time to be a woman in Afghanistan. 
The Taliban's history of oppression and violence and threats against women make it hard to believe the new government's reassurances that it will respect women's rights to study, work and participate in government. There are clear and immediate risks to the freedom, education, employment, safety, political engagement and bodily autonomy of Afghan women and gender diverse people. The situation is chaotic and I commend all those in government, electorate offices, community and civil society groups who've been working tirelessly since Kabul fell to help those on the ground and their families here. Afghan women who can are standing up and Australia has a moral obligation to support them. The Australian government must offer permanent protection to at least 20,000 Afghanis in addition to Australia's current humanitarian intake. And we must give immediate protection to Afghan uh, citizens currently on temporary protection visas here in Australia. The Australian government must allow women to apply for women at risk protection visas from within Afghanistan, rather than requiring them to risk their lives crossing the border just to apply. We must also facilitate their evacuation. More must be done to protect the millions of people, including women. Gosh, I need you desperately. In Don't know what I've done. Um, Australia must provide immediate and increased aid to support women, girls and gender diverse people, deliver through partnerships with civil society and aid organisations working on the ground. This is essential to ensure that aid is targeted to those most in need. Consistent with Australia's National Action Plan for Women, Peace and Security, Australia must call on the international community to ensure that Afghanistan's women leaders are included in the peace talks and represented in the Afghan National Assembly and public office. This is a crisis decades in the making that Australia has contributed to. We now have an obligation to do everything we can to secure the safety and freedoms of people in Afghanistan. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Abetz. 20 years ago, the Al-Qaeda terrorist organisation being harboured in Afghanistan was putting the finishing touches on its 9-11 hijacking massacre operations. 2,977 people died on that fateful day from nearly 100 different countries of whom 10 were Australians. More than 6,000 were injured, many scarred for life. This barbaric shedding of innocent civilian blood was as brutal as it was brazen. Any self-respecting nation could not allow such a travesty to pass without a strong, definite response. To root out this network of terrorists, military action was regrettably required. With the removal of the Taliban regime came the dismantling of the Al-Qaeda network. The removal of Al-Qaeda's safe haven within Afghanistan and the disruption and dismemberment of this horrific terrorist organisation was much needed. A question to which we will never know the answer is how many other attacks and resultant thousands of deaths and injuries would have occurred but for the blotting out of this truly horrid organisation by military action. As we reflect on the 10 Australians cruelly killed on 11 September, we can be thankful that we had Australians willing to serve and sacrifice, 41 of whom gave the ultimate sacrifice to protect us and other freedom-loving peoples from similar attacks. Those who served in, Af in Afghanistan should be the beneficiaries of our universal admiration for blotting out Al-Qaeda. We are all the beneficiaries. For those who gave so much in the cause for freedom and are battling to come to grips with the events in Afghanistan, remember Open Arms Veterans and Families Counselling is available 24 hours a day on 1800 Senator Lyons. Thank you, Mr President. I rise today to talk about the Morrison government's complete failure on managing the COVID vaccine. The speaking points this week must be deflect from New South Wales at all costs or defend the Premier of New South Wales, whatever it takes. We had Mr Morrison out in the media this morning invoking that Churchill uh, quote, uh, it's always darkest before the dawn. And then we had uh, a government frontbencher out this morning attacking the states that don't have COVID. Uh, rampaging through their state at the moment, threatening those states. So we're already awake to what's going to happen this week. It's, you, think, you think the Morrison government might have learnt 
that attacking states like Western Australia, who have been absolutely clear about the way we have confronted this virus with hard lockdowns and so on, you think they might have learnt when Mr Morrison and the member for PS, Mr Porter, backed in Clive Palmer against all West Australian voters. They backed in Clive Palmer, and when they suddenly realised how unpopular that was, suddenly Mr Morrison changed his mind. Well, attacking Western Australia, threatening the sorts of uh, income that we get from the Commonwealth government, is again going to backfire on you. Mr Morrison had two jobs here. One was hotel quarantine and one was vaccine. He's failed at both. He's absolutely backed in a Premier who's also failed. I wish the people of New South Wales all the, all the best, but with Mr Morrison backing you, I don't like your chances. So lay off WA. We're doing just fine. Our mining sector is working, keeping the country going. So don't come after Western Australia. You've got enough problems Order, of your Order, Senator Lyons. Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Mr President. I'd like to celebrate an outstanding West Australian this afternoon, Dr An Nguyen, practitioner but also the president of the West Australian Vietnamese community. Last week, Dr An, as he's affectionately known, celebrated 40 years in Australia after having arrived in Adelaide in 1901, having fleared the chaos that was falling across Vietnam with the arrival of the communists in South Vietnam. I just want to extend my deepest appreciation for the outstanding leadership that Dr An has shown the Vietnamese community over decades in Western Australia. We applaud him and, of course, we applaud the Vietnamese community in WA Order. for the wonderful Senator contribution Smith. they make. We'll go to questions. Senator Keneally. Uh, yes, Mr President. I'd like to advise the Chamber that Senator Katie Gallagher will be absent from the Senate for the duration of this fortnight for personal reasons. And during this time, Senator Watt will be the acting manager of opposition business in the Senate. Thank you. Before I go to questions without notice, Senator Wish Wilson, can I ask you to remove the banner behind you, pursuant to the orders I've, we've adopted before, that there'll be nothing readable or slogans on banners behind people participating remotely, please? Thank you. Um, questions without notice, Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. On 15 July, the Morrison Joyce government declared that it would not join a United States evacuation mission to rescue Afghan civilians who helped Australia and that it had no plan to mount a similar operation. Why? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, Mr. President. I thank uh, Senator Wong for her question. And can I at the outset acknowledge that the situation in Afghanistan is one that is evolving quite rapidly. It remains highly volatile and is a dangerous situation. Our highest priority as a government is indeed to secure the safe and orderly departure of those Australian citizens still in Afghanistan, their families, uh, Afghan former locally engaged employees, other visa holders, permanent residents, and indeed the assistance that we are providing uh, as a government to uh, the United States, to New Zealand, uh, to the UK, uh, to Fiji and other nations in relation to helping uh, with their foreign nationals, as we acknowledge and thank many other nations are uh, assisting us. Uh, since the 18th of August, Australia uh, has supported uh, the evacuation uh, of around 1,000 people from Afghanistan. Uh, over some 12 flights uh, through our work uh, with the UK and with other nations. We do urge the Taliban to ensure the ability for the safe and orderly departure uh, of people seeking to leave the country. We join international calls for the Taliban to cease all violence against civilians, to adhere to international humanitarian law and to respect all Afghans' human rights, especially those of women and girls. Our work in relation to helping people to depart Afghanistan has been ongoing for some time. Since the 15th of April 2021, uh, the Australian government has brought out more than 430 Afghan locally engaged staff and their families to be resettled in Australia 
under our humanitarian visa policy, an arrangement that's been in place since 2013 and has supported more than 1,900 people to do so during that time, Mr President. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. On the 1st of June, the United King Kingdom announced an acceleration of its relocation policy, offering priority relocation to the UK for Afghans at risk that were or had worked with them. On the 18th of June, Germany expanded its eligibility criteria. However, the Morrison-Joyce government did neither. Why? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, uh, I don't accept the, uh, the insinuation there around a lack of action in relation to uh, the actions and support our government's provided. Uh, Australia, unlike many other countries, has had in place uh, special visa arrangements for some time to support those who have worked alongside uh, our forces and others who have been serving in Afghanistan. That's what's enabled us to see some 1,900 visas specifically provided to Afghan locally engaged staff and their families at risk of harm all the way back to 2013. Recognising what was happening in Afghanistan, uh, we worked hard to make sure that we uh, expedited processing around uh, such applications during the course of this year. Uh, and that's what enabled more than 430 uh, Afghan locally engaged staff uh, to be able to access those visas and be resettled in Australia in the period since 15 April. Clearly, the deteriorating security situation has meant more Order, urgent steps Senator necessary, Birmingham. and that's what Senator we're taking. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Nasir, an interpreter for the ADF, has been resettled in Australia and has family in Afghanistan who fear reprisals. Australian authorities told them to send visa applications by post. Impossible in the chaos of Kabul. They turned to US soldiers who were willing to put them on an evacuation flight, even with limited documents. Why was it left to the US to help those caught up by Australia's bureaucratic gridlock? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, Senator Wong, uh, without some uh, forewarning, it's impossible for me to be able to uh, specifically address the individual case you mentioned. Uh, but I can assure you, uh, the Senate and all Australians, uh, that the Australian officials working on the ground in Afghanistan, officials from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, from the Department of Home Affairs, uh, and of course our Defence Force personnel there, uh, are working uh, quickly uh, to ensure rapid processing uh, of visas that enable the evacuation of people uh, who may be in circumstances where they are immediate family, for example, of Australian citizens, immediate family, uh, permanent residents, or immediate family of uh, those locally engaged staff who have supported Australia. Uh, that work is being supported uh, by Home Affairs and other officials uh, here in Australia, uh, as well as around the world, in terms of enabling uh, us to provide quick, rapid responses. And now, in relation Order, to the individual Senator circumstance. Birmingham, time has expired. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Will the Minister update the Senate on the situation in Afghanistan? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator Smith for his question. Uh, Mr President, the situation in Afghanistan remains dangerous and volatile a week after the Taliban entered the capital of Kabul. We have all been devastated uh, by the return of the Taliban, but we are focused squarely on the challenges ahead of us, ensuring the safe evacuation of Australians uh, holders of Australian visas and in working with the international community to continue supporting the people of Afghanistan. The instability certainly makes our work all the more difficult. Uh, nevertheless, we are working closely and very well with our US, UK, German and other partners at the Hamad Karzai International Airport uh, in one of the most challenging people movements we have undertaken for decades. We're absolutely focused on bringing out every Australian and Australian visa holder that we possibly can. Cooperation does continue to be the key, and we'll continue working closely with our partners for as long as we are able to to get people out. There is discussion, as we have seen, about the prospect of the US extending its withdrawal deadline. We are part of those discussions, and we are absolutely ready to, continue a, uh, to support a continuing operation at Hamad Karzai International Airport. Mr. President, the international community is watching the Taliban 
for its acts of injustice. It must observe all of its obligations to uphold international law and human rights. We call on the Taliban and continue to call on the Taliban to cease all violence against civilians and to adhere to international humanitarian law and the human rights to which all Afghans are entitled, in particular women and girls. This is an immensely difficult situation. It is terrifying and distressing for every person, every family, trying to get to the airport and for everyone worried about family members, friends, colleagues and contacts, and a huge Order. task being Senator undertaken Payne. by Australian Senator personnel. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Will the minister advise the Senate on the progress of our airlift to evacuate Australians, holders of Australian visas and their families from Afghanistan? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. And again, I thank Senator Smith. Uh, since the 18th of August, we have evacuated over 1,000 people on 12 flights, including Australian and New Zealand nationals, Australian visa holders and foreign nationals. In the last 24 hours, we have evacuated over 450 people from Kabul on four ADF flights. We have a significant presence on the ground at Hamad Karzai International Airport, including Defense, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade officers, Australian Defence Force personnel, Department of Home Affairs officials and Australian Border Force members. And I thank every single one of those women and men for the extraordinary job they are doing. We've evacuated not just our own people, but people on behalf of the United Kingdom, the United States, New Zealand, as well as Fiji. Many of you know that talking to my office, the Minister for Defence's office, the Ministers for Home Affairs and Immigration's offices and our consular team, what a task is being undertaken. I thank all colleagues, members and senators uh, for their engagement on behalf Order. of so many Senator Australians Payne. and Afghanis. Senator Smith, for... a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Will the minister update the Senate on Australia's continuing support for the people of Afghanistan? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The Morrison government will maintain our support for the people of Afghanistan through this crisis and beyond in the coming years, working closely with other donors to identify and respond to the most pressing needs. Our $50 million bilateral program uh, will focus on the immediate crisis and increasingly on humanitarian outcomes, including in response to the current drought, to internal displacement, to COVID-19 and to economic stability, all factors exacerbating the humanitarian situation in Afghanistan right now. We're working closely with our long-standing partners, including the World Food Programme, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs and the United Nations Population Fund. We have committed $5 million to the UNHCR supplementary appeal to assist internally displaced Afghans and support those neighbouring countries hosting Afghan refugees. We'll continue to work with the international community to hold the Taliban to account and to support the people of Afghanistan. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Defence, Senator Payne. I refer to reports that the New South Wales Minister for Health, Brad Hazard, wrote to Minister Hunt on August 11 requesting the Australian Defence Force open vaccination centres in Sydney and in the state's west. Now 12 of New South Wales' hardest hit local government areas in western Sydney are facing even tighter restrictions, including curfews, and the state is facing an ever worsening outbreak. Why, almost two weeks later, has the Morrison-Joyce government failed to formally respond to the New South Wales government's request for help in Western Sydney? Minister representing the Minister for Defence, Senator Payne. Thank very much, Mr President, uh, and I thank Senator Kinley for her question. Uh, I don't have a full brief on this matter, but let me provide the information that I do have to uh, the Senate. Uh, as I understand it, um, Mr President, uh, the New South Wales Minister for Health wrote to the Commonwealth Minister for Health, uh, Minister Hunt, on the 11th of August and was responded to by phone on the same day, followed up by phone on the 12th of August with a formal reply set by letter on the 13th of August. Uh, this fact has been acknowledged and confirmed by Mr Hazard on several occasions. Uh, on the 12th of August, at a press conference, Minister Hazard, uh, I am advised, said they responded very quickly, and I think, min thank, think Minister Hunt responded within minutes to say they would see what they could do, try to get onto it, so we've just got to hope everyone's got enough staff, enough vaccine to be able to get up there and do what we need to do. 
The 13th of August, again, Mr Hazard said they have stepped up. Minister Hunt responded quite quickly. I think it was within an hour or two he responded to me and indicated they would have the appropriate committees put in place to get the ADF working with the public health network up there with the Western New South Wales local health district. The Commonwealth responded within 24 hours by commissioning 50 ADF for community support and compliance and also five ADF medical teams of up to 14 members each for Western New South Wales. Uh, in addition, or, or, uh, sorry, Senator Keneally, on a point of order. I do appreciate the uh, minister's um, information. Uh, however, and at this point of order on relevance, the question specifically was about Western Sydney, not Western New South Wales. Um, They're two Senator different places. Senator Keneally, with respect, I think the minister. There was a preamble to the question. That was the point of the interview question. The minister outlined at the beginning that they were providing the information they had available. I, I'm, I would be reluctant to rule what the minister is saying as not in order, given the question. Um, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. Um, as I understand it, there are already 300 ADF on the ground in Western Sydney as part of a joint operation with New South Wales Police. Uh, as at the 22nd of August, across the 12 affected local government areas of concern in Greater Sydney, 777 primary care and Commonwealth sites are administering the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, including 500 general practices, 266 of which are also offering the Pfizer vaccine, seven general practice respiratory clinics, uh, four Aboriginal community controlled health services and 176 community pharmacies. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you. Will the Morrison Joyce government agree to the New South Wales government's request for ADF support to boost vaccination, not the police checks on homes, but vaccination in Western Sydney? Yes or no? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, as I indicated, um, there are a number of, of defence uh, teams and personnel in New South Wales supporting uh, New South Wales requirements. Defence has also deployed five vaccine delivery teams to support New South Wales Health in regional New South Wales. Uh, Defence is supporting New South Wales Health by providing 12 public health support teams to assist with COVID-19 case management. Uh, there are also five vaccine delivery teams to support New South Wales Health in regional New South Wales. There are eight teams operating at the New South Wales Public Health Emergency Operations Centre in St Leonard's. Two teams are operating in facilities in Parramatta. One team is operating in Liverpool. One team is operating at Nepean Hospital. Defence has committed to four further teams to assist New South Wales Health with these activities from tomorrow, the 24th of August. These personnel will be deployed to New South Wales Health Districts as required. Defence has responded to all requests Order. for assistance Senator from Emergency Payne. Management Senator Australia. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Why is the Morrison-Joyce government quick to use the ADF in political ads in the midst of the black summer bushfire season? but not quick to assist the people of South West and Western Sydney to get vaccinated against COVID-19. Senator Payne. There are two things about that, Mr President. The first is that at a point in time in which the Australian Defence Force is not only on the ground in Sydney and New South Wales and other parts of Australia responding to COVID-19 critical needs, the ADF Men and women are also on the ground, Mr President, in Kabul, in Afghanistan, in Al Minhad, supporting the most extraordinary emergency evacuation we have undertaken order. in decades. Senator, and all I'll, I'll take that the point of order, Senator, Senator Payne. Senator Keneally. The question was not about Kabul. The question was not about Afghanistan. It was about the Morrison-Joyce government use of the ADF in political Senator advertising Keneally. and in COVID Senator vaccines. I'm going, I'm going to remind yeah. senators that when they stand to raise a point of order, don't just go straight to restating the question. At least try and have a semblance of the standing orders by mentioning the standing order. Senator Keneally, I've ruled before that when questions are politically loaded, a minister can respond in kind. Your earlier questions were specific, and I think a lot of specific information was provided. There's an opportunity to debate them under question, after question time, but that had loaded language and the minister is in order responding. Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. As I said in my previous response, as at the 22nd of August, across the 12 affected local government areas of concern in Greater Sydney, 
777 primary care and Commonwealth sites are administering the AstraZeneca vaccine, including those 590 general practices, seven general practice respiratory clinics, four Aboriginal community controlled health services and 176 Order. community Senator pharmacies. Payne, time for the answer has expired. Senator Bragg. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the minister update the Senate on how the uh, Liberal and Nationals government's economic plan and the national plan to transition Australia's national COVID-19 response agreed by our national cabinet what? will help to chart our economic recovery from the pandemic? I've asked before for silence during questions, particularly as we have so many people participating remotely. The minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Bragg for the question. And Mr. President, the Morrison government is committed to putting in place those policies that will help employers out there create jobs across our nation. In terms of the beginning of COVID-19, as my colleagues know, we entered COVID-19 with a strong labour market. In fact, around 1.6 million jobs had been created since we were first elected to govern. We also had the lowest welfare dependency in 30 years. Mr President, by providing employers and businesses the economic framework to lever off, they were able to prosper, to grow and do what we needed them to do. And that was, of course, create more job opportunities for Australians. We also know, though, that COVID-19 has changed so much of this. We are still dealing with it, and we are still dealing with the lockdowns that are affecting millions of Australians, both in their jobs and their employers across our country. We also know that the road ahead will be a long road, it will be a hard road and it will be a bumpy road. However, what we have seen is that the Australian Labor Force has demonstrated and continues to demonstrate remarkable resilience. In particular, when we look at the latest figures which show this, unemployment in Australia fell from 4.9 per cent to 4.6 per cent recently, with the creation of 2,200 jobs. And as a government, we've worked with the states and territories, and together we've charted a plan out of this pandemic. And as a government, we continue to provide the support, in particular the economic supports, that will help both businesses and Australians get to the other side. In terms of our economy, we continue to be in a stronger position to recover than what we were a year ago. And we will continue to work with states and territories Order. to Cash. plan our path. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. How is the government supporting businesses and protecting jobs through the current lockdowns and restrictions that are in place to help suppress COVID-19? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, the government has provided unprecedented support as we should to both Australians and Australian businesses since the commencement of the COVID-19 pandemic. We've provided now over $300 billion in direct health and economic support. Much of that support, as we know, was aimed at keeping Australian businesses operating and keeping Australians in jobs. But as the outbreaks that we are currently seeing in Australia, Australia and Australians, we are not out of the woods yet. The Morrison government continues to work with the states and territories to assist their businesses and to support their staff who are impacted by COVID-19. We've expanded Queensland's COVID-19 business support grants to $600 million. We've provided $12.5 million for NT businesses. We've increased support for Victorian businesses to over $800 million. Again, we will continue to provide the support Order, that Australians Senator need. Cash. Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How can each and every Australian do their bit to help us get out of this pandemic and to get Australian business back into business and Australians back to work? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as we know, the best way for each and every one of us to help small businesses in particular 
to ensure our businesses can stay open and to ensure that Australians can get back to work is to get vaccinated. As more and more Australians get vaccinated, what we'll do is we'll rob the virus of its potency and the power to disrupt our lives. And it's really pleasing to see more and more Australians every single day putting their arms out and getting vaccinated. When we look at those vaccination rates, we went from 15 million doses to 16 million Order. doses in five days, and we went from 16 million doses to 17 million doses in an even smaller period of time. That is what each and every one of us needs to do. And certainly on those figures, there are positive signs that Australians are taking up the opportunity and they do see the light at the end of the tunnel. Mr Order, President, Senator each Watt. and every one of us has a role to play, and encouraging Australians to get vaccinated is what Order. we need to do. Senator Watt, count to 10 after your call to order. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr President. Um, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister. But before I ask my question, I just want to acknowledge that the situation outside Kabul, of course, is extremely difficult and fluid. And I'd like to thank uh, Ministers Payne and Hawke for working with Green Senators over the last week to try and get people evacuated. Given the humanitarian crisis facing the people of Afghanistan, the Canadian and the UK governments have announced that they would take an extra 20,000 refugees, whilst Australia is only committed to 3,000 within the existing CAPT program. The Prime Minister says 3,000 is just a floor, not a ceiling. Well, why won't Mr Morrison then do what Mr Abbott did in 2015, match what other countries are doing and give more places to refugees fleeing Afghanistan, making sure that Australia stands by those who stand by us? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator Hanson Young uh, for her question and, uh, and can I thank her for the acknowledgement of those ministers who have been engaging with uh, Green Senators in relation to assisting with the extraction of individuals from Afghanistan. Uh, indeed, can I thank many members of the Senate and, uh, and across the Parliament for engagement with local constituencies on those matters. Uh, and, uh, and particularly, uh, whilst I know ministers are working hard on it, uh, again, thank those many officials working around the clock to do so, especially those officials from various agencies who uh, have been redeployed uh, either to uh, the United Arab Emirates or indeed into Afghanistan to help in these uh, dangerous and challenging circumstances. Uh, Senator Hanson Young, uh, through you, Mr. President, uh, indeed the government does recognise the humanitarian uh, challenges that exist in relation to what is occurring in Afghanistan. Uh, it is why we've made uh, the swift announcement in relation uh, to there being 3,000 places this financial year, in this current financial year's uh, humanitarian intake, uh, to be dedicated uh, to ensuring that Afghan citizens uh, are offered permanent protection in Australia. Since the 1st of July 2013, more than 8,500 visas have been granted uh, to Afghan citizens under Australia's humanitarian visa program. Uh, we remain committed to, uh, to working carefully to give um, priority uh, to persecuted minorities, to women and children, uh, and to those who have links to Australia, such as family members. Uh, we'll work, as always, through the processes to ensure that applicants uh, satisfy public interest criteria for character, security and health, uh, making sure that we do keep the safety and security of Australians as being of paramount importance. And importantly, we'll work with Afghan community leaders in Australia through this process. We'll also work with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees uh, to help to identify those most in need. Order. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Thank you. 4,400 Afghans reside in Australia on temporary visas. Why won't the Prime Minister give them permanent protection? They're here already. Many have been here for many, many years. They can't go back. Why not end their limbo now, allowing them to rebuild their lives without the fear of the Taliban? Where is the Prime Minister's compassion for those who are already here so that they can call Australia home? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, this is indeed a sensitive issue and topic. It is sensitive because we wish to make clear that, obviously, in all of the current circumstances and for the foreseeable future, given the security situation in Afghanistan, uh, nobody is going to be repatriated or expected to return to Afghanistan, given the threats that may exist. However, it's also important in terms of the protection of life uh, and the protection uh, of 
our migration system in a way that enables us to make decisions to prioritise uh, those most in need, most appropriate uh, to be able to come to Australia, uh, that we maintain confidence and order in that migration program. That requires us to make sure that the policy settings we've put in place that have stopped the tragic flow of boats to Australia, a tragic flow of boats that saw so many people lose their lives, that saw people smugglers gain an upper hand and take advantage of vulnerable people, doesn't have any opportunity to restart. And that's why we're keeping in place policies that Order. stopped that. Senator Birmingham, Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Well, the double standard of this government never ceases to amaze. On the same day as trumpeting a new agricultural visa which provides a permanent pathway for agricultural workers, the Prime Minister is refusing to allow people who are already here on Australian soil to stay here permanently, to rebuild their lives. How is this fair? How is this fair to leave these people living in limbo while opening up the door to others? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, what's not fair is to have a circumstance where people smugglers across different parts of Asia take advantage of some of the most vulnerable people. Take advantage by taking their money, take advantage by putting them on rickety boats, dangerous boats, take advantage of putting them in situations of harm's way where they may well find themselves losing their life on a perilous journey to Australia, as many others did before. What wouldn't be fair is if community confidence in our humanitarian program, our migration program, was undermined to the extent we were unable to continue to be one of the most generous countries in the world on a per capita basis when it comes to the resettlement of refugees. What wouldn't be fair is if it was undermined to the extent where we were unable to make the types of decisions we have to put a dedicated number of places in place to support Afghani citizens. That's why it's important that we maintain confidence and settings in those programs so that we can give priority where appropriate by maintaining that community confidence in an orderly Order, system. Senator Birmingham, Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Today, New South Wales recorded 818 new COVID 19 cases. There are now 100 people in the ICU and tragically 74 deaths from the current outbreak. This is the third consecutive day of more than 800 cases in New South Wales, with the highest ever number of daily cases, 830, recorded yesterday. Can the minister confirm that Australia is now experiencing the highest number of daily cases since the beginning of the pandemic more than 18 months ago? Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thanks, Senator McAllister, for the question, Mr. President. And it is true that over the last few days, the number of cases per day in New South Wales has been the highest since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, Mr. President. And we are seeing, and we are seeing, um, the very, very difficult effects, the very, very difficult effects Order. of, of Order. the. Delta variant of the virus, which clearly transmits much more quickly uh, in the community, and we've seen uh, a number of states now struggle with that. We're seeing exactly the same concerns being expressed in Victoria, where there were 70 odd cases today, uh, and Mr. President. So, so clearly, clearly the Delta variant, uh, which the government has been quite open and upfront with the Australian people about is a completely new ball game with respect to the management of COVID-19, Mr President. Uh, we're seeing here in the ACT how quickly the numbers increased uh, once the, the, uh, vaccine, the, the variant uh, arrived in the ACT, Mr President. Uh, and we're seeing the concerns expressed by state leaders all around the country, Mr President. And the New South Wales government working with the Australian government is doing everything that it can to suppress the spread of the virus. Uh, that is our responsibility. That is what we're trying to do, Mr President. Uh, and, and alongside that growth in numbers, we are seeing every single day an increase in the number of Australians who are vaccinated. Uh, we've, we've passed 17 million, people vac uh, 17 million vaccinations administered in this country, Mr President, and that, and that rollout continues Order. to develop in speed as we said it would, Mr President. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thank you. 
Based on current projections, when and at what level will daily cases peak? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Order. Mr. President. Mr. President, as I indicated in my uh, answer to the primary question, the New South Wales government, along with the Commonwealth, is doing everything that they possibly can to suppress the transmission of the virus. Can I say to people in New South Wales, particularly in those LGAs, Oh, sorry, Senator McAllister on a point of order. Point of order is relevance. It was a very specific question about the projections about daily case numbers. Um, the minister has been speaking for 19 seconds. I've allowed you to remind the minister of it. I will listen carefully while he has 41 seconds remaining. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Can I say to all people in New South Wales, particularly those in the LGAs where the virus is spreading? Uh, more rapidly. Please obey the instructions and the conditions imposed of the New South Wales government. Please do that, because the virus moves with people and Order. it transmits Senator, with people. Senator and Colbeck, it's only please when your seat, seat, Senator Colbeck. Senator McAllister on a point of order. My point of order is relevance. The minister has 18 seconds left. He was asked a very specific question about the projections, about the level of daily cases and when they would peak. If he doesn't know the answer, he should take it on notice. Um, I can't instruct the minister how. I, I, I do take the point that the minister has been speaking for over 40 seconds. Um, it was a question specific in nature, and so I take the time to remind the minister of the question because the time for what a more general commentary has passed. Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Because it's only when people stop moving and interacting with each other, that we will see a reduction in the transmission of the virus. Mr President, it's all very well to come in here to ask impossible to answer questions, but the, the virus travels with people and it is people's— Order. And it is the Order. Senator Colbeck, time for the answer has expired. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. Eighteen months into the pandemic, Australia is experiencing the highest daily case numbers, and millions of Australians are in lockdown in New South Wales, in Victoria and in the ACT. Does Mr Morrison regret failing to secure enough vaccines and repeatedly telling Australians that the vaccine rollout is not a race? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, I re completely reject the assertion I completely reject the assertion that the Australian government has not secured enough vaccines. We have, we have, we have procured hun, over 100 million doses of vaccine. Order. Senator Watt. Over 100 million doses of vaccine. We have available and, and will be available Senator McAllister. enough vaccines uh, that will be developed for the possibility of booster shots down the track, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, Order. we will Senator continue Hughes, to do Senator Watt. what we said we would do, which is to continue to increase the Senators supply, Hughes and continue Watt. to increase the opportunity for Australians to take up the vaccine. Mr. President, there are over 8,000 points in this country right now where people can get access to a vaccine, Mr. President. Order. And that's not true, Senator. I will take your interjection. The Victorian Premier even said today that there are open opportunities Order. for vaccines Senator Colbeck, in Victoria today. time for the today. answer has expired. Senator O'Neill. Well, Senator O'Neill, I call, I'm going to insist that when senators are not called by name, they pay some heed to that. We have half the Senate participating remotely. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Minister, the Prime Minister has provided his very clear support for organisations to introduce requirements for mandatory vaccination for their staff. What message does the government have for workers who object to mandatory vaccination? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank, uh, thank Senator Hanson for her question. Um, can, I, uh, can I at the outset emphasise the government has said all along uh, that vaccination is a voluntary program, that we as a government are not mandating it, 
aside from in certain very high risk health areas where it is still not Commonwealth legislation doing so, but where we've worked with states and territories in terms of mandating vaccination, such as in relation to health or aged care workers, for example. It is correct that Australia's workplace relations laws do allow for businesses to put in place um, arrangements that are reasonable in the circumstances for the protection of people that they work alongside of, uh, or indeed customers that they may work with. It is for businesses to make an assessment in relation to that reasonableness test, and some have chosen to do so in relation to the COVID-19 vaccine, as is their rights under, uh, under existing workplace arrangements. We do encourage all Australians to get vaccinated. And in doing so, I want to thank and acknowledge the millions of Australians who've done so to date, driving total vaccinations administered in Australia to in excess of 17.1 million doses to date. And that has ensured that we have now a nearly 53% of all eligible Australians over the age of 16 having had a first dose. Indeed, of the first age cohort to be eligible for the vaccine, the over 70s, we've now seen more than 85% of those over 70s have a first dose and more than 57% of them being fully vaccinated. Of those over 50s, more than 75% of them Order. have had a first dose. Uh, these are very encouraging numbers and I continue to urge Australians to make a booking, to get out there, to do the thing that can best Senator save them, Daniel. their loved ones and their families and their workmates, and that is to get vaccinated. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, should there be a limit on this policy? I reference SPC, which is a cannery in regional Victoria, where the staff do not come in contact with the public in the normal course of their duties. Why would they need to be vaccinated? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, it is a matter for SPC to speak for themselves, although I gather they have highlighted that uh, within a food manufacturing uh, workplace such as theirs, with a production line such as theirs, uh, their staff work in close proximity uh, to one another. Uh, and that indeed there are issues that they've worked through and consulted with their workforce on. It is a matter for them in terms of the engagement and consultation with their workforce and a matter for them in terms of the advice they seek and the analysis they undertake as to whether they meet the reasonableness test uh, that applies in relation to being able to put such a requirement in place. Uh, that's something that Australian businesses had as available to them prior to COVID-19 uh, in terms of such reasonable health decisions being a part of workplace uh, arrangements, and it's something that continues. Obviously, there need to be provisions to enable those who have genuine medical or other reasons not to be vaccinated, and I understand such businesses who are making these decisions are applying those arrangements to. Senator Hanson, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Um, in light of your response to that, uh, Minister, and given the Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Ministers that your strong support for organisations mandating compulsory vaccination in a wide variety of circumstances, will the Prime Minister require Liberal and National Party candidates in the next election to be vaccinated? And will the Prime Minister require disendorsement of members and senators who are not vaccinated? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, Mr. President, as I said at the outset, uh, vaccination is a voluntary program. As I've emphasised in both previous answers, uh, there are provisions within Australia's laws that existed prior to the pandemic that enable businesses to put in place reasonable practices uh, to ensure the health and safety of co-workers, customers and others that people engage with. Now, I make it very clear. I urge every single member of the coalition every single member of the parliament to get vaccinated, just as I do every single Australian. I've done so, my wife's done so, my parents, my family, others have done so, and I encourage all to do so, and I would expect any member of the government to do so and to encourage their constituents to do so in a way that helps to continue to build those numbers, which we've seen grow so remarkably in recent times that we are now vaccinating in the space of a week a city the entire size of Adelaide. Order, Indeed, Senator Birmingham. Even Time has expired. Senator Davey. Thank you. Um, 
My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture and Northern Australia, Senator McKenzie. Minister, following today's announcement about the Australian agricultural visa, can you please inform how our government is supporting our agricultural industry and regional communities through the establishment of this visa? The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture and Northern Australia, Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Senator Davey, for your question. As the regional specialists, the Nationals are extremely proud to be part of a government that unashamedly backs our primary industry. Order. We know that agriculture needs workers. It needs workers now and well into the future. And today, Order. our government has announced further details outlining the establishment of the Australian Agriculture Visa. It's a big win for farmers. It's a big win for rural communities who rely on agriculture and a big win for the state of New South Wales, Senator Davey, and the rice industry. This is one of the biggest structural reforms in the history of our agricultural sector. Farmers have been calling for it, and we as a government have delivered on it. The important new visa will support Australian farmers now and into the future by providing a wider pool of workers to help meet in increasing seasonal workforce demands. The visa will be available to skilled, semi-skilled and unskilled workers right across the agriculture sector, including meat processing, the fishing industry, forestry industry, dairy industry, horticulture. The initial regulatory framework implementing this visa will be in place by the end of September, with full implementation of the demand-driven visa category within three years. The ag visa, over time, will respond to systematic workforce shortages uh, and was a result of the changes to the Working Holiday Maker program developed as part of the UK-Australia Free Trade Agreement. It will also include a pathway to permanent residency, potentially giving the workers who've helped get the crops off to actually settle permanently in regional Australia with us. Importantly, workers under the visas will be covered by the same workplace laws, entitlements and protections of Australian citizens. Order. Absolutely. Regional Order Australia will lead left. our nation's recovery from COVID-19, and this visa will help us have the skilled workforce Order, we Senator need. Senator McKenzie. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. And, uh, Minister, this is not the only uh, uh, example of what we're doing to support our agricultural industries address the current workforce shortages. Can you outline the range of programs we've implemented to do this? Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr President. The new agriculture visa builds on a number of other measures our government has delivered. In September last year, we restarted Pacific Labor Mobility Programs, and since the restart, over 10,000 workers have arrived from the Pacific and Timor-Leste. These Pacific workers have been invaluable to our agricultural sector and will continue to be the mainstay of our overseas agricultural workforce well into the future. We will also be doubling the number of Pacific workers in Australia, with an extra 12,500 uh, people to be recruited by March 2022. We have committed $29.8 million to fund initiatives to improve employment opportunities in the ag sector, including attracting domestic workforce, uh, actually ensuring we've got incentives to help people, particularly young people, move to the regions, and it's great to see over 3,000 have done that. We've also designed and delivered the Agriculture Workers' Code so that workers could cross state borders and get the crops off in time during COVID. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question. Thank you. And Minister, can you please explain what the barriers are that, face, that our farmers and regional communities face in addressing their workforce shortages? Senator McKenzie. Well, yes, I can, Senator Davey. The biggest barrier by, for farmers and regional communities is the Australian Labor Party. They have not Order. met a farm and a farmer and a primary industry that they don't want to shut down tomorrow, whether it is our fantastic fishing industry in partnership with Wish Wilson and the Greens, if it is our magnificent, sustainable hardwood forestry industry, lock it up and leave it. We don't want any jobs out in rural and regional Australia. That's the Australian Labor Party. And I tell you what, talk to the live uh, cattle or sheep trade. Shut it down. Shut it down is the Australian Labor Party. You just want to wrap up our primary industries in red and green tape. You have no understanding of the contribution they make to our local economies, but also our national economy. 
And really, it's, I think, Mr. President, one thing that we do need to raise in the context of the ag visa is the importance of quarantine systems from our state and territory governments. Order, Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. On the 24th of June, as Delta continued to spread through the Bondi cluster, Mr. Morrison said, and I quote. I commend Premier Berichiklian for resisting going into a full lockdown. Does he stand by this statement? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. Well, I think I answered almost an identical question sometime in the previous sitting fortnight. Whether it was from Senator Sheldon or another senator, uh, I'm not sure. But, Mr President, uh, as the Prime Minister himself has made clear and as I told the Chamber at that time, our knowledge, understanding of the Delta variant and how it is that we need to respond to it uh, has only grown, as indeed our knowledge right throughout the COVID-19 pandemic has grown, uh, given the evolving nature of it. Now, this is a once-in-a-century pandemic. The scientific analysis, the evidence, the advice continues to evolve, and we've responded to it and adapted to it as we've gone along. We recognise the fact that uh, for so much of the pandemic, in New South Wales, with one of the best contact tracing systems in the world, was able to effectively respond to small outbreaks and clusters, to be able to effectively drive the testing, undertake the contact tracing and enforce the isolating that kept the people of New South Wales safe during those outbreaks. Tragically, in relation, to this, tragically in relation to this latest outbreak, and we do have the circumstance uh, where, of course, it's been necessary for New South Wales to pursue lockdowns, and regrettably, those lockdowns order. have Senator not been Birmingham, able to I've got to Senator act. Watt on a point of order. Senator Watt. Thanks, Mr President. On relevance, it was a pretty straight question asking whether Minister Birmingham stood uh, and the Prime Minister stood by his earlier statement. We're getting a long dissertation from Senator Birmingham, but we're not getting an Senator answer to that Watt, question. Um, the material Senator Birmingham is outlining is directly relevant. That point of order goes to attempting to instruct me how to a minister, instruct a minister how to answer the question, which I cannot do. The minister is being directly relevant with this material. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. As I said earlier in the answer, these are points the Prime Minister himself has made publicly in response to questions like those that Senator Sheldon has just asked. Uh, tragically, in New South Wales, we do have the circumstance now. Uh, where, of course, the lockdown has been necessary. Order. It's been necessary, very necessary for New South Wales to tighten aspects of that lockdown. And we have made sure the provision, as Senator Payne referenced earlier, of Australian Defence Force personnel to seek to help New South Wales in the enforcement of that lockdown, as we've made such ADF resources available to other states and territories before, whether it be in lockdown enforcement, border enforcement, uh, or indeed testing or other regimes to support Order. them. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. On the 15th of August, after the Bondi cluster had spread throughout the state, Mr Morrison claimed he told Premier Berichiklian to lock down the entire state. Why did Mr Morrison insist that South West and Western Sydney go into a hard lockdown when he previously insisted Bondi, where the Delta outbreak started, remain open. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, we have sought through this uh, pandemic to work as best we can with state and territory governments who have uh, the public health powers and abilities to be able to put in place the restrictions that have so effectively kept uh, Australia safe. Despite the very challenging, very difficult circumstances we know that Australians in lockdown face at present, uh, the tragic circumstances for those who've lost loved ones to COVID-19 uh, be it in the current New South Wales outbreak, last year's Victorian outbreak, or other circumstances in Australia, as a nation, we have still performed far, far better uh, than almost any other developed country around the world in terms of suppressing COVID-19, in terms of saving lives, and in terms of ensuring that our country is as strongly placed, placed for the future as is possible. And we're going to continue to build on that uh, through the rapid escalation we've seen in the vaccine rollout working with the states and territories, with health professionals, our general practitioners, pharmacies, to keep that momentum in vaccination going. Order, Senator Birmingham. Senator Sheldon, a final supplementary question. Well, uh, Minister Morrison has stepped responsibility and apologised to the people of South West and Western Sydney 
who are in a harsh lockdown. As a result of his failure to secure enough vaccine supply and his failure to build purpose built quarantine. Senator Van. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, like Senator Colbeck previously, uh, I reject completely the assertion in relation uh, to vaccine supply. Uh, Australia has contracted Order. some 180 million doses uh, of vaccine for primary supply and many tens of millions of doses now to support booster shots. Uh, of course, as is well known, there have been some challenges in the vaccine supply. And the challenges in terms of early failure to deliver uh, from Europe to Australia of some 3.4 million doses uh, that would have enabled us uh, to move faster earlier had those doses turned up. Challenges in relation to the changes in ATAGI advice related to AstraZeneca that are all too well known. Uh, but what we have managed to do is ensure Australia had fallback options with each of those challenges. Uh, with the contracts we put in place with Pfizer, the contracts we put in place with Moderna. The fact that we're now seeing Australians turn out in such record numbers uh, that indeed we are administering vaccines at a faster rate than many Order, other countries Senator have ever Birmingham, managed to achieve is a testament to our public. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister Senator, outline to the Senate how Australia will take part in the Tokyo Paralympics? Order. Sorry, Senator Hughes. Please, I'm going to ask, I have repeatedly asked for silence during questions. Senator Hughes can start the question again. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister please outline to the Senate how Australia will take part in the Tokyo Paralympics? The Minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, can I thank the Senator for her question and acknowledge her interest? Mr. President, the Tokyo Paralympics begins tomorrow with the holding of the opening ceremony and runs through to the 5th of September. I don't know about other senators, Mr. President, but I am certainly looking forward to watching these Paralympic Games just as many Australians watched and enjoyed the Olympics that occurred just recently and the pride of Australia from a Paralympic perspective will be on show for the world to see. These Paralympics, Mr President, offer another important opportunity for Australians to unite, celebrate the individual efforts of athletes who have overcome some extraordinary odds, Mr President. Uh, Paralympians in particular have done that. Athletes will be representing 163 nations and compete across 22 sports. Just like their Olympic counterparts, this Paralympic team is a source of inspiration to absolutely every one of us. Australia's team in Tokyo will be the largest ever at an overseas Paralympics and the biggest since Sydney in 2000 with 179 athletes. They will compete in 18 sports, including the debut disciplines of para taekwondo and para badminton. The team includes to be soon to be seven-time Paralympians, Danny de Toro and Christy Dawes, as well as 84 athletes making their Olympic Games debut. The success of our athletes, Mr President, depends very much on the team behind the team, and the Australian Institute of Sport must be commended for its leadership assisting sports athletes, uh, particularly in managing the challenges of the pandemic. Can I say to Paralympics Australia, the President Jocko Callaghan, the Chief Executive Officer Lynn Anderson and the Chef de Mission Kate Order, McLaughlin, Senator Colbeck, thank you for your work the answer has expired. The Senator Hughes, a supplementary question? Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how is the Liberal and Nationals government supporting Australia's Paralympic team to get to and perform to their best in Tokyo? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, the Australian government is proud to support our athletes in achieving their Paralympic dreams. In fact, more than 85 per cent of athletes competing in Tokyo have received direct grants through the Australian Institute of Sport. This is in addition to other support for Paralympics Australia and para athletes, including $3.5 million in this year's budget to support Paralympics Australia to fund additional COVID-19 related costs such as charter flights and return quarantine arrangements for athletes and their supportive staff participating in the 2021 uh, Tokyo Paralympic Games. $4.5 million in 2021 
and 21-22 in increased funding direct to 13 Paralympic high-performance sports in national sporting organisations to enhance preparations for Tokyo and beyond, $8 million over three years from 1819 to support the Australian Paralympic Order, team Colbeck. to prepare for these Senator games. Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Why is the Paralympics important to the broader population of the Australian community? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. The Paralympics and our para-athletes, as I've said, are an inspiration to us all, as well as elite athletes in their respective sports. These athletes have some extraordinary tales of hardship that they've overcome to be competing in these games. They are an enormous demonstration of how sport and physical activity can play an important role in our lives and, in some circumstances, Mr. President, give an opportunity that would not exist otherwise. And that's very much the case with the story of some of our para-athletes. They have opportunities that they would not have otherwise had. Mr. President, can I say to all Australians, I hope you enjoy the 2020 Paralympics. Uh, I look forward to watching them and I look forward to cheering on our athletes uh, to do their best, as I know that they're aspiring to do Order. over the next few Senator weeks. Colbeck. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is also to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Yesterday on Insiders, Mr Morrison said that high COVID case numbers shouldn't delay Australia's reopening, and I quote, at some point you need to make that gear change, and that is done at 70 per cent. Is it the Morrison-Joyce government's position that New South Wales, which recorded its worst day on Sunday with 830 new cases, should open up when it hits a rate of 70 per cent vaccination? irrespective of case numbers. The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. And, and what the Prime Minister was doing, Mr President, was reinforcing the work that has been prepared for National Cabinet, which has been agreed to by National Cabinet uh, and supported by the modelling of the Doherty Institute, Mr President. Order. Mr President. Uh, and, and to reinforce that, Mr President, the National Cabinet has requested that additional work to update that Doherty modelling uh, be con commissioned to support the program. And as the, as the Chief, Chief Medical Officer said yesterday, the fundamentals of that modelling don't change. The fundamentals of that modelling don't change. And Mr. President, I think it's dishonest of Labor, as it has been throughout the pandemic, to be frank, to suggest that this, be, that, that, that this question be considered in isolation from all of the other things that we're doing, Mr. President, uh, including the increase in vaccination. We've seen over recent days, Mr. President, we've seen over recent days uh, over a million Australians in the last four days receive a vac vaccination. We've seen day after week, order. day after week, Mr. Watt, President. On a point of order. Thanks, Mr. President. On relevance, we're getting lots of rhetoric from the minister, but we're not getting an answer to the question, which is simply whether it's the government's position that New South Wales should open up when it hits a rate of 70 per cent vaccination, Watt, irrespective going, of case numbers. Again, Senator Watt, I'm going to insist that rather than just take the opportunity to say the answer is not appreciated and then read out the question again particularly when it's only part of the question being read. You contained a number of quotations that refers to a rather comprehensive area of public policy. The minister is directly relevant to that by addressing the issue of vaccination. I can't instruct him how to answer a question, but I don't think anyone would assert that that is not relevant to the modelling that you refer to. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, and of course, the modelling includes a whole range of different measures that support reopening the Australian economy, which is what we all want which is what we all want. We want Australians to be able to move more freely, and there are a number of actions that are being taken by state governments and Commonwealth governments to facilitate that. There's restrictions on movements that are being taken to limit the spread of the virus. 
That's what we're doing. Order. We're increasing and in continuing to increase the pace of the rollout, Mr. President, with records being posted nearly every day for the number of Australians who are turning out to get a vaccine. And we thank every single one of them for doing so, Mr. President. We thank everyone to, for doing so, and we encourage more to continue to do that, Mr. President. We want to see our economy open. We want to see Australians being able to move around, and we'll continue Order. to do everything Senator we can Colbeck. to facilitate Senator that. Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. One of the architects of the Doherty Institute modelling, Professor James McCaw, said last Friday that if New South Wales case numbers weren't reduced, that we'd need, and I quote, stronger social measures and stronger versions of lockdowns rather than weaker. Who is right, Mr Morrison or Professor McCaw? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as I indicated a moment ago, the, pr the Prime Minister was reinforcing the agreement that he has made with state and territory leaders Order. to continue to open the economy, to o start opening the economy at certain points of vaccination rate. And Mr. President, to reinforce that, Order. to reinforce that, Mr. President, the, the National Order Cabinet has asked the Doherty Institute to do some further work. On the modelling, Mr. Senator President, McAllister. but our target, our aim, Mr. President, is to work with the states and territories in a cooperative manner to reinforce the need to get vaccinated, to provide the opportunity for Australians to take up vaccination, and to reduce the tr community transmission of the virus, Order. so that we can reopen both our communities and our economy, which we know is what all Australians want, Mr. Yeah, President, yeah. and that's what we will continue to do. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, Mr President. University of Melbourne epidemiologist Professor Tony Blakely warned this morning, and I quote, if you've got high numbers, your contact tracing will be overwhelmed and you won't have as much of an effect from your vaccination coverage to keep things under control. Who is right, Mr Morrison Order. or Professor Blakely? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, what the government will continue to do is to take the advice of the health professionals who have been Order. guiding us through the process. Mr. President, when we received, Mr. President, the Doherty modelling, we released it to the public so that they could see it. Mr. President, and what I would urge the Australian public to do is to have a look at the Doherty modelling, and we will continue to release the information that allow Australians to be able to make their choices about yep. whether they should be able to talk, call on their state governments to open up their economies, Mr President. And we will continue to work to fight against the virus instead of, as the Labor opposition are doing, a fighting against us, Mr President. There's no Cedric Dublers on that side, Mr President. No Order. Cedric Dublers over there. They're not barracking for the Australian people or trying to Order. assist us to win this race Order. against the virus, Mr President. They're more like the bloke in the back of the pack is trying to touch other athletes Order. over, Mr President. We'll continue to work in the interest of Australian people. Order. 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 Sen Senator McAllister, Senator O'Neill. Order! When I call people's names, I ask them to have some respect for the chair. I appreciate there was some volume in the chamber at that point because of the nature of the interjections and contribution. But I did call people to order on numerous occasions. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Uh, Senator. Keneally. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I move that the Senate take note of answers given by Ministers Payne, Colbeck, Birmingham to questions without notice asked by myself, Senator McAllister, Watt and Sheldon today relating to COVID-19. The Prime Minister was New South Wales Premier Blair Jicklian's biggest cheerleader when she refused to send Bondi into lockdown. And now as we stand here today, the people of Western Sydney, indeed of all of New South Wales, of Victoria, Canberra, Canberra and now even New Zealand are drawn into Mr Morrison's COVID quagmire. Their frustration is palpable. 
We are 18 months into this pandemic. It shouldn't be this way, but the situation in Australia is worse than ever. In Sydney, people have endured eight weeks of lockdown, eight long weeks of isolation from friends and family, eight long weeks of children trying to be schooled at home. For many, it's been eight weeks of heartbreaking loneliness for what? Then we get more bad news every day. And it's no longer just the rising case numbers. There's a death toll now, too, and it stands at 74. And the Prime Minister, in his urging to end the lockdowns, openly admits that death toll will rise. Despite all the sacrifices, despite all the hardship, the numbers keep ratcheting up and up. There doesn't appear to be an end in sight. It is a race to protect as many Australians as possible with the vaccine before this outbreak is totally out of control. But it's a chaotic race, and it's too little, too late from Mr. Morrison. The statistics here will make you cry. One in 250 people in the Blacktown LGA is positive for COVID. One in 125 people in the Cumberland LGA. These are in Western Sydney. These are people who are COVID positive. We've only got 23% of the Australian population fully vaccinated, and priority groups are still waiting. 8% of the Western New South Wales Indigenous community over the age of 16 is fully vaccinated, only 8%. There's no plan to vaccinate the 12 to 15-year-olds. The TGA has approved the Moderna vaccine, but Mr. Morrison was only able to secure 10 million doses for 2021, with the majority not arriving for months. Whose responsibility is vaccination supply? Well, it's the federal government, the Morrison government. It's Mr. Morrison's failure to supply vaccines and his failure to deliver fit-for-purpose quarantine that has resulted in this mess. Mr. Morrison promised that all Australians will be fully vaccinated by October. Fail. He promised that 4 million Australians will be vaccinated by the end of March. Fail. He promised that all quarantine workers, frontline health care workers, aged and disability care staff and residents would be vaccinated by Easter. Fail. He promised 6 million Australians would be vaccinated by 10 May. Fail. Now he's making promises about families gathering around the table for Christmas lunch. Well, maybe he ought to understand that Vinnie's in Western Sydney is reporting that people are coming into their shops to sell their furniture, their dining room tables, for food. These are people that are going to be lucky to have furniture by Christmas. Addison Road, another frontline service, says that 50 percent of their food aid recipients are new to food aid because of jobs lost, loss of livelihoods, mounting debts, reduced hours, and escaping violent households during this COVID lockdown. They say they were providing groceries to two people per week per pen before the pandemic. Now they've reached 8,000. Mr. Morrison has failed to reach every vaccine target he's ever set, and people, particularly in Western Sydney, are being told to get a vaccine. Well, that would be great, except over in the other place, the government's told the member, uh, the, mem the member for Greenway that vaccine hubs in Western Sydney are unnecessary. Well, I've got news for them. Pharmacists in some part of Western Sydney are tearing their hair out because they can't get access to enough vaccine. GPs in Western Sydney are hesitant to give AstraZeneca to young people, hesitant that they will receive the indemnity, hesitant to give that advice. Pharmacists are telling us that they're running through their two-week supply in just two days. This is not a lightning response. This is not agile. This is failure. And it is the people of Western Sydney and the people of Australia that are being left behind by this too little, too late Prime thank Minister. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Your time has expired. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. Uh, there is no doubt, Madam Deputy President, that Australia is in difficult times at the moment. And uh, I, my heart goes out to the communities in Western Sydney and to uh, the broader Sydney community, indeed across all of Australia, where people are subject to lockdowns. And uh, we do hope and pray that uh, we emerge from this crisis as quickly as, as possible, as quickly as we can. I want to make a few points 
in relation to this debate. And the first is the Prime Minister has been absolutely crystal clear that he takes responsibility. He takes responsibility for the current situation and for the early setbacks. And I want to quote from the Prime Minister. I take responsibility for the early setbacks in our vaccination program. I also take responsibility for getting them fixed and that we are now matching world's best rates with more than one million doses. Now, we're actually doing better than that now, Madam Deputy President. We're actually doing better than that. The last figures, the last figures in terms of vaccination rates, and a lot of this has been contributed, contributed to by the GPs, the pharmacists, the clinics in New South Wales, many in those areas which Senator Keneally spoke about. In the last three days, one million doses have been given to Australians of the vaccine. One million doses in the last three days. An extraordinary, an extraordinary figure. And that means now that more than 85 per cent of our over 70s have received one dose of the vaccine. More than 70 per cent of our over 50s have received one dose. And more than 50 per cent of over 16s have received one dose. Extraordinary figures. There has been an extraordinary acceleration in relation to the number of doses which have been given. If we go back historically and have a look at that acceleration, we can see it drawn out in stark relief. One million doses took 45 days. 14 million doses to 13 million doses only took six days. 15, going up from 14 to 15 million doses, took three days. 15 million doses to six, 16 million doses took five days. 16 to 17, three days. So we're essentially we're essentially providing a million doses every three days, which is an extraordinary, an extraordinary effort. And I really do commend all of those health workers, other health professionals who are engaged in that process. And I congratulate all of those Australians who, with the benefit of their own health advice, have made their own determination to come forward and be vaccinated. But not only that, Madam Deputy President, we do have a national plan. We do have a national plan which has four phases, and it is absolutely vital that we stick to that plan. And it's absolutely vital that all of the premiers, all of the state governments, stick together with that plan that was agreed at National Cabinet. That plan that was informed, informed by the best research available to the Australian government from the Doherty Institute and by economic modelling from Treasury. We need to stick with the plan. And it would be extraordinarily disappointing if the rhetoric in this place generates an atmosphere which leads or encourages people to depart from that plan. I was very concerned. I was very concerned bit about some of the rhetoric coming from those opposite in relation to uh, that we must continually look at case numbers. As the Prime Minister has said, once we hit that 70 per cent, once we hit that 80 per cent vaccination rate, our focus has to shift to hospitalisation rates. Our focus has to shift to those hospitalisation rates, not so much those case numbers. If you look at Israel, if you look at Israel, who was out there at the forefront, got its people vaccinated more quickly than any other country on the face of the earth, their current COVID rate of case rate is extremely high. It's extremely high. It's in the thousands every day. In the thousands every day in Israel, notwithstanding the fact that they are out there, got their people vaccinated early. But just as is the case in Israel, as is the case in Australia, once we hit those 70 per cent and 80 per cent vaccination rates, we have to be committed to the national plan that was agreed upon. And that means once we hit those rates, we've got to start opening up. We've got to start opening up. We can't continue indefinitely with these lockdowns. It is just not possible. It is not possible. The toll they are taking on our young people, on older people, um, the mental health toll that is being uh, paid by so many people in our community, the small businesses who are seeing their life's work destroyed. We can't continue with lockdowns that just go on indefinitely in the future. Once we get those 70 per cent and 80 per cent vaccination rates, and we're achieving remarkable, remarkable outcomes at the moment, we've got to start to open up. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Deputy President. Well, Hemingway wrote that bankruptcy happens gradually and then suddenly. The consequence of the Prime Minister's decision that vaccination was not a race have revealed themselves in much the same way. The Prime Minister's plan with COVID, as with everything it seems, appears to always to have been to do as little as possible 
take as little responsibility as possible, and then just hope that everything would work out in the end. Frequent small outbreaks were built into the government's plan. They are a natural consequence of Mr Morrison's refusal to take responsibility and fix the hotel quarantine system. His own budget documents from May this year assumed there would be one lockdown a month. But there was always a risk that these outbreaks could not be contained, especially with the government's failure to acquire enough vaccines to meet any of the numerous vaccination timelines it devised and then discarded over the last 12 months. The Prime Minister was gambling with other people's lives and with other people's livelihoods. And it's individuals and families across New South Wales and the country who are paying the price. And as the case numbers in New South Wales climb gradually and then suddenly, just as Henningway told us it might happen, then the consequences have become stark. Back in June, the Prime Minister congratulated Premier Berejiklian for not going into a full lockdown. And here we are in August, with the third day in a row of case numbers over 800 in New South Wales. And these numbers are the highest that we have seen since the pandemic began. And yet the government was unable to tell us in question time today when it expects they will peak. A good government would be honest with the Australian public about where we are and where we are heading. It would own up to its mistakes. It would lay out the sacrifices it is asking the Australian public to accept, and it would explain what the plan out of here really is. Well, it seems that is too difficult a task for this Prime Minister, who always wanted the job but never wanted the work. The reporting over the weekend that the Doherty modelling was based on low caseloads and may not support opening up at 70 per cent was sadly not news. The Prime Minister's approach has always been to assume good luck and low caseloads. The Prime Minister's plan has always been to just hope that everything goes right. We heard from the Doherty Institute's professor, James McCaw, that if New South Wales cast numbers weren't reduced that we'd need, and I quote from him, stronger social measures and stronger versions of lockdowns rather than weaker. We've heard from epidemiologist Professor Blakely, and I quote again, that if you've got high numbers, your contact tracing will be overwhelmed and you won't have as much of an effect from your vaccination coverage to keep things under control. And I read the Doherty advice. I read the Doherty advice, and I'd be surprised, I wonder sometimes whether Senator Colbeck has. It's very clear that all of those thresholds are absolutely dependent on having an effective contact trace and isolate strategy sitting behind it. Meanwhile, no interest to the Prime Minister, apparently. He was on insiders insisting that New South Wales should open up at 70 per cent as per the Doherty modelling. No nuance, no reflection on the gravity of the situation, no reflection on the risks he is asking Australians to take on. Just stubborn pride, ego and it's characteristic of his entire approach to leadership. This weekend, more than 200 children aged nine and under were diagnosed with COVID-19 in New South Wales. And that's chilling news for parents who look at their precious little people and they worry if the months of homeschooling may not, in fact, be the worst thing that their kids have to face. And what makes that particularly confronting is that the overwhelming majority of children are not eligible for vaccines. Will children be amongst the 70 per cent vaccinated? Well, we don't know. The Australian public actually deserves some answers Thank from you, this gutless on Prime Minister. Side. Senator Barron. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And I rise to, to respond to Senator McAllister and Senator Keneally because they've just got it plain wrong. They've got it wrong. They were so silent last year when Victoria was in lockdown. We did not hear a peep out of them. 
There was not one peep about how badly managed the pandemic was being uh, run in Victoria. Senator McAllister was quoting, just quoting Professor Blakely, just right now, and Order. quoting Professor Blakely, and he was the one who was calling for better, Order. better uh, contact tracing in Victoria last year. Now Victoria's gone over 200 days of lockdown. So when you're banging on about the people in southwest and Sydney, think about the people in Victoria. Think about the people in Melbourne who have done it so much tougher than your patch. Now I have full empathy and sympathy for the people in southwestern Sydney. And the government has been doing an exceptional job at getting the vaccine out to protect those people. Now, Madam Deputy President, I was flicking through some materials over the weekend and I pulled out a um, media report from 5th of November 2020. It said it was talking about how the government had just completed its fourth order for a total of 135 million vaccines for Australians and for our Pacific neighbours. 135. Now that's more than four times, five times the population of Australia. Now, if we look at the figures of what vaccine supply we have agreements for, there's 255 million doses ordered or under contract, plus another 25 million, over $25 million, for the COVAX facility. There is going to be more than enough to go around. There is more than enough now. When I was listening to uh, you know, um, Premier Andrews yesterday in his daily little press conference, that just chills Victorians to the bone every time they hear him stand up, hear him speak about, oh no, we've got to go harder, got to go harder. But even he was saying yesterday that even in the state-run facilities there was over 70,000 vaccine appointments available for Victorians to go and get. And there would be even more in the Commonwealth-run ones, probably two-thirds that again. So there is ample work being done to protect Australians and protect Victorians. Now, when it comes to Premier Andrews, is he a man of his word or not? This is the question that all Australians, and particularly Victorians, have to ask. He went to National Cabinet. He sat down with his colleagues, or the Premiers, and they agreed the national plan. And that plan was the phase A, current phase, where we accelerate vaccination rates, where we do have lockdowns. But now he's stepping back from what, might, what he agreed to with phase B. He's going, oh, maybe not, maybe not once we hit to 70 per cent. Maybe not, maybe not if we, you know, when we get to 80 per cent. Does this man not keep his word? Is that all his word's worth? Same with Premier McGowan. Are they just going to back away from their word? These are people who the, that uh, Australians voted in, put, a, put their trust in. And now they're backing away from their agreements with the National Cabinet. This is not an election promise that you can back away from when it, you don't feel like it. This is an agreement with the National Cabinet. How dare these people not accept that agreement and work towards its um, delivery? It's ludicrous. The Premier Andrews can stand there for, you know, every day and go, well, you've been bad little children, bad little children. Thank you. Uh, just uh, resume your seat, Senator Van. Senator Burkett. Bit of order, um, Madam Deputy President. I bring to the attention um, uh, Standing Order 193, where it says that you cannot make an imputation on or a personal reflection on people from other parliaments and other jurisdictions. And I would bring that to order on the member. Um, thank you, uh, Senator Urquhart. I, I must say I was listening, but I didn't hear any breach of that order. But Senator Van, I know you're a reasonable person, and if you think you transgress, thank you. And the people of Victoria are having their say about Daniel Andrews, Mr Andrews, the Premier of Victoria, every single day. There are people who are just sick of lockdown. And by sick, I mean mentally health unwell. You say the word lockdown, and Victorians just recoil. Their bodies just jump at it. People are sick of being locked out. They need hope. And where's this hope going to come from? Well, it's coming from the vaccine rollout. 
the amount of vaccine that is available for people right now, that people must go out and get. There's hope in the national plan, 70 per cent, then 80 per cent, and then life gets back to some semblance of normal. That's what Victorians want to hear. And Daniel Andrews better back up his, his agreement Senator in national Dan, cabinet. Um, you, need, you do need to refer to Premier Biden. Andrews, thank, thank you. you, Madam Deputy President, must stick with his promise to national cabinet. If he backs away from it, the people of Victoria should judge him incredibly harshly. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Van. Um, Senator Sheldon. Thank you, Deputy President. I would take note um, of the answers given by Senator Birmingham, uh, Payne, uh, and I just want to make this really, this really clear point. We've just heard from Senator Van that there's more than enough now regarding vaccines. But that is simply not true. What I suggest to the uh, government and their bench, uh, cross benches, you know, have a look at those sort of statements where clearly the government has said that they have not got vaccines going to those critical areas that we need. Now, I'll give an example. You know, a pregnant woman in Sydney struggling to find visor shots in an article on the um, 23rd of August in Sydney Morning Herald, a Ms. Top. She's a pregnant woman in Sydney and is struggling to access the COVID-19 vaccine, despite emerging evidence they can experience severe disease. If they contract the virus and rising numbers of cases in the demographic, Mr. Ms. Top said, I'm going through the public system. I don't have an obstetrician. It's like a secret handshake situation. It's become about who you know. Well, the Royal Australian College of GPs and the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists have urged practitioners and governments to prioritise pregnant women. And of course, we've had comments from uh, Francis Forest uh, obstetrician, Dr. Talat Uppel, who said, I don't know if the finite nature of pregnancy is being appreciated these women are going to deliver, with, and some may deliver early. They need to receive the vaccine in a timely way. But quite clearly, we've seen um, now 39 women uh, that have been pregnant that have actually uh, contracted uh, COVID-19. And this is a particular dis 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 disturbing outcome for the government's lack of action. Of course, then we, you know, we move to the aged care facilities. You know, we know, you know, we've got uh, aged care where no one's actually turning around and getting uh, the degree of vaccinations they need. It's not enough there. Listen to them. And they're saying that there is not enough. Jared Hayes, Secretary of the Health Services Union, said many workers in the sector who wanted to get vaccinated hadn't been able to do so. He said people had made appointments and had to cancel them to go to work. He said he was receiving calls from those in the sector looking for assistance to get vaccinated, including from workers on the Central Coast and in Dubbo, and was concerned about the pressure on workers. We are seeing people leaving the industry, and that worries me due to the workforce that requirement now and in the future, Mr Hayes said. But quite clearly, the government's failed in pregnant women. It's failed for the aged care sector. It's failed now, of course, the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Just over a quarter of Australians in the NDIS are fully vaccinated, behind the national average. And yet this was a priority group of the highest priority by the government. They have failed time in and time out. They put people at risk because of their own incompetence. Yeah. As Australia battles its most serious outbreak, of course, of COVID-19 to date, just 26.9 per cent of the 267,526 NDIS participants aged over 16 who are in phase 1A and 1B of the vaccine rollout were fully vaccinated. Now, this is just a horrific statistics. And Kavanaugh, you know, don't, don't take it from me. Anne Kavanagh, a professor of disability health and epidemiologist uh, at Melbourne University, said the vaccine rollout 
to disable the Australians was negligent and a failure. And the consequences could be dire and with amid a surging Delta outbreak. Now, this is clearly the government's failure to turn around and take all the appropriate steps they have. And, and let's just look at the track record. You know, Mr Morrison says he doesn't hold a hose. Mr Morrison says the vaccine rollout isn't a race. Mr Morrison says New South Wales didn't need to go into lockdown. And Mr Morrison is a Prime Minister in name only, because he certainly hasn't fulfilled the duties of Prime Minister throughout this pandemic. And his continuing failure is putting everyone at risk. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Um, so the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Keneally to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Seward. Question that, uh, the answer to the question that Senator Hanson Young asked and then would throw to Senator McKim to make some comments. So that um, Senator Hanson Young asked the question of which minister? Oh, sorry, to uh, Senator Cash representing the Prime Minister. Thank you. Senator Birmingham, I beg your pardon. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Senator McKim. President, uh, as Senator Young, Hanson Young said at the start of her question, the Australian Greens do absolutely recognise the situation outside the Kabul airport is extremely difficult and fluid and at times extremely dangerous. And we would like to thank both Minister Payne and Minister Hawke for their engagement with both Senator Rice and myself over recent days. And we also want to thank uh, officers from DFAT, from Home Affairs, from the Australian Border Force and Australian Defence Force personnel for their ongoing efforts in providing advice, uh, in processing visas and uh, in evacuating people from Afghanistan under what are extremely trying conditions, to say the least. The situation in Afghanistan, with the Taliban in control of much of the country and with local forces in other parts of the country preparing armed resistance to the Taliban is heartbreaking and terrifying. It will undoubtedly result in countless more lives lost, along with the kind of brutality against women, uh, against girls, uh, against ethnic and religious minorities that we witnessed so horrifyingly when the Taliban were last in power. And we in Australia and the government of Australia cannot absolve ourselves from culpability for what is happening. We helped bring about the current situation Sorry. by being part of a colonialist invasion, and we have a moral obligation to respond accordingly. And that means by responding strongly and decisively. We should immediately announce that Australia will accept 20,000 refugees from Sorry. Afghanistan in addition to our annual existing humanitarian intake. This would allow us to provide protection to far more people, people like women and girls, people like LGBTIQ plus people, people like human rights advocates, journalists and artists who've been critical of the Taliban in the past, more people who supported Australian Defence and Australia Consular personnel, and people from ethnic, religious and cultural minorities who've previously been persecuted by the Taliban, like, for example, Hazara people. Prime Minister Morrison's current offer of 3,000 places, which I note is not in addition to our existing humanitarian intake, is grossly inadequate. He's since said it's a flaw not a ceiling. Well, if we've got a higher target, he should announce it so more people know that they can apply for these humanitarian visas and ultimately freedom and safety in Australia. Both the United Kingdom and Canada have offered to take 20,000 refugees from Afghanistan, which just shows the pittance that Australia is currently offering to take. There is absolutely no reason why Australia should not match those offers and take 20,000 refugees 
from Afghanistan. The government should also announce that everyone from Afghanistan who's currently in Australia on a temporary visa should receive permanent protection and be put on a pathway to Australian citizenship. And we should immediately release people from Afghanistan who are currently in immigration detention in Australia because they arrived here by boat to claim asylum. And while we're at it, we should also return to Australia those who are exiled offshore in Papua New Guinea or Nauru. Those people have been in detention for more than eight years, and most of them sought our protection after fleeing Taliban brutality last time the Taliban was in power. And while we're doing it, we should release that entire cohort of people. We know what happened last time the Taliban seized power. It was a calamity for human rights, for religious, ethnic and cultural minorities, for women and girls. It was absolutely brutal, horrendous and tragically, history looks set to repeat. We cannot stand by and do less than our share. Other countries are doing more and so should we. The government needs to step up. We can do better and we must. The question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary no, the ayes have it. I understand we're going to proceed with housekeeping matters before we go to the next substantive matter. So I will go to any notices of motion to be given for another day. There being none, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Leave is granted. Senator Urquhart. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators. Senators Wong, Katie Gallagher, Shikoni, Kitching, Billick, Alex Gallagher, Sheldon, Ayres, Dodson, McCarthy, Mariel Smith, Chisholm, Stirl, Walsh, Farrell and Green for the 23rd to the 26th of August for personal reasons. question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Dean Smith. Mr President. Thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators also. Leave is granted. Senator Smith. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators from the 23rd to the 26th of August 2021. Senators Antic, Birmingham, Fawcett, Griffin, McLaughlin for personal reasons. Senators Abetz, Dunham, Ferravanti, Wells, Hanson, Henderson, Lambie, Macdonald, McGrath and Roberts for state COVID-19 travel restrictions and Senator Molan for medical reasons. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to move a motion uh, relating to leave of absence. Leave is granted. Senator Seward. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators. Senators Waters, Rice, Thorpe, Wish, Wilson, McKim, Steele, John and Faruqi for the 23rd to the 26th of August for COVID-related reasons. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. That's all. I'll call for the clerk to notify postponements and extensions. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. Business of the Senate number one for today to the 30th of August. General business notice of motion 1216 for today to the 30th of August. General business notice of motion 1220 for today to the 25th of August. And committees have lodged extension notifications as indicated at item 11 on today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on your proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I'll now proceed to the discovery of formal business, and I'll commence with matter number 1217, Senator Seward. Appropriate in placing a business to withdraw a notice of motion? Yes. Okay. Yes, it is, Senator Seward. I withdraw general business notice of motion number 1218, standing in the name of Senator Waters. I'll take it there's no objection to that. So I'll now go to... Motion number 1217 in the name of Senator Rice. Senator Seward, are you in a position to move that for Senator Rice? Yes. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1217 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Patrick or Senator Rustin. 
Do the, uh, do the government uh, oppose that motion? Thank you, Senator um, Rustin. Senator Patrick, number 1219. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1219 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Patrick. Um, I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Rustin. But I have it noted that the government opposed that motion. So noted. That concludes, to my knowledge, the discovery of formal business. We'll now move to the motion to be dealt with, moved by Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to recent events in Afghanistan. Leave is granted. Senator Payne. I move that the Senate A notes with great concern the urgent and dangerous, urgent and dangerous situation in Afghanistan and the uncertainty ahead for the Afghan people. Acknowledges the role of Australia's service men and women during the last 20 years within the coalition forces, working with our allies and others in the cause of fighting terrorism, promoting freedom and seeking to support the people of Afghanistan. Honours the sacrifice of the 41 Australians who have died in Afghanistan in the service of their country and acknowledges the terrible loss suffered by their families. Recognises the service of the more than 39,000 Australian Defence Force men and women who served their country in this, our longest war, and the sacrifice of their families in supporting their service. Acknowledges the work of thousands of diplomats, aid workers, members of the Australian Federal Police and other government officials who have contributed to our efforts. Recognises the sacrifice of our coalition partners and our allies who have seen their service men and women give their lives for the work they undertook in Afghanistan. Recognises the sacrifice of the people of Afghanistan, particularly those who have died in war or in conflict acknowledges and expresses gratitude for the important ongoing role of, of ex-service organisations in supporting veterans and their families, commits to the continued work in providing support to all current and former service personnel and their families and to those who work to serve Australia's interests at home or abroad, acknowledges and commends the ongoing work and dedication to duty of those Australian personnel and officials who are providing and have provided assistance and support to those in Afghanistan in an extremely dangerous situation. Notes the government is continuing to take urgent action to evacuate from Afghanistan Australians, Afghan visa holders and others, along with their families, in cooperation with other coalition partners in extreme conditions. Notes more than 8,500 Afghans have been resettled in Australia since 2013, including more than 1,900 locally engaged and staff and their families. Notes the government's work since April to bring up more than 430 locally engaged employees and their families to be resettled in Australia, and that this number is increasing as further evacuations are now undertaken. Notes the government is committed to providing at least 3,000 places for Afghan resettlement in 2021-22, with further commitments to increase the, intake, increase the intake in following years, and calls on any future government of Afghanistan to respect the human rights of all its citizens especially women and girls, and for the international community to hold any future Afghan government to account. Senator Payne. Mr President, next month we will mark and commemorate the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attacks on the United States. Those attacks and their aftermath changed global security and politics. Through our collective efforts as part of a coalition of nations, we helped to protect the world from repeats of those atrocities and blunted the attacks of al-Qaeda terrorists who had established bases in Afghanistan to train and to plot. The disappointment and pain felt by so many at the return of the Taliban to power in Afghanistan after these 20 difficult years is absolutely understandable, not least for the Afghani people and among those who have sacrificed so much to try to improve the lives of Afghans. I acknowledge the more than 40,000 Australian defence personnel and civilians who served in Afghanistan, honour the 41 soldiers who made the ultimate sacrifice, and the many Australians wounded in attacks who continue to feel the effects of their service both mentally and physically. Right now, 
There is no immediate answer or, or evaluation that will change this disappointment. There will be time for reflection and to incorporate all of the successes and the failures into our understanding of how the world should deal with states that harbour terrorists and regimes that brutalise their own people. For the moment, however, we are dealing with what has happened and looking beyond that disappointment because we have ongoing work ahead of us. Our immediate mission is to rescue Australians, Australian visa holders and their families and vulnerable Afghans. They include Afghans who are at risk of harm due to their work for Australia. That is our focus. We are making progress, but it is difficult and complex, as all of the countries involved in the same operation are finding. Since the 18th of August, we have brought more than 1,000 people out of Kabul so far, and we will continue this mission as long as we are able. We are working with all of our partners in country, here from Canberra, and in relevant posts in close cooperation. That consultation and cooperation is vital to the ongoing evacuation efforts. Conditions near the airport in Kabul are very dangerous and changing rapidly. The well-being of the Afghan people is also a priority. The Afghan people have suffered through 40 years of conflict. It is devastating to see and hear of the situation there now. I fear for Afghan women and girls, their rights to education, work and freedom of movement. I fear for the many women I have met over the years of my visits to their country. As for all Afghan people, women and girls deserve to live in safety, security and dignity. Any form of discrimination and abuse should be prevented and their voices must continue to be heard. Australia will continue to support the Afghan people through our development program, working with trusted international partners. We are focusing our $50 million bilateral program on humanitarian priorities, those occurring as a result of these events, but also including in response to the drought, internal displacement, COVID-19 and economic instability working through existing humanitarian partners, including UN agencies. We have committed to bringing an initial 3,000 Afghans under our humanitarian program to Australia. We work closely with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and will provide support to UNHCR's efforts to manage internal and external refugee movements. Australia will support international efforts to maintain pressure on the Taliban and on any future Afghan administration, to meet its responsibilities to its people, its region and the wider world. The United Nations Security Council's call for an immediate end to the violence against civilians, the restoration of security, civil and constitutional order and urgent talks to resolve the crisis and to arrive at a peaceful settlement is endorsed by Australia. I understand, Mr President, why a return of the Taliban, especially so quickly, suggests that the achievements of the last years, enabled by the hard work and sacrifice of so many Afghanis and the many Australians and international partners who have contributed so much, will be undone. As we look at this now, many Afghan people have received years of experience of improved education, of health care, of women's rights. School enrolments have increased tenfold since 2002, and access to health care rose from 9 per cent to 57 per cent between 2002 and 2020. The maternal mortality rate has fallen from 1,100 deaths to 396 deaths per 100,000 live births between, 20, between 2000 and 2015. Women's representation in politics increased from zero in 2001 to 27 per cent in 2020. There is great anxiety that our commitment to Afghanistan has been in vain. I know that from many of my own friends who have served and worked in Afghanistan both military and civilian, including colleagues here in this parliament. 
to ensure it is not in vain. We will look for every opportunity to sustain the benefits to the Afghan people that the international presence has brought. We must not lose sight of the fact that many Afghans have seen what a better alternative looks like. One thing of which I am certain, Mr President, is that our ADF personnel and veterans, our diplomats and other civilians who have also served, must know that their efforts have not been in vain. Australians did the job that we as a nation asked of them and they served overwhelmingly with great distinction. Nothing will change that. We must also consider how we combat terrorism from here. Our international networks of cooperation are now more synchronised and networked than ever before. Australia's major concerns today and for much of the past two decades have been with our immediate region, Southeast Asia, where violent extremism has taken hold before in pockets of Indonesia, the Philippines and Malaysia. We have worked with those countries to fight and disempower those violent extremists. We thank those countries for their ongoing efforts on this and recommit ourselves to that task. There is a real risk of which we are acutely cognisant that if terrorist bases are once again established in Afghanistan, this will morally energise and materially support terrorists closer to our shores. Finally, we are clear in relation to the Taliban. The extreme ideology they have long projected has blighted lives and produced conflict. The world is watching now to see how they will behave. They say they want the trust of the international community. With a request for trust comes an expectation that that trust will be earned. That should start with ending all violence against civilians, ensuring the participation of different political actors in Afghanistan, upholding human rights, particularly the rights of women and minorities, allowing journalists to report freely and opposing violent extremists. We make no premature commitments to engage with an Afghan administration that is Taliban-led. Any new Afghan administration will be judged on its conduct. The international community will continue these discussions. We are also very clear that the Taliban has seized power by force, not through the support of the Afghan people. Mr. President, the links between our two peoples began in the 1860s, and Afghan cameleers helped develop our remote inland regions. They have so strengthened in the decades since. In recent years, with further immigration, including under Australia's humanitarian program, Afghan Australians will continue to make a rich contribution to our society here. A stable Afghanistan that prevents violent extremism would contribute to security in Central and South Asia and inhibit terrorism further afield, including in our region. I'm told by my post in the UAE and by the ADF that the first person literally off the first Australian plane from Kabul a few days ago was a little Afghani boy and that he skipped down the ramp when it was lowered. It was a compelling and important sign for those seeking to help and those working on this evacuation. I know the desperation and fear that is all pervasive right now. I know it is difficult beyond our imaginings for so many brave and proud people in Afghanistan right now. And for many here, who grieve for the country and the people they love, perhaps as their birthplace, or perhaps for other connections. It is very difficult right now. Australia and our partners, governments, non-government, humanitarian, academics, countless others, all have an enduring commitment to the people of Afghanistan that will not change. Yeah. 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 Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Over the last two weeks, Australians have watched in horror as the Taliban's offensive escalated into a rapid takeover of Afghanistan's regions and eventually its capital. And within days, provinces and cities fell one after another. Afghanistan's civilian government, security forces and institutions crumpled. It is with a heavy heart that we face the tragic reality that despite 20 years of international military intervention and development assistance, despite thousands of lives lost, the international community has fallen far short of its goals and all Afghanistan's gains are imperiled. These events have been heartbreaking for the people of Afghanistan, for the Afghan Australian community, for our veterans, our diplomats, our development workers, for the loved ones of the 41 Australian soldiers who lost their lives in battle and the hundreds more who died after the war as a result of its traumas. And for all the, those in Australia and around the world who hope for a better life for the people of Afghanistan. I have spoken with Afghan Australians and I've seen their pain and their fear. I've spoken with Afghan women in Australia, trailblazers, community leaders and patriots, all deeply proud of their heritage, often lost for words as they witness the return of a regime whose brutal repression of women we know too well. In conflict in, and in peace in our region and beyond, Australia has been prepared to step up, to play our part. Australians understand the power of cooperation with allied and aligned nations, with partners on the ground, with local communities, organisations and activists. And Australia's security is best served wherever we are, when we are trusted as a nation that helps those who help us. And that trust is built in actions, not words. Like many others, including so many veterans, I fear the Morrison government's failure to act has now tarnished that reputation. It has not only fallen short ethically, it has harmed our national interest. On the 13th of April, the United States announced that it would fully withdraw its troops by the 11th of September. And on the 15th of April, Mr Morrison announced the withdrawal of Australian troops by September 2021. It was subsequently reported that the last Australian troops departed on the 18th of June. On the 25th of May, the government announced the closure of the Australian Embassy, citing security concerns. It is true that the speed of the Taliban advance was insufficiently anticipated, but it is also clear that this government had time to prepare and act. For months now, many, including veterans of the ADF, former prime ministers and the opposition, have been calling for urgent action to get those Afghans and their families to safety. I and so many colleagues have been inundated with requests for assistance from veterans, Afghan Australians, development workers and diplomats. And for so many, the fear those who helped Australia and who worked to build a better Afghanistan would be left behind to face the wrath of a vengeful Taliban exacerbated the trauma they were already suffering. Government ministers gave assurances help was on the way. But at the same time, Australians heard report after report of Afghans caught up in bureaucratic gridlock. Security guards at the Australian Embassy told they wouldn't be eligible for humanitarian read visas before being told they could apply. In recent days, 100 such applications have been rejected. The security guards informed by a template letter before the advice changed yet again. Afghans who implemented Australia's development projects told they were ineligible to apply because they were employed as contractors. But of course, to the Taliban, these are simply people who helped us. The United Kingdom announced an acceleration of its relocation policy, offering priority relocation to the United Kingdom for Afghans at risk that were or had worked for them. In June, Germany expanded its eligibility criteria, but our government did neither. In July, the previously announced US airlift evacuation of interpreters and their families began. This government told us Australia wouldn't join the airlift and that it had no plan to mount a similar operation, and that was on July 15th. So here we are a month later, with our ADF and government personnel being called on to do precisely that in far more perilous circumstances. Now I say to the members of the ADF and to all the public servants, and I particularly mention those from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, who are working to evacuate Australians and those who helped us. I say thank you. Thank you for your courage. 
Thank you for your commitment and thank you for your service. And we hope and pray this operation will be successful. I also hope after it has concluded that this Prime Minister will take the time to ask himself whether he should have heeded warnings and calls. See, Mr Morrison now deflects to the wisdom of hindsight. Instead, he should understand the consequences of willful blindness. Our mission in Afghanistan commenced in the aftermath of the terrible events of 9-11 and it achieved its initial objectives. But we sought to do more. With many brave Afghan men and women, thousands of whom died in the fight, we sought to build a better life for the people of Afghanistan and gains were made. The return of millions from refugee camps in neighbouring countries, girls in school, women participating in civil society and politics and the professions. And that these gains have not been secured is tragic. But that does not mean they were not worth striving for, because they are always worth striving for. In time to come, we will have to grapple with what we have learned from this, about the limits of military intervention and of foreign back state building. This mission did not end the way we wanted or hoped, and we should face that reality squarely. These are issues which demand responsible and sober engagement, and all who served and all who will be called on in the future to serve are entitled to that honest appraisal. We do not know yet what shape the next government of Afghanistan will take. We do know that the Taliban inherits a changed Afghanistan, where two thirds of the population are under 25, most of whom have no memory of its brutal rule. Where democracy, women's rights, a burgeoning media and civil society, however limited, were facts on the ground. And where citizens are already resisting its return, fearful for their futures and unwilling to set the clock back. We know too that Australia and the international community now has to contend with the consequences of this crisis, including the flow on effects for regional and global security. And we know that strategic advantage will be sought by some from the West's withdrawal. Our government will need to work with allies and partners to counter this to ensure the security of Australians and to find ways to press the Taliban to deliver on their public commitments to inclusion, the rights of women and minorities and the security of those who have supported our forces. So I endorse the Foreign Minister's support for the UN Security Council's call to which she referred in her contribution. President, having said that, we acknowledge that Australia's ability to influence Afghanistan's future is likely to be limited. But there are immediate priorities on which the Morrison Joyce government must act. In addition to evacuating all Australians and Afghans that supported Australian operations, the government must fast track visas and evacuations for the family members of Australian citizens and Australian permanent residents. And it should commit to many more humanitarian places for Afghans who are at risk of serious harm by the Taliban, protecting the Afghan journalists, community leaders, activists, human rights defenders, especially women, should be central to Australia's response to the crisis in Afghanistan. The Morrison Joyce's government offer of 3,000 visas is insufficient. Australia did not use its full refugee quota last year, and we have over 13,000 places available each year. Well, sadly, the places on offer will only help if we are able to secure passage for those who need it, a task made much harder in the current crisis. And Mr Morrison must ensure that Afghans in Australia on temporary visas are not deported and have pathways to remain here, because there is nothing temporary about the crisis in Afghanistan. And finally, the government must out and will work with the international partners to provide humanitarian assistance to the people of Afghanistan and to Afghanistan's neighbours who will bear the impact of those fleeing their lives. These are all the ways Australia can still make a difference. Mr President, many thousands of Australians served in and worked in Afghanistan, in the ADF, our diplomatic service and through our aid programs and beyond. So to all these courageous men and women, I say thank you for your service, courage and commitment. And I again end by paying tribute to those who fell in our name in Australia's longest war. I honour their sacrifice and I extend my sympathy to their families and their friends. Thank you. 
Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I rise to contribute to this uh, debate on the motion moved by Senator Payne today, and in doing so, uh, want to extend my uh, sympathies and my heart to everybody who is being impacted by the horror that we've seen unfold over the last couple of weeks in Afghanistan. Those that are there fleeing for their lives, those that are here desperate to know whether their families are safe, desperate to know what the future will hold. In 20 years, Australia's longest war, we've been engaged in Afghanistan. Of course, we went in following the United States, Australia again not having an independent foreign policy, led there by John Howard in a war that arguably we could never win. Let's remember the purpose of this military action from the beginning. Uh, right at the beginning was to hunt down Osama bin Laden, was to attack terrorism. It wasn't initially about freeing women or children or bringing democracy to Afghanistan. It wasn't about rebuilding civil society. And the biggest problem right there was that you can't beat terrorism purely with military response. It requires political, civil society and a humanitarian strategy. None of these were at the core of the United Nations, of the United States and the coalition forces at the beginning. Some would argue that, in fact, over the last decade, things have become more unsafe in Afghanistan, less free for those who had such great hopes for a reborn nation. And to that point, Mr. President, I'd just like to acknowledge that the Greens have serious reservations uh, about some of the elements of this motion, that it takes a rose glasses view of Australia's role in Afghanistan. We can't discount the failures that have occurred over the last 20 years. And the toll on Australia has been great. 41 lives lost in combat, 260 wounded, and over 500 veterans have tragically taken their own lives. Thousands and thousands more, Mr President, still suffer the effects of PTSD. But of course the toll has been largest and hardest felt on the people of Afghanistan. It has been enormous long-lasting and tragic. Tens of thousands of innocent lives lost, hundreds of thousands of people displaced and families torn apart. And of course, like always in war and combat, it is women, children and minorities that are the hardest hit by these conflicts. The longest war has had a long, and tragic and harrowing impact on the people of Afghanistan. And the hundreds of thousands of people who have fled across borders to escape oppression and violence in the search of freedom from military actions, death and torture. For 20 years, Australia has played a role in this bloody war. I was remembering last week that right in this place, after the 2010 election, one of the things that the Greens uh, negotiated with the Gillard government was a commitment to debate the Afghan war in this place, in the parliament, every year. As a commitment to not forgetting the real impact of this conflict, as a commitment to debating the merits of our actions, to not forgetting the sacrifice of Australians and others involved in this action, and to not forget the very people whose lives this war was impacting the most. And that debate 
and that commitment for a debate that happened in October in 2010, and it happened again in November of 2011, and again in October in 2012. But then that was it. When the Abbott government came to power, this parliament stopped debating this important war. This parliament stopped debating the merits of why we were there. As members of parliament, it wasn't at the forefront of all of our minds. And that, Madam Acting Deputy President, is a shame. Because it is not without debate that we are able to consider the best ways forward. And over the last two weeks, we've seen the horror unfold in Afghanistan and thousands and thousands of people fleeing for their lives. And we've asked the question, should, have we, should Australia have done more? What was the exit strategy? How were we going to get people out? What was the evacuation plan? Well, this parliament should have been debating those issues regularly, passionately, honestly, and we just haven't been, and that's not good enough. Our veterans, our diplomats, our Afghan friends in Afghanistan and here on Australian soil deserve better of this parliament. They deserve better from this government in relation to planning, talking and being honest about our involvement. It's 20 years of Australia's involvement in Afghanistan, and this week marks 20 years since the Tampa, that famous Norwegian boat that was stopped by the former Prime Minister John Howard, holding over 400 refugees and asylum seekers, mostly Afghan nationals. And that, of course, was at the beginning of a huge diplomatic and political row in this country over how we treated people when they were fleeing horrible regimes like the Taliban. And it set a marker for how we respond to those in need. And I put to you, Madam Acting Deputy President, that it's been a pretty shameful history ever since. And it is not lost on me as we stand here and debate this issue and what should be done to help those who are still left fearing for their lives in Afghanistan, that 20 years ago our government turned their back on the very same people fleeing the very same regime. We need to do better. And that is why the Prime Minister's commitment of 3,000 humanitarian places within our existing program is simply not enough. It is why the slow drip, drip, drip of getting people out of Afghanistan who have worked alongside us and their families has not been good enough. And it is why the Prime Minister's refusal to grant permanent protection to the four and a half thousand Afghans who are here in Australia already, giving them an opportunity to get on with their lives, to be free of that constant threat of ever having to face the Taliban again. What unnecessary cruelty to have that limbo hanging over people's heads when there is absolutely no need to. 
It is unnecessary and it's mean-spirited. And if we have not learnt anything for the last 20 years, my gosh, what on earth have we been doing? I don't buy for one second, and I'm sure, Madam Acting Deputy President, not one person in this chamber buys it either. The spin from the Taliban this week that they have changed their approach, that they will treat women and girls properly, that Hazaras will be able to live free from oppression and persecution. I don't believe it, and I'm sure you don't either. So what are we going to do about it? We at least have to take on board our moral obligation, commit to taking and helping those and their families who stood alongside us, who helped us, allow those that are already in Australia to bring their families here and to play our role in the international community of acknowledging that this is a humanitarian crisis and we need to do more. Minister Payne and Senator Wong both acknowledge that as members of parliament, our offices have been inundated with heartbreaking stories of people who are living in fear right now, of people who are worried about the fact that they haven't had a phone call or a text message returned in the last 12 hours and they don't know if their family is still alive. And as the situation outside of the airport deteriorates even further, that fear is only growing. Well, there are moments like this that happen in a Prime Minister's leadership, where a Prime Minister can decide to do the right thing. And I plead with Mr Morrison, don't be stubborn about this. This is a humanitarian crisis. These are people's lives, people we owe an obligation to, people we should help because it's the right thing to do. Don't be pig-headed about this. Show some leadership and show the compassion that our defence force, that our diplomats, that our humanitarian workers have all been showing and been committed to for the last 20 years, it doesn't take much to do the right thing. You just have to show a bit of compassion and have a little bit of heart. And I urge the Prime Minister to do that today. Thank you. We will now go remotely to Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Well, I rise to speak, <coughs> I rise to, speak to the motion. The decision to withdraw from Afghanistan has been drawn into sharp focus by the images of a chaotic scenes at the Kabul airport. We have watched history unfold before our eyes, just as we did 20 years ago when the World Trade Centre buildings collapsed and the Pentagon burned from the September 11 terrorist attacks. It's our obligation to be a witness to these events because Australia has played an active role in Afghanistan from the beginning. It has been our longest war and it has not been without enormous cost. It's important we acknowledge the 41 Australians who lost their lives in Afghanistan. It's important we acknowledge, even if we can't really know, how their families must feel at the moment. I would say to them, it was not in vain. The mission to Afghanistan has not been a failure. The initial objective to hunt down Al Qaeda and destroy its base of operations was achieved. It was right for Australian forces to stay in Afghanistan as part of the effort to secure and rebuild the country. For me, there is no question about this. The questions which remain are, 
whether the withdrawal of coalition forces has been too hasty, whether the Taliban will again implement a regime as oppressive and terrible as one which ruled Afghanistan from 1996 to 2001, if Afghanistan will again become a safe haven and operation space for Islamic terrorists under the Taliban, and what coalition countries will do <clears throat> for Afghans desperate to flee a resurgent Taliban. Many are saying the withdrawal of Western forces has been premature. This position has been underlined by the rapid way the Taliban has taken over control of much of Afghanistan. I had the privilege to visit Afghanistan three years ago and have a look at what our troops were doing to train the Afghan army. Our people held the younger local trainees in high regard and had strong hopes for the future of Afghanistan. The problem were the old guard, fighters still around from the days of the Taliban. It was clear to me we needed to stay a lot longer and support a younger, more enlightened generation to lead Afghanistan to its rightful place among the modern community of nations. Now there are reports that intelligence estimates of the weakness of the Afghan, Afghanistan government and armed forces to resist the Taliban were ignored by the unhinged President of the United States, Joe Biden. President Biden has presided over a disaster that could have been avoided. The Taliban now have access to modern weapons and equipment given to the Afghan army, enough for up to 300,000 troops to enforce their rule and supply to terrorists. The threat of Islamic terrorism has increased again. This disaster has diminished the standing of the United States and Australia, and it's very telling that while we close our embassies in Kabul, Russia and China are keeping their embassies open. And while the Taliban have made noises about being more benign rulers, particularly with respect to women, there are indications they have not changed since 2001. They have freed thousands of Islamic terrorists. There are reports of executions in the streets and lists being compiled for women to be married or for sex slaves to Taliban fighters. And we have all seen the terrible images of people desperate to escape the Taliban at the Kabul airport following the rapid collapse of the Afghan government. These images have shocked the world, even knocking the COVID-19 pandemic or front pages for a couple of days. Inevitably, the usual suspects are putting pressure on the Morrison government to increase Australia's humanitarian refugee intake and bring in a few flood of refugees from Afghanistan. The Greens want 20,000 places made available over and above the 13,750 existing places in our humanitarian program. Labor has called the Prime Minister's offer of 3,000 places within the current humanitarian intake piecemeal. And the figure? plucked from nowhere. Amnesty International says the offer is insufficient. One Nation encourages the Morrison government to resist these very predictable and opportunistic calls to open the floodgates to a new wave of refugees. Because the government has already been bringing in Afghans to Australia for resettlement for years, more than 8,500 have come to call Australia home since 2013 when the coalition government came to power. And the government is working to bring in those Afghans and their families who worked with Australian forces and are at risk as a result. Some have already arrived. One Nation strongly supports this effort. We owe it to the Afghans who worked with Australian forces to make their country a better place. But we do not support opening the floodgates to waves of undocumented arrivals again. The current environment is simply too chaotic for individual applicants to be properly vetted to ensure they don't pose a threat. Afghans have been exposed to a fundamentalist ideology incompatible with living in Australia. There are more than 40 other Islamic countries better suited to accommodate Afghans fleeing Taliban rule. Australia is hardly in a position to accommodate a flood of new arrivals in any case. Possibly people who will hate our culture and way of life. People who may never hold a job. 
people who may want to destroy our democracy. We already have a domestic housing crisis, skyrocketing public debt, growing urban congestion and massive dependency on welfare only exacerbated by lockdowns and the COVID-19 pandemic. Despite this, the Morrison government is already showing some signs of caving into the pressure. It has called the initial figure of 3,000 places a floor, not a ceiling. The Morrison government is having the door open and could significantly increase the number. I will not apologise to anyone for not being a bleeding heart. I am a realist. And I am not convinced large numbers of Afghan refugees allowed in is in Australia's best interest, especially with large numbers of terrorists being released from prisons by the Taliban. The PM, PM's open door represents yet another failure to show leadership, which has been the defining feature of the major parties in government during this pandemic. The Prime Minister has surrendered control of the pandemic to premiers and chief ministers in the states and territories. The Prime Minister has surrendered the leadership around the vaccine question of vaccine mandates. He is now leaving it open to surrendering control of our international border and humanitarian visa program to the bleeding hearts of Labor, the Greens and the Open Border Brigade. They are looking for any and every way to open the floodgates and return to the time when people smugglers were effectively in control of Australia's immigration and refugee programs. People smugglers are poised for just such an opportunity. They will be active in Afghanistan right now, preying on desperate people. We cannot return to that situation in Australia. Too many people died, and we are still dealing with the fallout years after the last boat arrived. The Prime Minister needs to make it absolutely clear exactly how many people his government plans to bring here from Afghanistan. He needs to show some leadership at last. This parliament and the Australian people deserve to know who will be coming here and the circumstances in which they will come. The Prime Minister cannot leave it open-ended. And that's exactly what the people smugglers have been waiting for. I have to respond to Senator Hanson Young and her comments and talks about the oppression and the persecution that's happening over there with the women and children. Well, may I remind her that is exactly happening here in Australia. No different. Why aren't you speaking out about that? Why aren't we debating that on the floor of Parliament? What about the child brides? What about the female circumcision? What about women having to wear the burqa because their men folk tell them, this is happening right on our own doorstep and you're worrying about another country? It is oppression and it is persecution that's happening in our own doorstep and yet you do nothing about it when we have multiple marriages um, and we don't do anything about it. I also would like to point out that I did go to Africa and understand what I said and I saw what was happening on the ground there. And I met those interpreters and I met people that actually worked with our defence personnel. They were highly regarded. And yes, I think our presence there did a lot for the country. And even just after I left, there they had an election there that the, that the ISIS and, the, and those uh, fighters over there were actually blowing themselves up at their the polling booths to stop people from going to vote. They wanted their freedom. I did two hours in the Afghan um, training military uh, college. Two hours there, walked around with the brigadier and showed me what was happening. We had women in classes for the first time. They were actually allowed to join the Defence Forces. First time to allow to actually teach in schools. First time to actually join the police force. The country was moving forward. And now this has happened. And I asked myself the question, why? Why is Russia and China still over there? Why did Imran Khan from Pakistan, he is a, he's a poor of it. We have big problems coming. And I told President um, Joe Biden unhinged. He actually had no idea what was going on over there or he wasn't advised because I was there for three days and I could see exactly what was going on and what needed to be done. And I blame the Prime Minister for not stepping up to the mark and actually having it out with Joe Biden why the troops were not left there long enough to get our people and those ones that helped us out of that country. They now have equipment that the Taliban, Taliban is more armed with that, that equipment they never had before. 
they will become a force to be reckoned with. And if they really do um, join up with ISIS, I believe that the Western nations, countries around the world, will feel the force of terrorism, will reach our doorsteps again. Because this will be seen by their fundamentalists as a win for them. That's why I oppose these people just freely coming into the country. You can't open up the floodgates. We have a lot of terrorists there that hate our democracy and hate our way of life. You cannot just open up the floodgates. We have to know who we're bringing into the country. This is why it's very important. You talk about debating these issues on the floor of parliament. We should have our ministers and the prime minister should have their fingers on the pulse, knowing what is actually happening there. Sometimes we have too much talk on the floor of parliament and nothing happens. And these decisions we must put in the hands of those authorities that really know what is happening. And a lot of that, most politicians on the floor of parliament haven't been to Afghanistan. They have no idea what went on over there. But I went over there and I saw for myself, and I do understand the importance of, of, it, of us being there to liberate the country, to liberate those men and women and those children. But like I said to you, if you want to start looking on your own back door and start of talking about oppression and the persecution of, of women and children over there because it's happening in our own country. And you're a representative, Senator Hanson Young, for the, the, all the people here in Australia. So I suggest you start looking at that and I'll be quite happy to have that debate with you and let's, let's sort out what's happening to the women and children in Australia. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Uh, Senator Lambie, remotely. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Acting, Ms. Acting De Deputy President, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Senator Lambie, you have the call. Thank you. Thank you. To the people who have served in Afghanistan, to the people who lost mates in Afghanistan, to those of you who have missed birthdays, wedding anniversaries, Christmases, first day of kids at school, to the people who lost your health, have lost your livelihoods, who lost who you once were over in Afghanistan, to the many, many people who left a piece of yourselves over there in a war for a country on the other side of the world, we sincerely thank you. We thank you for your service and we thank you for your sacrifices you have made for this country. We thank you all that you gave and gave to the people of Australia so that we can live our lives in peace, far away from war and conflict. Your country is incredibly grateful and always will be. Today's hard and I know many of you are feeling a lot of pain, a lot of hurt about what's going on in Afghanistan. I know that you're confused. You gave everything you could have done over, you could have over there, and you've done everything you could have done. We know you did, just to see the country you tried to save crumble to pieces within minutes of our troops pulling out. And here we are, here we are, watching in horror as Kabul falls to the resurgent Taliban. We've seen videos of Afghans handing over their babies to American soldiers trying so desperately to find a way to keep their children safe, even if it means never seeing them again. We've seen people clinging to the evacuation planes as they take off from the runways out of Kabul. There are plenty of crowds gathering outside the airport gates in the middle of a pandemic, doing everything they can to run, to escape, to get themselves and their families far away from the Taliban, who have once again taken over their country. And it is heartbreaking. There is no other word for it. It is absolutely heartbreaking. But we shouldn't doubt what we fought for. We fought for our values and they're worth fighting for. They are always worth fighting for. No matter what the odds, no matter the result, you value what you fight for. We have always done that. You fought, for, you fought to give little girls a chance to go to school and you fought to rid the world of the shadow of extremist terrorism. You fought to give people in one of the poorest nations in the world a say in the way their country was run. You fought to make the world better. You certainly fought to make their, their little bit of the world better, safer and fairer. 
And that's what Australians should always fight for because they are part of our values. You did what you believed in and you did what you were asked to do. And you should always hold your head up high, stand tall and be proud of what you've achieved because you did exactly what the country asked you to do. If anyone wants to judge the result of our longest war by what the country looks like once we leave it, they miss the point. The only question to ask is what the world would look like if we hadn't gone in in the first place. We need to consider that. What would it look like if Australians hadn't stood up for what we stand for? And I have no doubt that we'd be living in a world that would be shivering in the shadow of terrorism. People all around the world would live in fear that the disgusting disregard for human life we saw on September the 11th would be felt any day, any time. Because the ones who think of human life like a bargaining chip and perverted holy war would still have a place to call home in Afghanistan. Those who fought no longer swore, you made us safer. You made Afghanistan safer. You've got nothing to apologise for. You've got nothing to bow your heads down to. But if there's value to be found in what we've seen in the last few weeks, it's to be found in this building. Any failure sit on the shoulders of all the people in this chamber today and the people who have been in this chamber or the other place who made bad decisions about how to run this war. They're the people to blame. They're the people that need to go and have a look at their own conscience. Not just the ones sitting in there today, but the ones from the past. By God, I hope you're taking the time out, especially those ones in the past, having a good think about your actions, because by God, you need to. There will come a time when we, have, when we get to look at this carefully. There will be time for anger, for hard question, questions about what has gone wrong here. I'll be moving a motion this week so that we can do that and we will start that process because, God forbid, I do not want to go over this process for another 20 years in the future. I do not want to make the same mistakes again for our kids and our grandchildren who will be serving the country. I don't want it, and they don't either. We sent troops to a country under the thumb of a brutal regime, and for 20 years we gave them life free of it. That's not fighter in my books. If there was anything we could have done to make the Afghan government and its institutions more resilient to the forces of the Taliban, we should have done it. If there was anything we didn't do that we could have done, we should know about it so it doesn't happen again in the future. And the only way we honour and respect the sacrifice that's been made by those who served under an Australian flag in Afghanistan is by asking hard questions, and they are beyond asking, they need to be asked, about what we could have done discipline very differently to have, the, to have a very different ending to what we have today. It needs to be examined. If false great patriotism to say that asking hard questions about the results of our longest war in any way undermines or disrespects the contribution they made. Patriotism means holding your country to the highest standard you know your country is capable of achieving. We owe it to Australia to ask how we could have done better, how we could have had a better result at the end. And that's what I want to do for all of us, because we need those answers. We need them. We need to go over the past to make sure that we don't make the same mistakes in the future. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As Leader of the Nationals in the Senate, I rise to support the motion and uh, especially the comments of Minister Payne earlier in this place. The images coming out of Afghanistan have been extremely confronting and distressing for people across the world. Just as distressing as the images of the planes flying into the World Trade Centre were on the 11th of September 2001. Any Australian who was alive on that day would remember exactly where they were when the reports of what was occurring in New York and Washington broke on our news networks. It was a never-before-seen attack of terror on the Western world. 
In response, Prime Minister John Howard invoked the ANZUS Treaty for the first time, and we stood with our American friends in their time of need. Australia became part of the NATO-led mission and entered Afghanistan to contribute to the fight against terrorism. We worked alongside the United States, NATO and the international community to hunt down Osama bin Laden and those responsible for the attacks on September the 11th and to eliminate, eliminate al-Qaeda's capacity to stage more attacks on the West from Afghanistan. And that was achieved. That mission was accomplished. Almost 39,000 selfless, brave Australian Defence Force men and women made Australia a safer place and saved Australian lives through their service in Afghanistan and completing that mission. Many returned home with physical injuries and mental wounds, and some will never heal. Tragically, 41 of our brave soldiers did not make it home, and they paid the ultimate sacrifice in service of our nation. They did not die in vain, and we will never forget them, and we will continue to honour them each and every day. Australia owes a great debt of gratitude to all our veterans who have served with distinction, as well as gratitude to their families who have supported them during their service and beyond. Their service and those of other agencies gave Afghans a chance for a better future. Afghans inc gained increased access to basic, basic health care and electricity. We saw reduced maternal mortality rates, rises in life expectancy and the participation of women in politics and girls attending school. A generation of young Afghans were given hope. They are educated as a result of our efforts in that place. Our veterans, border force personnel, federal police officers and humanitarian aid workers should hold their heads up high. The cause was and always will be a just one. They must carry with them the knowledge that they did their nation and the world proud, and that their fellow Australians, as we are in this place, are proud of them for serving in our national interest. I also had the privilege during my time uh, in this place to be part of an Australian Defence Force exchange program to visit Al Minhad and uh, meet with soldiers being deployed into Afghanistan, to visit Tarankout, uh, a uniquely Australian base with a very uniquely Australian vibe. I was able to also visit Kandahar, where um, things were a bit hot and heavy, and we had to, during a siren, we had to uh, run through the appropriate behaviours, drop to the floor, etc. And in that period of time, there was a very well. I thought he was very young. He's probably nearly 30. A young Australian soldier who the poor thing was tasked with looking after this group of MPs. And I asked him, you know, how, how was it? And he felt very, very privileged and proud to be serving in the ADF at a point in time where he could see active service. And it was indeed his fourth tour um, voluntarily. Uh, and I have often thought of this young man and his approach to service uh, in, in the years past. He knew what the mission was. He knew what his job within that mission was. And he was very, very proud uh, to serve his country, as I was to meet him. And I wish him well wherever he is today. Heartbreakingly, though, the hope that we and our allies instilled in the Afghan people is now in doubt. The Australian government is responding to the rapidly evolving situation in Afghanistan, and it remains highly volatile and dangerous environment. Ministers are meeting daily to lead the response to the crisis, and I'm sure we all thank them, Minister Dutton, Minister Payne, the Prime Minister, uh, Minister Andrews, uh, in ensuring that we maintain that our top priority is the safe and orderly departure of Australian citizens and visa holders. The Taliban must ensure the safe and orderly departure of those who wish to leave. The Taliban also must meet the commitments that they've made to the international community on the participation of women and girls in the broader uh, Afghani community, of the commitment to education and to ensure that never again will Islamic extremism be able to take hold uh, within its borders to wreak havoc on the world. We have not forgotten the Afghans who supported our troops over the last two decades, and we will not forget the Afghan people. The Prime Minister has instructed the ADF to extract Australians and their Afghan colleagues, 
and our forces are working with US counterparts to support multinational efforts to ensure those wishing to leave Afghanistan can do so safely. Since the 18th of August, alongside our allies, we've facilitated the safe evacuation of over 1,000 people from Kabul in some of the most extreme conditions our forces have operated in. This is in addition to the more than 8,500 Afghans who have been resettled in Australia since 2013. The Australian government has also announced that an initial 3,000 humanitarian places will be allocated to Afghan nationals within Australia's overall annual humanitarian program. And we anticipate that this initial allocation will increase over the course of this year. As the Prime Minister has said, this is a floor, not a ceiling. I want to express to the people of Afghanistan, we are thinking of you. We will continue to support you and do whatever we can to ensure your safety. Right now, our Australian Defence Force personnel are continuing to make sure Afghan people have access to the same lives, the same freedoms and the same protections we in Australia um, have. We are committed to doing everything we can in the time we have to get as many people out as safely as possible. Lastly, I ask all veterans, all Australians, to do a very Australian thing, check in on your mates, support those who have served during this very difficult time. And to those who need it, I remind all veterans and their families of their access to Open Arms Veterans and Families Counselling Service. Don't hesitate to call 1800 011 We stand ready to support these incredible Australians and thank every single one of them for their service. I'm confident that our efforts as a nation in Afghanistan meant a safer world, meant a safer Australia. And our decisions as a government have always been taken in the national interest and will continue to do so. All in this place thank those for their service and for the contribution that they made on our behalf. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Senator Keneally. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. For years, there have been calls to help the locally engaged interpreters and support staff who fought with our troops in Afghanistan. These brave men and women who stood alongside Australians in our hour of need, and yet we've left it too late to help too many of them in theirs. For believing in our mission and supporting our values of liberty and democracy, they and their families now face grave danger and death at the hands of the Taliban. For months and years, Labor has joined with veterans retired senior officers of our Defence Forces and former Prime Ministers in their call for urgent action to help the locals who helped us. Australian veterans like Jason Skeynes, Glenn Kalalamitz and Stuart McCarthy have been trying to save the lives of their mates in Afghanistan and I acknowledge as well my colleague in the other chamber, Luke Gosling. Knowing full well that the window to get them out has been narrowing. Now with the country in tatters, we are forced to witness the horrific scenes in Kabul as people flee for their lives. The reality is that we simply have not done enough to help our friends. In July, other allied nations were evacuating their Afghan supporters as the Taliban advanced. The Morrison government did not do enough, and when, when Kabul fell, the government were left scrambling to send an evacuation aircraft on 16 August. The Prime Minister now says that he wishes it could have been different. The reality is it could have been. Veterans, lawyers, even former Prime Minister John Howard warned Mr. Morrison that he wasn't doing enough to get our allies out. Now I've spoken to dozens of people from the Afghan Australian community over the past week. They have shared their stories with me. These were harrowing, tormenting, and deeply moving. These are Australian citizens and permanent residents who are telling me of their relatives who are in hiding, moving every few hours with their children and nothing more than the clothes on their back unable to get food, unable to get their documents, unable to fill out the forms, unable to get to the airport. These Australians tell me 
of the desperate texts, the WhatsApp messages, the fear, the very real threat of death hanging over their wives, their children, their parents, their brothers, their sisters, and their cousins. They have more questions than answers because the humanitarian visa rules are unclear. The process is confounding and particularly in the middle of a humanitarian crisis. MPs and senators, particularly in seats with high concentrations of Afghan Australians, have been overrun, inundated with requests for help. My office alone assisted and supported more than a thousand applications in the last week. Temporary protection and safe haven visa holders are also receiving conflicting advice from the Morrison government about whether they can apply for family reunification visas. The Minister Alex Hawke said on ABC Radio that they can, but the Department of Home Affairs publications say they can't. Legal services and refugee support groups are not able to get clarity either. I've been talking to many of these over the past few days. This confusion adds to the distress and the misery that Australian citizens, Australian veterans, visa holders here in Australia, and those who work every day to support them are feeling. It's not too late to fix this. The Morrison-Joyce government's offer of 3,000 visas is insufficient. Australia has 13,750 humanitarian intake places available for refugees this year. And we didn't exhaust our quota from last year. We should do more. I welcome that the Prime Minister says that this is a floor, not a ceiling. But again, confusion reigns. The Minister for Immigration told ABC Radio that these places were new. It is clear that they are not. None of this will matter, though, the number of places. If we can't secure safe passage to the airport, a task made exceedingly difficult now due to the government's too little, too late. I acknowledge the bravery and the hard work of ADF personnel, of Home Affairs officials and other Australians who are on the ground seeking to secure safe passage. But I can share with this chamber just today a woman that my office assisted to get a visa turned up at the airport and was turned away by Australian officials because they didn't accept the email documentation she had as real. This is the type a bureaucratic process that is simply not working for people who are in a humanitarian crisis. Mr. Morrison must ensure as well that Afghans in Australia on temporary visas are not deported and that they have pathways to remain here. This has been done for people from Hong Kong. This has been done for people from Myanmar. It can be done for people from Afghanistan who are here in Australia on a temporary visa. We should do this not just because it's right. We should do all these things, not just because they're right, but because we owe the respect to our Australian citizens and permanent residents who are desperate and fearful for their family members in Afghanistan. And we should do it because we owe a, date, a great debt to our military men and women who served in Afghanistan. We honour those who went, those who never came home, and those who never came home quite the same. The reality is that our mission in Afghanistan would have been far more dangerous without the selfless sacrifice of the locals who helped us. And that's why so many of our veterans are fighting to save their mates. How can we let their pleas fall on deaf ears after all they've done for us? Soldiers know better than anyone that mateship is a verb. Mateship means showing up in hard times, no one left behind. It's a value woven into our national fabric by the Anzacs. And so what do we owe to our mates in Afghanistan? We owe them more than we can ever say, but at the very least, we owe them the chance to live in the peace they fought so bravely to bring to their own land. 
We will dissect this war for decades to come, why we went there, what we did, and why it ended like this. But I beg of the Morrison government, do not let this ending be an enduring shame. That would be the ultimate betrayal of our veterans, of those who helped our soldiers, and of our values. The Morrison government must do more for our Afghan Australian community, for our Afghan mates, and it must happen now. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Reynolds. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. I too rise to support the motion moved by the Foreign Minister, and I also wholeheartedly endorse her words, her emotions and her sentiments expressed in her comments. I congratulate her, other ministers, their staff and their many officials who are working so hard to save so many lives. But the sad truth is they won't be able to save them all. For 20 years, many thousands of Australians in and out of uniform have served our nation in Afghanistan and more widely in the region. This has undoubtedly not only saved the lives of Australians here in Australia and overseas, but also many others uh, elsewhere. They've saved Australian lives from the threat of terrorism and also um, from the threat of terrorism which has spread uh, from its roots in Afghanistan like a hydra right across our region and even here into Australia. Like so many others, I have been absolutely distressed in recent days to hear some suggest that the efforts of Australian veterans, diplomats and civilians in Afghanistan were for naught. It is simply not true. As Defence Minister, I've been to Afghanistan and I've seen firsthand how Australia's military involvement there and, I've said, in the wider region has not only made our own nation safer from the threat of terrorism, but it has also made a tangible difference to the lives of so many millions of Afghans, particularly their women and their girls. The efforts of our veterans has not been in vain. And I commend Senator Lambie for her words and her expressions of support for the thousands of, Vietnam, uh, sorry, of veterans from Afghanistan. By our presence and by our support, millions have seen the possibility and the reality of a much better life. Please never, ever doubt that. I join the Foreign Minister also in thanking all of those who are currently supporting the evacuation efforts in Kabul and in the UAE. Like so many others, I am now waiting anxiously for news from Kabul and from the UAE about who has made it out and who has made it out past uh, those uh, terrible roadblocks manned by the Taliban. Uh, subjecting people to beatings and to far worse. But I know there are far too many Australians today who are anxiously, desperately awaiting for words, a word of their well-being of their family members, both in Kabul and also right across Afghanistan. Mr Acting Deputy President, none of us can ever forget where we were on September 11 in 2001. I was then Chief of Staff to the Minister for Justice and Customs when the Twin Towers were hit by Al-Qaeda. Like all Australians and indeed the rest of the world, I watched the horror of the multiple attacks on that day in sheer disbelief. But that night, those of us who worked here in the ministerial wing, none of us slept. The phones rang hot and no one at that minute could imagine what the tragedy would mean for our nation's safety, security and indeed for the rest of the world. Indeed, in the first few hours, we were even worried about the safety of the Prime Minister and his travelling team. And over the next months and indeed years, I was at the heart of subsequent reforms to our nation's anti-terrorism measures. Of course, the Bali bombings, which followed hot on the heels of September 11, added to our urgency and brought the reality of terrorism ever closer to our shores. 
Throughout this time, I gained enormous insight into the darkness that inhabited the souls of the perpetrators of terrorism. Darkness and evil that sadly continues to dwell in the minds of those today, including the Taliban and those who have seized control of Afghanistan. The tentacles that spread so quickly from Afghanistan and al-Qaeda to our region, to Jamaa Ismailia and to the Bali bombings, which claimed the lives of 202 innocents, including 88 Australians. In Bali, I visited the morgue. I met shell-shock survivors. I worked with the families of those who lost loved ones in Bali. I saw, heard, and I will never forget the smells of the impact of terrorism on the lives of Australians. I also witnessed then, as I do every day here in Australia, that the decisions made by governments of the day are never easy and they are never taken lightly. That time also showed me very, very clearly that democratic freedoms are never truly free and that all too often have to be fought for over and over and over again. And that is what thousands of our troops did in Afghanistan for nearly 20 years, with the loss of 41 irreplaceable Australian lives. These were all Australians who loved and were loved and will be forever missed, and they will all be remembered. These experiences also motivated me to begin volunteering with a range of Australian and overseas programs to support and empower young political leaders, particularly women, to help them find their voice in their communities, in their media and in their parliaments, to help them speak out in circumstances that we have no concept of, that really is just so foreign to our own way of life. And I met so many women, including women in Afghanistan, who I'm now proud to call friend, who continue to make me so proud, to inspire me and who humble me. So, Mr Acting Deputy President, what did our 20 years of service in Afghanistan achieve for Afghans? Well, for a start, the life expectancy of Afghans has increased from just 56 years to 64 years. The mortality rate of infants has reduced dramatically from 87 to 46 per 1,000 births. Women's participation in the labour force has risen to over 20 per cent, from almost nil. Afghanistan now has more than 200 female judges and over 4,000 women in law enforcement. And 27 per cent of seats in Afghanistan are held by women. But one of our most significant achievements and I hope enduring commitments and legacies is the dramatic increase in access to education for Afghan boys and girls. The literacy rate of the adult population has increased to 43 per cent, while the literacy rates for girls has increased dramatically to 60 per cent. Student enrolments grew from less than a million, of course all boys, to over 9.5 million students today. 40 per cent, wonderfully, are now girls. Having worked with women who fight unimaginable political and security challenges each and every day on behalf of their communities, I think it is very fitting to leave my last words in this chamber today on this issue to the words of one of these women who has so inspired me, an incredibly brave Afghan woman Shukriya Barakazai. Shukriya is a former Afghan politician, diplomat and a fierce advocate for women's rights who has chosen to remain in Kabul. Her bravery, her struggle and sacrifice continue to inspire me and so many others. In her life, she has been subject to multiple suicide attacks. She has been beaten, she has been wounded gravely, she has lost two children and she had suffered so many other losses that are just so unimaginable to all of us in this parliament today. She ran an underground school for girls during the Taliban and today she still fights 
in Afghanistan for the voices of young women. Now, last week, Shukriya wrote a really powerful article from Kabul, which was published in the Daily Mail, about her fears, but amazingly also about her hopes that enough younger Afghans will carry out, will continue to carry out her work and the work of many others who have fought for so long on behalf of the women and girls. She said that this week her concern is for the young minds that they survive, that they endure, and that they keep on fighting the fight for women and girls. And I'll finish with her parting words in the article. She ended her article this way. I'm trying to place my faith in the resilience of this land and in its brave and benighted people. No matter how dark the clouds are, I'm looking at the end of the night to the sunrise beyond. Today my hope is that the passion, the commitment and the bloodshed of so many from Australia and globally will continue to inspire women with the resilience that Shakira has. To all Australian servicemen and women and all other Australians who served in Afghanistan and also to their families, I thank you for your service. To all veterans and to your families, please always remember that not only have you saved Australian lives here and overseas, but you have transformed the lives of a generation of Afghan boys and girls. And like Shakira, I hope that together we have done enough to prepare them, as she said, with the skills to endure the current darkness so that they may eventually see the sunrise beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Reynolds. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I think we have all been shocked at the images we've seen on our television screens over the last week and a half, and I have to admit I've found it very hard to watch, uh, particularly when that aircraft, that US aircraft, took off with people desperately clinging to the undercarriage. It reinforces to us here in Australia um, our democracy and our freedoms and uh, it shows how desperate people are to get out of that country and to escape what they know is going to be um, the resurgence of the Taliban. <clears throat> so obviously the unfolding security and humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan is devastating uh, for the people of Afghanistan, for the Australian Afghan communities, for the Afghan staff that supported our military and diplomatic operations for over 20 years, and it's heartbreaking for our veterans, and for the women and girls of Afghanistan who now face the prospect of a cruel and brutal regime. I think none of us in this place can imagine uh, how brutal and horrific it will be. Many Australians, including veterans, are horrified to see the Taliban surge across the country. Labor is deeply concerned about the stability of Afghanistan, and we certainly urge the Morrison-Joyce government to work with international partners to help support efforts towards a negotiated settlement and a permanent ceasefire. Labor will use all of the avenues available to us to ensure the Morrison government continues to support the people of Afghanistan, including through our humanitarian assistance program. We know that this is a deeply distressing time for Australians of Afghan descent and Afghan visa holders in Australia who are fearful, quite rightly, for the safety of their loved ones. We have been calling for the Morrison-Joyce government to develop a plan to urgently fast-track visas and evacuations for the immediate family members of Australians who, have, who are in Afghanistan, along with those who supported our operations. Thousands of husbands, wives, partners and children of Australians have been waiting for years for partners and family visas, and others must now be eligible for refugee and humanitarian visas. 
Last week, I'm sure like uh, many of us in this place, our office received a lot of phone calls from very, very distressed Afghanis in the main about expressing their concern about um, their families. And I want to um, put some of those uh, callers on the record. So those calls have been many. They've been heart-wrenching uh, from members of our community begging for action to bring their loved ones to safety from the terrors of Afghanistan to the safety of our home, Australia. And of course, this isn't the first time these pleas have been made. Uh, under the Howard government, uh, equally, we saw many Afghan refugees arriving in this country, Hazara they were. And at that um, time, I wasn't a member of this place, but I used to go and assist them fill out their visa applications. And uh, I was really shocked, I think, for the first time to be confronted with people who lived entirely different lives to the way that I had lived mine, uh, people who put their occupations down as blacksmiths, as tinkers, as shepherds, uh, people who had 16 or 17 uh, brothers and sisters in their family, many of whom were deceased, who told me horrific stories of persecution uh, under the Taliban so many years ago. And those stories and those faces and those refugees have stayed with me. And now we have, yet again, uh, Afghanis in the same situation, asking, begging for our help. So one male caller noted that um, he keeps trying to talk to people in power. He's emailed the Minister for Defence and has tried to contact his Liberal member and the Prime Minister. To quote on his experience pleading for help, these people don't see me, he said. They don't care about me. You, uh, the person at the other end of the phone in my office, are the only person who has listened to what I have to say. We just want to be heard. I would like you to pass on my message to the senator and to the parliament. I worked as an interpreter in Afghanistan for Australian troops. My sister, my brother and my family are in hiding. If the Taliban find them, they will slaughter them. I risked my life for Australia, and now I feel as though I am not Australian. They treat me differently. I do not belong. These members of our community do belong. They should be treated with the same level of respect as every other Australian. Times like these are when the Australian spirit should be strong. We look out for one another. The Prime Minister needs to remember that he is representing the people of this country and they are crying out to be heard. Zakia is a Cannington resident. Uh, Cannington is in the uh, Swan electorate of um, Western Australia. She's a resident. Her sister is a midwife and her brother is a journalist. Both are in Afghanistan and fear for their safety due to their employment. She is fearful for her family and wishes the Australian government would provide more assistance. We heard from a man on behalf of the Afghan community, again in the electorate of Swan. He called before the Taliban had entered Kabul, the weekend before last. He was a battlefield interpreter for the Australian government in Afghanistan. In his own words, I have helped the Australian counter-terrorism mission in Afghanistan by wearing the Australian army uniform and going to the front line of the war in Kandahar province and putting my life in danger. My family members are still in Afghanistan. They are shocked. They have nowhere to go. And the life of my family members is in danger. If the Taliban catch my family members, they will slaughter them. And again, over and over again, we've heard that word slaughter. It's a word that I'm not using, but it's a word that's been uh, told to uh, the people at the end of the phone in my office. I'm begging the Australian government to save my family's life pro by providing them with a visa and bringing them to Australia to live in a safe environment. This is what the US and Canada and the UK are doing right now in Kabul. My family is not safe under the Taliban because of my job as an interpreter for the Australian Army. On top of that, 
I'm Hazara, and the Taliban has a history of slaughtering Hazara. <clears throat> that has included the slaughtering of hundreds of innocent women and children. Recently, and we've heard this um, a few times now coming out of Afghanistan, and we heard it again on the phones last week, recently the Taliban has taken away 10 to 12-year-old girls from their families and forced them to marry soldiers. He told us, this man, that he only has his voice left to help his family and others like them. Yesterday I'm proud to say that um, the West Australian community held a rally, um, something we can do in Western Australia because we don't have the COVID restrictions we see uh, in the eastern states. And it was a rally in support of the Afghan people. And I want to talk about uh, the young, one of the young women who organised that rally, Ralia Hadari. Ralia was one of the organisers of the Perth Rally for Afghanistan yesterday. She lives in Perth and came to Australia with her family on a humanitarian visa when she was very young. Raila lives in my Labor colleague Anne Ali's electorate of Cowan. Raila is an Australian citizen. Raila works in the international humanitarian and human rights sectors and is an advocate for education and female economic empowerment throughout Australia and the world. Her husband, Khalil, came by boat to Australia a year after Ralia arrived, and Khalid is still being made to reapply over and over for temporary protection visas. They now have a nine-month-old daughter and horrifically received a letter from the Department of Home Affairs recently saying that their daughter, born in Australia, to her Australian citizen mother was unlawful. The letter was quickly established to be incorrect, but imagine at this time, uh, by the Australian government, who's supposed to be protecting you, that your daughter is unlawful. This is just one of the impacts of the Morrison government's ongoing policies that lack any compassion or empathy particularly for people who are living in our country in constant uncertainty and fear. I would implore the Morrison-Joyce government to at least immediately fast track those Afghan refugees who have remained on temporary protection visas in this country for years and years. Show some our humanity. We saw it from Mr Abbott when he was Prime Minister. We can and we must do better than what's on offer at the moment. I want to see, as does my Labor colleagues, us lift the number of people we take into this country. But I'm really sad to hear the demonisation that has crept into the language of the Morrison government uh, from Mr Dutton and others just over the last couple of weeks. Uh Senator Rice is now joining us remotely. Senator Rice, are you on the line? Senator Rice, you may be on mute. Janet, you've got to unmute and remute again. Uh, download and reload uh, the. Senator Rice, you can't get through to us. We'll try once more, and then we'll go to Senator Stoker and come back to you, Senator Rice. Senator Rice, if you can hear me, you may need to log off and log back on again. We'll go to Senator Stoker. We'll come back to you, Senator Rice. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. It's with a heavy heart that I rise to make a small contribution on the situation in Afghanistan, a place where almost 40,000 ADF personnel and civilians have honourably served, fulfilling a difficult duty and making sacrifices often extending well beyond their deployment. Each one with their own story. 41 lost on deployment, too many more lost to mental health consequences upon their return. 
each one with a family that too carried the weight of that duty. For our veterans, mere thanks is not enough, but I extend it nonetheless. You know, coalition forces repeatedly defeated the Taliban in battle. In defence tactics, they have been unparalleled in dealing with an irregular <coughs> adversary. The problem is that the nation hasn't been able to take that success and translate it into a sustained diplomatic and institutional culture that serves the long-term objective of freedom for the people of Afghanistan. In that sense, it's not so much a military failure as an institutional one. Now, that may seem like cold comfort to the Australian veterans who struggle daily with observing the events in Afghanistan today or the scars they bear from their time deployed. And it will surely ring hollow to the families of the 41 ADF personnel that we lost in Afghanistan. But for those veterans listening, I hope you will take this encouragement. You did everything you could. And while it may not be viable for Australia to persist with your legacy of service in Afghanistan in the absence of our coalition partners today, there has nevertheless been much accomplished. So let me acknowledge what your pain has achieved. You built a local armed force that was ultimately quite skilled, though it couldn't translate tactics into lasting change. You found and held accountable those who, through al-Qaeda, sought to export terrorism globally, and you made it clear that they could not hide. You built prosperity. GDP in Afghanistan rose by more than 250 per cent during the time of our involvement. You have reduced infant mortality in Afghanistan by 50 per cent and the newborn mortality rate by 32 per cent. You reduced death in childbirth by facilitating the training of midwives. In 2002, there were just 400 nationwide. In 2018, there were over 5,000. You delivered an increase in functioning health care facilities from 496 in 2002 to 2,800 in 2018. You made it possible to extend life expectancy by nine years in the period from 2000 to 2018. You reduced the number of people who lived with hunger daily so much that by 2020, Afghanistan rated 99th out of 107 countries for its Global Hunger Index score. Child marriage plummeted. The rate at which children gave birth was more than halved between 2001 and 2019. You made it possible for 37 per cent of Afghan teenage girls to be able to read today. You ensured more girls than ever before had the opportunity to attend school. 80 per cent of girls, even in remote regions. In 1999, not a single girl in Afghanistan was in secondary school, and there were only 9,000 in primary school. That number is now 3.5 million. One third of university students are women, and 1,000 women started businesses of their own in recent times. All of those things were prohibited under the Taliban's last regime. I don't pretend that these accomplishments are enough to justify the cost to Australians. But I think of Afghan girls, perhaps of the same age as my daughters, who, after the chance to taste just a little freedom, not much, mind you, but just a little, to have the right to be seen, to learn, to be heard, to hope that one day they might live in safety at home and in public, now face the real prospect of life under the extreme repression of the Taliban. And my heart breaks for them. But I know that the seed our veterans have planted in the hearts and minds of so many girls and boys, men and women, 
who do not subscribe to the extremist ideology of repression and cruelty, now have the chance to grow in a way that is sustainable, a nation that does reflect the values we have helped shape. And when that happens, it will be sustainable. It will be owned by the people who deliver it, and it will be more enthusiastically defended than any regime we might try to establish from afar. It is my sincere prayer that this seed grows into the strongest of trees, bearing the fruit of prosperity, of freedom, of education and of hope. And in this time of crisis, the Australian government takes the compassionate approach you would expect. We are facilitating the exit of Australians as well as those who worked with coalition forces because we must do the right thing by those who trusted us on the ground. Since 2013, 8,500 Afghans have been resettled in Australia on humanitarian grounds. 3,000 of the places in our humanitarian program this year will be allocated to Afghans. Australia consistently provides one of the world's most generous humanitarian programs. And it is in times like these that the elements of it that can seem strict at times pay dividends because it allows us to provide more help to those in dire circumstances like those we have seen in recent times when we have policies in place that otherwise ensure the people smuggling of economic migrants is not rewarded. Since 2013, over 1,800 Afghan locally employed engaged employees and their families have been granted visas. Since the 15th of April this year, over 570 people in Afghanistan have been granted a visa under the Afghan Locally Engaged Employee Program, including family members. I know Minister Hawke and Minister Payne in particular are working around the clock to do the right thing by those people who did the right thing by us. And I know that they are working diligently with each and every person like me who bring to them cases of individuals in desperation, and so I commend their sincere and diligent work. Afghanis have now glimpsed the health, education and prosperity that are the product of peace and freedom, that are the product of the rejection of extremist ideology. It is now up to the people of Afghanistan to take the lessons of the last 20 years and use them to build for themselves a stable, functional and fair government of their own. Thank you, Senator Stoker. Now we will try Senator Rice again remotely. Thanks. Senator Rice, you have the call. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. A tragedy. I think a tragedy is the word, the only word, the appalling tragedy that is going on in Afghanistan that we are focused on today. People around the world, including Australians, are shocked, upset, heartbroken, and want to know that how it has come to this, that after 20 years of war, that the Taliban are back in control, and that their brutal regime that the world had hoped was de defeated 20 years ago is back. And we need to reflect on the lives that have been lost, the suffering, the tens of thousands of Afghan people, the 41 Australian Defence Force personnel, so much suffering, so much sacrifice, and it's come to this. And make no doubt about it, the Taliban is back, the newer, softer Taliban, the Taliban who do media conferences, is a lie. We have already heard enough credible reports to know that. The credible reports of them going house to house, executing Hazara people on the spot, telling us that the rights of women will be subject to Sharia law. The reports of 10 and 12 year old girls being married off to soldiers. We have seen the footage of brutality of Taliban fighters patrolling outside the airport, bashing people with rifle butts. I heard a direct account myself of people in that maelstrom and that crowd at the airport over the weekend 
of one person that I was following and engaged with being bashed by a rifle butt, being pushed by Taliban fighters into razor wire, having his being thrown to the ground, his glasses broken. We know of people who have been evicted from their houses, people living in fear of their, and terror of their lives. Hazara people and others knowing that they are at extreme risk of death just because of who they are. So my office, along with other officers, have been inundated with people, Australians and from people around the world, who are so fearful for the safety of their loved ones, their families, their friends, their colleagues in Afghanistan, and been inundated by the emails and phone messages from thousands of Australians who want our government to be doing more. My staff, our staff of our Greens officers, I know the staff in other MPs offices, so many of us as members of parliament, so many public servants have worked incredibly long hours over the last week and the weekend supporting people, helping them to work out what can we do, work out what to do advocating to the Department of Home Affairs, advocating to DFAT, advocating through ministerial offices to have visas, applications expedited and, to be, and for people to be able to be evacuated. Many of the people on the lists that our Greens officers have been, uh, have been put, put together, they're partners of Australian permanent residents or immediate family members of Australians. Some have had visa applications in to come to Australia for up to two years. People who should have been able to come to Australia long before now. Others are human rights campaigners, women's rights campaigners, democracy campaigners, journalists and targeted people, especially Hazara people and other ethnic and religious minorities. They are people who have worked with our government, have worked with NGOs, they've worked in the field with our defence forces as interpreters, as support workers, as aid workers. And over the last weekend, over 20 of the people who our Greens officers had been directly engaged with and were supporting, it is such a relief. They managed to get through the gauntlet of the massive crowds outside Hamid Karzai Airport. They managed to survive the Taliban attacks on people outside the airport. They managed to get on the lists for, for people to be evacuated and they were approved for travel to Australia and are now on their way to start new lives here. Okay. I personally spent the weekend following the progress of a group of 11 people of these folk who had been brought to my attention by a friend, an Australian friend who had been working on an aid project in mazar e sharif in the north of Afghanistan since the beginning of the year. She managed to get out of Afghanistan herself, fleeing in a very dangerous journey just over a month ago. And these people were people that she had worked with, who she knew, who she knew were at extreme risk. And she had worked She's worked over the last, few, last week to put in visa applications for humanitarian visas for these people to Australia. This group of 11 people were typical of the people at risk, at risk in Afghanistan and typical of the people in that crowd of tens of thousands of people out, outside the airport. Uh, Hazara people and other targeted ethnic minorities, people who would be ex at extreme risk of execution by the Taliban. They're human rights and democracy activists, people who have worked with foreign governments and NGOs. They included a family with a four-year-old and a four-month-old. They included a 23-year-old woman who had the audacity to be training to be a pilot. She was one of only 40 out of 1,000 pilots in the Afghan Defence Forces who did not want to have her future determined by the brutal repression of women that the Taliban will be imposing. That is, if she had even survived. This group had direct experience of the brutality of the Taliban some with personal experience from 20 years ago of the massacres of the Taliban, the public executions by stoning, the whippings, the dismembered hands hanging from a tree in the centre of a roundabout, the harassment and the abuse of women. This group that I was focused on over the weekend were just a drop in the ocean of the people seeking to flee. In my mind, 
I spent all weekend in Kabul with them. In my mind, I was there with the tens of thousands of people in this maelstrom of humanity outside the airport, and every one of whom was there because they were in fear of their lives under the Taliban. This group that I was following spent all of Saturday and Sunday in the awful crowds outside the airport gate. It was 40 degrees. There was no shade. There was no room to even sit down. And I could not bear to think of a four-year-old and a four-month-old in those conditions. But they had no option. If they stayed behind, the threat of death was just so real. I want to thank the engagement of Ministers Payne and Hawke and their officers over the weekend on all the cases that our officers had brought to their attention during this last week. And in particular, I do want to thank them for what is a very um, heartfelt and wonderful outcome for this group of 11 people. At 2 a.m. last night, eight o'clock their time, I got word that this group of 11 that I'd been following had been permitted to enter the airport and were now waiting for emergency visas to be issued and to be evacuated to Australia to begin new lives. And I'm still crying tears of joy and amazement that they are now safe. I think of four-year-old Daniel and four-month-old Diana beginning their journey to Australia, beginning their quintessential multicultural Australian journey growing up as Australians in that tradition that our nation has been built on. Every one of the 450 people who Australia has evacuated so far has a powerful story to tell. But so do thousands and thousands and thousands more. We need to be doing more. We need to be accepting more than the 3,000 people that our government has committed to. Uh, and 3,000 people at that that are only being accepted as part of our existing refugee quota. And having only settled 8,500 people since 2013 since Af in, in, from Afghanistan is not a number that I would be proud of. And our government should be hanging their heads in shame at their record of locking people up indefinitely. People like these people that we are now evacuating to Australia people who have been locked up indefinitely just for pursuing their right under international law for fleeing persecution. Australia should be committed to resettling at least 20,000 people following the lead of Canada and the UK. The 4,500 people on temporary visas here in Australia must be given permanent protection so they can fully settle down and establish their roots and know that Australia really values them and wants them to stay. We need to be continuing the work on fast-tracking visas of the people who are so desperate to leave. And we need, need to be increasing aid support, particularly through civil society organisations, to be helping the people who are suffering so much already and are going to continue to suffer with the Taliban in control. It's the least that we can be doing. I mean, the future in Afghanistan looks bleak for the foreseeable future. Our 20 years of war has not created an ongoing peace. Part B of this motion says that we are fighting terrorism, promoting freedom and seeking to support the people of Afghanistan. We might have thought that, that, that we were doing that during this longest war, but it hasn't turned out that well, has it? We must ask ourselves, what has gone wrong? Why has it come to this that the Taliban are now back again in control? What else, was there anything else that we could have done? instead of a colonial war imposed upon the people of Afghanistan and supporting warlords, turning a blind eye to corruption. This longest war that 45, 41 Australians have died in, have sacrificed their lives, which tens of thousands of Afghans have died in, and hundreds of thousands, millions more people impacted by trauma and loss. I send our ongoing sympathies to everyone, all those people affected by people who have lost their lives, all those people impacted, and hope that their lives have not been lost in vain. The least we can do in the circumstances is to provide a safe haven for people now. We should have been getting many more people out well before now. So 20,000 people to be resettled in Australia is very reasonable in the circumstances. And we should learn from the war of the last 20 years and change the way that we act in the world and develop and implement 
policies so that human rights are at the centre of our foreign policy and our defence policy. We need policies and actions in the world that have equal participation of women. We must insist on that, of diverse peoples across all hierarchies in all institutions, in our, from ministries to embassies and implementing partners. We need to be supporting political processes to ensure equal influence of the politically marginalised and actively support civil society actors promoting gender equality and the rights of political minorities. Yes, there has been progress made in Afghanistan over the last 20 years, but there is so much more that we could have been doing and should have been doing to make sure that those achievements were lasting. And we need to acknowledge that on the continuing colonial legacies within foreign affairs and actively work to overcome them. And we should be championing cooperation over domination, partnerships and inclusion over domination and exclusion, and emphasising the shared communalities of human beings across the globe. As we reflect, we reflect today on the tragedy in Afghanistan, we have to realise that we, we can do better and we must. And for the sake of the people that have suffered over the last 20 years, who have sacrificed their lives, the sake of the people who are suffering at the moment in Afghanistan, the sake of the people who are going to have a very difficult time in the, the ongoing months, years, who knows how long, we have to do better. We can do better and we must. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Ayres. Uh, thanks, um, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, all Australians are watching the events unfolding in Afghanistan very closely. Uh, they are indeed very distressing. Our veterans community are watching closely, reflecting upon their own experience, their own sacrifices and the sacrifice of others that they served with. 29,000 Australians served in Afghanistan in military roles over our longest conflict. Many thousands more served in our diplomatic corps, worked for contractors or aid organisations and in the media organisations that reported on the war. They will all be watching this intensely closely. Members of the Afghan Australian community watch anxiously too, those who are citizens now and those who desperately want to be. Afghans have made a contribution to Australia for over 150 years. The graves of Afghan Kamalis and their places of worship are spread all across the Australian outback. Tens of thousands of Afghan troops and indeed civilians died in this bitter conflict since 2001. The focus today is of course on the chaotic, terrible scenes at Kabul airport. Tens of thousands of Afghans and some Australian citizens desperate to escape. My thoughts today, like all Australians, are with them and with the Australian troops and those men and women of the Royal Australian Air Force who have been deployed to effect our rescue for Australians and locals who worked with and for us. With and for us and for a modern Afghanistan, safe, democratic and decent. And it's clear that Prime Minister Morrison has left this effort far, far too late. For years, veterans have raised publicly and privately and increasingly loudly the absolute moral imperative to act to rescue and return to Australia Afghans who worked with us. For months since the closure of the Australian Embassy in Kabul, it has been clear that this task requires urgency and application. As much urgency and application from the government as was required for the original decision to commit Australian troops uh, to this important venture. And it's not just a moral imperative, it is a national interest imperative. Not just a moral imperative, a national interest imperative to get this right and to do it in a timely, uh, urgent and effective way. Uh, and the Morrison government has had months. I can't think of many meetings that I've had with members of the veterans community or members of veterans families where this issue 
hasn't been raised squarely, primarily, often setting aside their own direct interests. It's crucial to how Australia and Australians are regarded in the world, whether we're trusted as partners and friends, that we follow through and deliver for those Australians and the Afghan men and women to whom we owe that duty. Yet month after month, the Prime Minister, the Defence Minister, the Foreign Minister, the Minister for Home Affairs, all frozen in inaction. These failures by the Prime Minister, sadly, reflect on all Australians. Every person removed safely in the months preceding the fall of Kabul would have been one less to extract in, this, in the last few days of this unfolding crisis. And the situation at Kabul airport is becoming increasingly dangerous. Mr Sullivan, President Biden's national security advisor, said yesterday that there is an acute threat from ISIS detachments in the near vicinity of the airport. Here in Australia, we can but watch and hope that Australian professionalism and grit, planning and good fortune are enough to see all of our troops and aviators, staff and contractors, return safe to our shores. Of course, these events mean that we must defer a post-mortem analysis of our longest war. It's certainly true that coalition action, of which Australia was an important part, denied Al-Qaeda a safe base to launch acts of terrorism and war across the globe. It is also true that Afghans themselves stepped up women who went to work, girls who went to school for the first time, men and women who stepped forward to work for a better Afghanistan, democratic, free, well-governed and more equal. And of course, we wonder what is it that's going to happen to them? Of course, it's so distressing to see so much of that so brutally swept away. Most distressing for those who fought uh, and for their comrades, family and friends of those who were killed, those who were injured and those who have died in the years since uh, their service concluded. But of all, all of us must stand with them. And all of us, of course, worry deeply about the girls who have gone to school, the women who have stood up for the country that Afghanistan may become. Of course, Afghanistan is a place that has seen so much suffering, hundreds of years of imperial invasion and conquest, brutality and subjugation. Most recently, the brutal conflicts during the Cold War, fought between proxies of the major powers, followed by a period of brutal Taliban dictatorship. That's meant that the people of Afghanistan have had no real prospect of the peace and the prosperity that all of us take for granted. The post-mortem can come later. Today, we watch the evacuation effort, pray for their safe return, and honour the courage and service of all those Australians who served. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Wish Wilson. You might have to log out and log back in, Senator Wish Wilson. And in the meantime, we'll go to Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And uh, I just rise today briefly to acknowledge the people of Afghanistan as they're faced with the return of the Taliban. As the clock looks like it's about to turn back in time, particularly with regards to the women and children and the dreadful treatment that was inflicted by them, the treatment that was inflicted upon so many Afghani people and unfortunately looks set to recommence. But I really wanted to particularly speak to our troops, the men and women who served over the past 20 years whilst the war has raged. And it's thanks to these incredibly brave men and women that Afghanistan now has a generation of women who have been allowed to flourish, to be educated, to pursue careers and to live in relative freedom. 
and it's because of the work that you did. A generation of children weren't abused nor subjugated to child marriage. Young girls were allowed to attend school. They weren't hidden under a burqa, nor married off in their teen years or, in some dreadful circumstances, even younger. To the 41 Australians who made the ultimate sacrifice in serving your country, our deepest thoughts and gratitude goes to you and your families. You will never be forgotten. I also wanted to take the chance to acknowledge some of my friends that served, who did multiple tours, and who I know are amongst so many of the 39,000 Australians who served that are feeling particularly vulnerable at the moment. To my friend who served for nine months in Afghanistan, who got off the plane, no one there to greet him, no one to shake his hand, no one to thank him for his service, for him to walk out of the airport and get in a cab to go home. To those who recently returned, who've done multiple tours over not only to Afghanistan but to other theatres in the Middle East, who were too junior to really influence strategy but had enough experience on the ground over those 20 years to see where some of the strategic failures were playing out. To those who experienced a decline in mental health some to the point that it made them consider suicide, and unfortunately, with far too many having successful attempts. Please know that all of you are seen, that you're appreciated, and all Australians, we are proud of you and thank you for your service. Your efforts were not in vain, and as I said earlier, you have influenced and saved a generation of Ghanis who will never forget your help. To with you, with me, soldier on, the Veterans Support Force, amongst other organisations, thank you for your continuing efforts. All of those organisations are led by people who not only know firsthand what it means to serve but also the challenges of re-entry into civilian life. So to all Australians who've served and to those who are continuing to serve, thank you for your service. Hold your head up high and be proud of what you achieved. Thank you. Senator Wish Wilson. I'm sorry, we can't hear you, Senator Wish Wilson. You will have to log out and log back in. Tw uh, you've done it twice. I'm sorry, Senator Wish Wilson, I, I can't assist you any further. I just would say that maybe three times is lucky or a charm, but um, while we're waiting, we will go to Senator Kitching. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I would like to contribute to the motion from Senator Patton this afternoon. It's now nearly 20 years since the US-led intervention in Afghanistan that followed the 11th of September 2001 attacks on the United States. Having been to Ground Zero on Christmas night that year and watching and speaking to people who had lost loved ones in that terrible day, who wandered aimlessly that Christmas night next to the safety fencing around the Twin Towers site, seeking closeness at Christmas, except of course their loved one was no longer here. By an act of evil, they had been killed. So the coalitions of, of democracies went in to prevent the Taliban from continuing to protect and shelter those terrorists. That intervention overthrew the oppressive Taliban regime and gave the people of, Af of Afghanistan, at least in theory, the possibility of democratic government, expanding human rights, particularly for women, and social and economic progress. And today, as we stand in this place, or remotely, and talk to this motion, it is with great despair 
and with great sadness that the Taliban regime is back in control in Afghanistan. Since 2001, more than $2 trillion has been spent on military operations and on economic aid to Afghanistan. 20 years of intermittent warfare have taken an estimated 250,000 lives. 2,353 US military personnel perished, 41 members of the Australian Defence Force, and we will never forget their sacrifice and we will always honour them. And 66,000 Afghan military personnel also died trying to create a safer country for their children and for that next generation. This, however, is not the whole story. There is also a much more positive story to tell about the past 20 years in Afghanistan. And here, it is important for us to remember that Australia was a force for good in Afghanistan. We are all thinking of the 39,000 men and women of the Australian Defence Force and what they contributed and what they sacrificed. Indeed, there are many in this place and the other place who have served our country in the Defence Force and continue to serve in the Parliament. During our engagement, Afghanistan saw the most sustained period of economic and social progress in its entire history. In fact, this has been the only sustained period of economic and social progress in the country's history. Almost two thirds of Afghanistan's people are aged under 25. They are the best educated generation in the country's history, particularly those among the rapidly growing urban population. Most of them have little to no memory of the Taliban years, but they know from their families' histories how much worse, how much more fearful life was for everyone, particularly young people, and especially young, wom young women at that time. There seem to be green shoots of at least a view from young people today in Afghanistan who do not wish to live under the restrictions of Taliban rule, who do not wish to have liberties which have become normal for them over the last decades removed from them. And of course, there are now those in the Panjshir Valley. Countries like ours have responsibility to deal with the situation that has arisen in Afghanistan. The best way we can fulfil that obligation right now, as the situation on the ground in Afghanistan continues to deteriorate, is to help expatriate those who worked with our defence forces, diplomatic community, aid organisations, as well as their families, and those who supported our efforts in Afghanistan over the last 20 years. Many are now in immediate danger. Of course, this should be done with consideration to the existing security and immigration vetting processes that are in place. No reasonable person is suggesting otherwise. And I note that many of these efforts are currently underway and that we have already evacuated hundreds of individuals out of Afghanistan. I keep looking at the photographs from Kabul airport. I've arrived and departed through both the military and the civilian sides of that airport. It is unrecognisable. With the tired, the poor, the huddled masses yearning to breathe free, with young soldiers trying to give water, shelter, indeed humanity in this dire situation. And this is why we have an obligation to the people of Afghanistan, to those whose faces are filled with desperation, pressed up against the walls at Kabul airport. And for each one of them, we know there are many more who are hiding at home because we have held out the normal freedoms of our country and we cannot now yank that hand back it would be dishonourable. These people risked their lives to assist us and work with us, and it would be a national disgrace if we were to abandon them now to the terrifying revenge of their enemies. Even worse, it would be a failure of the democratic countries if we just sidled out into the night. I'd like to thank the government ministers, their officers and departments who have been working around the clock on this. I would like to thank them personally. I also thank my colleagues who have been making representations on behalf of many in Afghanistan. Normally, when someone in a leadership position makes a commitment, one takes them at their word. And the Taliban has guaranteed that they would give safe passage to civilians who want to leave. The international community will be watching closely and will hold them to that commitment. Their own Pashtun Wali should also. In addition to this, Helping the Afghan people will take many different forms. 
We should work with the UN agencies, with the United States, the European Britain and India, and with international aid organisations, all of which have long histories of involvement in Afghanistan, to provide funds and resources to Afghan civil society, particularly to women and children's organisations. We should continue to work with and keep looking for those elements of the Afghan state which seem most likely to uphold human rights and resist a return to the past. In William Dalrymple's definitive history, Return of a King, about the first Anglo-Afghan war in the mid-1800s, Mirza Atta Muhammad, a very witty and clever writer of the period, quotes a Persian proverb, those once bitten by a snake fear even a twisted rope. We should reflect upon those words over the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Wish Wilson. Right. Can you hear me now, Deputy oh, President? Oh, yes, Senator Wish Wilson. Please go you ahead. You were spot on. Third, third time lucky for me. Thank you. Um, Deputy President, the, the Greens have been calling for the withdrawal of Australian forces from Afghanistan for at least the past decade. And even we were shocked and appalled at the catastrophe that has unfolded at Kabul in the past four days. I was just watching uh, some earlier footage uh, from 2012-2013 estimates of my uh, previous Senate colleague, uh, Scott Ludlam. Uh, going back to 2011, initiating debates in this place, in the Senate, asking questions, why were our forces still in Afghanistan? This following the apprehension of Osama bin Laden, the disruption of the Al-Qaeda network, the original intention of going into Afghanistan, which I note uh, on record the Greens originally supported. Senator Ludlam asked what was the withdrawal plan? What was the strategic imperative to have our forces remaining in Afghanistan? All the way through to his time in the Senate, himself, Christine Milne, Bob Brown, indeed many of us, uh, including all my colleagues who have spoken here tonight, have been asking the question, when is Australia going to withdraw from this seemingly endless conflict? We have been repeatedly lied to over many, many years by many politicians acting deputy president. It was nearly 150 years ago that military strategist, Russian aristocrat von Clausewitz wrote his treatise on war. And in that treatise, one of the most famous passages to come from that treatise was that war is simply a continuation of politics by different means. I opposed the Iraq war acting deputy president. I've never felt something as strong as I did back then. I never felt the sense of foreboding that I did back then that what we were doing was wrong. And I opposed that because I could see the politics, the corrupted, the self-interested, the shallow, the dangerous politics of that war. And it's interesting to note that many experts have said that one of the key reasons that we failed in Afghanistan was because of the illegal and unilateral invasion of Iraq, fighting a war on two fronts. But the answer is a lot simpler than that, in my point of view. Afghanistan was always going to be a failure because of politics. Politics reflects the national interest. And what we've seen with the withdrawal from Afghanistan and the way it's been conducted in recent weeks that has shocked the world is politics. The US are doing what is in their national and political interest. And here I come to the, a very important point, Acting Deputy President. When the Prime Minister was asked in Insiders on the weekend what he knew about the shambolic and appalling chaos unfolding in Kabul, it was pretty clear he didn't know much. He made it very clear we were there to support our allies in the US. 
that we receive our advice from our allies in the US, just like we did when we followed them into this war and into, into Iraq and many, many years ago into Vietnam. And I raise that because Vietnam has been drawn into this uh, messaging and frame in the media in recent days, how we could possibly have repeated the same mistakes of history as we did back in Vietnam. And I note Mr Malcolm Fraser, one of the last true Liberals in this country, putting politics aside and urging the Australian Parliament to put politics aside and immediately take a significant humanitarian intake of refugees into this country. Many of those refugees I grew up with as a young boy in this country. My dad was a Vietnam vet and Australians felt very strongly that we should honour the Vietnamese and look after them. And likewise, today, tonight, this week, Australians feel equally as strongly that we should honour those and protect those that have supported us, regardless of whether you agree or disagree with Australia's continuing participation in this war in the last 10 years. What we have seen unfolding in Kabul is either a massive intelligence failure, a massive intelligence failure that has led to the Taliban controlling all the arms that have been left on the ground in Kabul, the billions of dollars worth of weapons that they now have, how they, the Afghan army, how unprepared they were for this contingency or unwilling to fight. So many questions we need answered, we need to get to the bottom of. Not just so that we make sure this kind of catastrophe isn't repeated in history, but as been pointed out so poignantly in this debate tonight by so many senators, because of the veterans in Australia and their families, for those who have died, for them, so that they don't feel that their, sac their sacrifice and their time was a waste of time. I wanted to raise two important points that we need to be thinking about as a nation acting deputy president. The first is, this is all the advertisement this country needs to consider war powers reform. And I know my colleague, uh, Senator Stilljohn, will talk about this shortly, so I won't go into that in much more detail. But while we leave the decision making in the hands of a few people, go back to Von Clausewitz, in the hands of politics and the politics of a few, without scrutiny, without debate, we will continue to go into these wars and we will continue to lose the lives of young Australians and we will continue to fail to meet the objectives of these conflicts. I actually question what the objective of this conflict was. It's interesting that Mr Barnaby Joyce, when asked in question time uh, in the other place today, said that we went into Afghanistan because of the Bali bombings and because of the bombing of the Marriott Hotel in Jakarta. Well, Mr Joyce didn't do his homework very well, did he? Those bombings occurred well after we went into Afghanistan and after we went into Iraq. And many of us pointed out that these wars would not destroy or beat terrorism. Indeed, it would make it worse. It would make Australia an enemy. While our national interest was coupled to the US national interest, we would become a target. Indeed, I think there's plenty of evidence that that is correct. So this invasion of Afghanistan, this occupation of Afghanistan has failed to counter global terrorism. And indeed, I believe it's made it worse. Many of us raised those issues, as by the way did many, many experts on this subject to put the politics aside. Which leads me to the second point I would like to make very strongly. This was the first time that the ANZUS Treaty was invoked by our Prime Minister to take Australian troops off to Afghanistan. We now, to use the terms of Ma the words of Malcolm Fraser, who wrote about this just months before he died, we now need to revisit that treaty after all these years. We need to question 
whether that treaty is built for purpose for this age. We need to question whether Australia's interests are always the same as that of the US. I would argue very passionately and very strongly that that not, is not always the case. Indeed, we need to forge our own foreign policy and determine what is in our national interest. And that should be this parliament, not a few politicians who are making this up as they go along. If we continue to make these mistakes, our Kitty Dead President, we will continue to put future generations of this country at risk. And I've got to say, it has appalled me in recent days to see our Prime Minister fronting the cameras. We saw a bit of it on show today in Senate Question Time from Minister Payne and others. Trying to turn this amazing effort by our military, this evacuation, trying to turn it into some kind of victory at the end of a very shameful and very dark chapter for this country. 20 years of occupation of a foreign country, for what purpose very few people could ever ascertain. For what purpose we were never really told, except for platitudes about why we were there and how it was honourable to fight under the flag. Well, I've also worked very closely over years with our veterans. The Greens initiated the first inquiry into veteran homelessness and suicide and PTSD in 2015. And the reason we did that, Acting Deputy President, was because we knew there's a cost to war. And it's not just the fact that we lost 41 Australians that didn't need to die in this conflict, but we've had families who still suffer to this day. But many veterans also came home with other wounds, deep wounds, psychological wounds that will never heal. And the same applies to their families. We wanted that inquiry to help veterans, but we also wanted this country to understand the price, the cost of war, the cost of politicians making decisions that put other lives and Australian lives in harm's way. We expect a lot from our Australian Defence Forces. I've been a member of that uh, institution myself, as has my father and many of my friends, including many who fought in Afghanistan over many years. And I can say today, uh, Acting Deputy President, I'm not going to stand by and watch Scotty from Marketing, our Prime Minister, try and spin this into a new marketing win for his government. While this catastrophe unfolds, I will thank, however, the Australian Defence personnel that are doing a magnificent job and the staff at DFAC and all the many officials out there that are working as hard as they possibly can to try and bring these people to Australia or to elsewhere. And for that, I thank them. That is what our priority should be now. That is why we're having this debate today. But soon, we need to have an honest appraisal of not just what went wrong at the end of this conflict, but why we were there for so long and what purpose it was meant to achieve. But most importantly, how we can avoid this ever, ever happening again. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Bush Wilson. Senator Steele John. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. What is unfolding right now in Afghanistan is a humanitarian crisis that requires an urgent response. The Greens and the community are united in calling for a concrete set of tangible actions to be taken by the Australian government to support the people of Afghanistan, uh, to show solidarity with them in this terrible moment uh, of disaster and fear, and to support those Afghanis uh, living here in Australia. The Greens and the community are calling for an immediate allocation of 20,000 uh, additional humanitarian visas to be granted uh, so that those uh, in danger can come to safety. And we are calling together with the community uh, for the immediate conversion of temporary protection and shared visas to permanent visas uh, so that those here in Australia are 
uh, relieved from this constant state of limbo in which they have been forced to live uh, by governments of all persuasions. Uh, we are calling for the immediate uh, return of all Afghan uh, refugees and asylum seekers from offshore detention uh, to be processed here in the community and granted uh, permanent visas. Uh, we are additionally calling for humanitarian assistance uh, to the internally displaced peoples uh, who are now fleeing uh, what seems to be a rapidly unraveling civil war within the nation. We are doing all of these things at the urging of the community and are proud to be alongside them in solidarity and support uh, in this very difficult time. It was an honor and a privilege to be able to gather with the community uh, yesterday in WA at the same time as communities rallied across Australia um, to show their support for the people of Afghanistan in this moment. And there was a very clear message uh, for everybody who attended uh, that the community here in Australia and community members across the country demand that the major parties, that the government, as its state governments, do all that they can to support Afghanistan, to support its people, uh, to maintain rights and justice, uh, and to use all the levers that Australia has uh, to make sure uh, that those human rights are upheld in Afghanistan. It is so important uh, that Australia use its position in the world to make sure that any government that forms in Afghanistan is one which upholds the rights of women and girls, one which upholds the rights of children, and one which guarantees the human rights of ethnic minorities, whether they be Hazara, whether they be Pashtun, whether they be Turgic, or whether they be Uzbek all human rights in Afghanistan must be upheld. These are the urgent concrete actions which must be taken now, in addition to the continuation of evacuations of those on the ground in Afghanistan so that they are able to be brought to safety and that no one is left behind. As we take these urgent and concrete steps, it is also vitally important that the major parties, that prime ministers, that foreign ministers past and present reflect upon how Australia and Afghanistan ended up in this moment. There must be a full and honest reflection upon what has happened here. The crisis in Afghanistan, the return of the Taliban, is the latest in a, sim in a series of failed experiments in wars of overseas violent intervention, participated in by Australia alongside the United States. From Vietnam to Iraq and now Afghanistan, Australia has repeatedly followed the United States into wars of aggression, with the result that many of our service personnel have died, many more have been wounded, and hundreds of thousands of civilian lives have been lost in those nations, if not millions more. There is an urgent need to recognize and to reckon with the reality that during the 20 years that our armed forces personnel uh, were on country uh, in Australia, there are credible allegations that there were many instances of war crimes committed by service personnel in that country. And we must reflect not only on the importance of holding individuals to account, but to also hold the chain of command to account, to hold the strategists to account, and to hold the political leaders to account who left our presence and our forces in Afghanistan to so dangerously drift without any discernible purpose into a context where some of the most heinous violations of the laws of war are now alleged to have taken place. We must reflect also on the urgent need 
to consider whether there would have been and would be in the future ways that we are able to promote human rights globally that do not involve doing so at the end of a gun. And that if ever the people of Australia are called upon to take up arms or to deploy overseas, that that only occurs after a vote of this parliament. No Australian service personnel member should be asked to put their lives on the line for a cause for which no MP has been prepared to vote. All of these things must be done urgently to support community and to translate the very fine and comforting words that are so easily now spoken by members of the major parties into concrete actions. We cannot have a situation where debates are held in the Senate or in the House of Representatives, where members give contributions singing the praises of armed forces personnel, committing Australia to supporting the people of Afghanistan, while there is also a failure to translate those words into those contract, concrete actions for which the community are calling. And I say again, there must be 20,000 humanitarian visa places issued uh, specifically for those from Afghanistan. There must be the conversion of temporary protection visas and SHIV visas to permanent uh, visa status so that healthcare, education and supports can be accessed. There must be the continuation of evacuations for those who supported uh, the Australian mission in Afghanistan and also for those who are additionally at risk, uh, for the journalists, for the academics, uh, for the MPs, for the activists that are now at risk um, from the Taliban. And there must be um, a, a use of our position in the world uh, to ensure that any government which forms in Afghanistan is one which upholds the rights of women, children, girls, and ethnic uh, minorities. All this must be done uh, out of recognition that the moment that Afghanistan now finds itself in is a moment to which Australia has contributed. We are not passive actors in this crisis. There was a decision made by the political leadership of this country to follow the United States into that conflict, into this war, which has claimed so many Afghani, Hazara, Pashtun, Uzbek and Turgic lives that has claimed so many lives of our Defence Force pers personnel that have wounded so many. Those were political decisions that were made by Australian political leaders. And those leaders must now take those concrete actions, live up to their obligations, and leave no one behind. I thank the Chamber for its time. Uh, thank you, Senator Steelejohn. Senator Ferranti wells I'm sorry, we can't hear you. If you can check your mute, you might have to log out. Connie, you'll have to shut down and open up again, mate. It's, yeah, you might it's the same thing that's getting all you, of us. Thank you, Senator Steelejohn. Um, but you might have to log out and uh, re-log in. And in the meantime, we will go to Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you. Have you got me? Yes, I have. Please commence. Like so many of my fellow South Australians, I have struggled to process the images coming out of Afghanistan. Images of desperation, of fear, of helplessness. People clinging to the outside of a departing aircraft. People for whom we know that extremely perilous action represents a better option than staying behind. The crush of people in Kabul airport, desperate for safe passage to a safer future. And the most haunting of images, those of children. Little boys and girls clutching to their parents. Looks of grief and confusion on their faces. Adult emotions that should never find their way into the hearts of children. 
And of course, these images only tell one part of the story, the story we can see. These are devastating scenes. This is devastating for the Afghan people. It is devastating for the Australians who remain there. It is devastating for those who worked with us over many years who are yet to escape, who fear what awaits them if they are left behind. And it is certainly devastating for our veteran community, those who served and sacrificed and the families who loved them. Today, I want to associate myself with the remarks made by Senator Wong on behalf of the Australian Labor Party and the remarks made by the Leader of the Opposition in the other place. Importantly, on behalf of the people of South Australia, who I represent, I want to express our solidarity with the Afghan Australian community in our state, with their friends, family and loved ones who are deeply traumatised by these events. Much will be said over the days, weeks, months and years ahead about the decisions taken that have led to the scenes we are seeing in Afghanistan. There is much to reflect on, including about what this means for human rights, for women and girls especially, for democracy and also for our own national security for the world. But today, as we watch this crisis unfold in real time, I will say this. The Australian government must do absolutely everything in its power to ensure that every friend of Australia who supported us in Afghanistan can get out safely. They must ensure that the Australians left behind can get home. And they must respond compassionately and generously to those who need a safe, permanent home. The interagency team on the ground in Kabul has an incredibly difficult task before it. A task made harder because of the decisions and the delays of this government. We are grateful for the work of this team so far, and we are watching your efforts anxiously. I know the people of my state of South Australia would support me in saying, we stand by our friends in Afghanistan. We stand by those who helped Australians. We stand by our fellow citizens, by friends, family and loved ones still there. We stand by our veteran community and the families who love them. And we honour all of those who made the greatest sacrifice, the 41 Australians fallen. Thank you. Senator Ferranti-Wells. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you. I note the comments made by the minister. We honour the service of our ADF in Afga Afghanistan and most especially those who gave their lives in defence of the values of freedom. Regrettably, the circumstances surrounding our departure raise legitimate concerns about the rationale behind decisions taken that have led to the present extraordinary policy and military failure. As I have repeatedly stated, we had a moral obligation to assist locally engaged Afghanis who provided vital support over the years to the ADF and DFAT. This is what DFAT told senators in questioning at estimates in May. What I don't understand is that US forces and our forces were withdrawn before the mission of extricating civilians was completed. Now we've had to redeploy ADF forces to assist the security situation at Kabul airport, noting that the US has had to redeploy thousands of Marines as well. In that regard, we seem to have put the cart before the horse. As John Howard stated in The Australian on 15 July, we have a moral obligation to provide asylum. Their fate must not be decided by narrow legalism. It was a moral obligation uh, that we shamefully discarded many years ago when we pulled out of Vietnam. And I do not want to see a repetition of that failure in relation to Afghanistan, Mr Howard told SBS. Further in this regard, Mr Howard made some very clear comments on 18 August on the 7.30 report. He said that there was an overwhelming belief in 2001 that Western intervention following the September 11 attacks was the right course of action. And he did make the point that there is no evidence of a major terrorist attack that has been orchestrated out of Afghanistan since the invasion. A few days ago, we saw the Taliban press conference. 
Notably, a heading uh, in the Sydney Morning Herald on 18 August stated, they're all smiles now, but what happens next? We know what will happen next. The Taliban will revert to the oppressive regime we know from the past. The reports of brutality of its militants in the different regions of Afghanistan speaks to the brutality of a regime that after 20 years has seen little change. On the same day the Taliban leadership was vowing to honour women's rights, reports emerged that a woman was allegedly killed for not wearing a burqa. The Taliban promises safe passage to Kabul airport for Afghanis trying to flee the country. Yet women and children are being beaten and whipped as they try to pass through checkpoints set up by militants. We also see we will also see a change in the global geopolitical situation. The enemies of the West, most particularly China and Russia, will be emboldened. Already China is sabre rattling in relation to Taiwan. I note the minister's comments that combating terrorism just got harder. I agree with her. Given the sheer volume of military equipment which the United States abandoned with their premature extraction from Afghanistan, this was not the plan that Donald Trump had negotiated for the withdrawal. The opportunity and the opportunities for extracting civilians now are very limited and much more dangerous. Sadly, we failed to abide by the maxim, hope for the best and plan for the worst. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Furavanti wells Senator Faruqi, remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to make my contribution to the motion, and my heart goes out to the Afghan people who are at the moment suffering the harrowing, horrific and tragic consequences of war and have been for decades. So let's not try and obliterate this reality. The truth is Australia failed the people of Afghanistan by waging a war on them with our so-called Western allies. And it's failing Afghans today. Mr. Morrison, you have left ADF interpreters and their families in extreme danger. You've offered a paltry 3,000 visas for the existing allocation, from the existing allocation and you have the audacity to say you wish things were different. There are tens of thousands in Afghanistan at risk and desperately seeking to flee to safety. There are thousands in Australia waiting to be granted permanent visas. What a terrible show of apathy and inaction from this government. We know you had months of warning to evacuate people from Afghanistan, and yet you did nothing. For 20 years, Afghans were subjected to an imperialist war waged in the name of curbing terrorism. They lived under the direct and violent occupation of Western military forces and warlords propped up by the United States. Allied forces dropped bombs on children, on farmers and wedding parties. They've been killed in crossfire by improvised explosive devices and there have been assassinations. We will never know the full toll of this 20 year invasion, but we do know that thousands upon thousands have been massacred. We know there is more poverty, there is lack of access to healthcare, millions of Afghans have been displaced, and the Taliban now are back in power and they are emboldened. History, unfortunately, is riddled with these colossal and unmitigated failures of Europe, the United States, and their allies like Australia to intervene, to control, and attempt to extinguish complicated Middle Eastern conflicts. And every time it has made the situation worse and inflicted insurmountable heavy toll on the people who have been invaded, all to keep the Western military war machine going. The same war machine that enlists and uses people and then abandons veterans in the aftermath. For decades now, the people of Afghanistan have been caught between the misogynistic and extremely violent Taliban on the one hand and the deadly consequences of allied forces on the other. And in all of this, 
the hollow self-serving concerns about the safety of women were paraded around to justify the ongoing Western intervention and Australia's involvement in the invasion and occupation of Afghanistan. When we all know full well that women, girls and children bear a vastly disproportionate burden of war itself and the havoc that comes after. You know, people love to speak on behalf of Muslim women as if we have no agency, no capacity to resist or fight back, as if we need to be perpetually protected by the white savior industrial complex. I know this very well, even though I'm in a position of relative privilege. But no one knows this better than my sisters in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and in Syria, who have endured Western military invasion, occupation, and war. So this is an important time to step back and listen to what Afghan women have to say. Malala Joya, a leading Afghan women's rights activist and former parliamentarian, has said the plight of women in Afghanistan has always served as a very good excuse for Western military intervention and, that, and has asked that the occupation be rebranded from the war on terror to the war on innocent Afghan people. All the while, she says the nature of Taliban hasn't changed and women are again going to bear the brunt of the current crisis. Malala says, and I quote, no nation can donate liberation to another nation. And she goes on to say, what we need from abroad is not war machines, but humanitarian aid. And this is the time for Australia to provide that aid in spades. History will not look kindly upon John Howard for being part of creating this bloody mess, nor Scott Morrison and his government for your morally bankrupt response to the crisis in Afghanistan. We don't just owe the people of Afghanistan an apology. We owe them permanent protection in Australia. We owe them reparations and humanitarian assistance, the scale of which should dwarf our military spend. This is the least and should do. And we must do it right now. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Sheldon, also remotely. Good, thank you, uh, Acting uh, Deputy President. The Prime Minister has described Afghanistan as a failed state and tried to shrug off all responsibility for the countless Afghan citizens who have come to believe Australia would do the right thing by them. Well, right now, we are doing the absolute wrong thing by them. And the only failure is in this government's duty of care to the people of Afghanistan, who stood for two decades beside Australian forces. Any Afghan person who has worked with the Australians during the past 20 years now, now knows their life has become the plaything of a resurgent Taliban. And ethnic uh, Hazaras in particular know that they are in grave danger. The lives and livelihoods are under direct threat. Many of them have family in Australia. 2016 census noted nearly 47,000 Afghanistan born people here. These are real people, Australians, who are watching their loved ones in Afghanistan face persecution and worse. Today, I spoke to Jamila Gurdjistani, an ethnic, an ethnic uh, Hazari woman who is a lawyer, trade unionist, and proud Australian, well, a friend and colleague. Jamila said that the entire Afghan community is horrified both at what is happening in Afghanistan and what the Morrison government is not doing about it. Why were no plans put in place by Australia to assist people, she asked me. Australia knew this was going to happen. Jamila went on to say, I have cousins in Afghanistan who can no longer go to school, no longer go to work. They cannot even leave the house. Women who had jobs in offices are now being told to have their male relatives replace them. She said further, Afghanistan was not a failed state like Morrison says, it was doing well. Women were doctors, women were in parliament. She said she also fears for rel relatives here existing on temporary uh, protection visas who now are frightened that they'll be sent back to Afghanistan. 
What an horrific uh, approach by this government. How heartless. It's been reported that there are more than 4,000 Afghan refugees in Australia with temporary protection visas. Jamila told her young nephew in Australia who watched the horrifying spectacle last week of a desperate Afghan people clinging to the undercarriage of a US military air transport as it took off, some of them eventually falling to the deaths. He said, how come the world doesn't care about our people? Jamila went on to say, he said to her, it's not only distressing to me and my mum, to the adults here, but also to the kids knowing their cousins have been treated like this. And Jamila is outraged. The Morrison government's dot whistling about not letting in, and I quote, terrorists, and saying there's not much that can be done for a country that won't help itself. Jamila's response to that, I think she more aptly um, describes it than I do. Jamila said, why was it good enough to be guarding the Australian embassy with machine guns for 20 years and now you say they're terrorists, she asked. It's extremely disrespectful and it makes us angry. You trusted them for 20 years to work with you. Now, Jamila arrived in Australia as a refugee with other family members in 1997, age seven, after her father was slaughtered by the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. Before she was 15 years old, she had a job flipping burgers at McDonald's. Then when she finished school, she got a law degree so that, and I quote, I could help people like me. She has worked in the union movement ever since. The siblings are all professional success stories. A sister who was an engineer, another who works in banking, a brother who's a senior figure with the Commonwealth Bank, another brother who's in landscaping. But without an immediate assistance program for Afghan refugees, she says she knows that their, their family members will never be seen again. I can't go to Afghanistan, she said, not even in 10 years time and with the Taliban there. And there are my cousins going, going to go. They're going to be put tortured and persecuted. Acting Deputy President, Australia owes people like Jamila and Jamila's cousins, nephews and nieces in Afghanistan immediate consideration. And we need to owe our debt to members of the Australian Defence Force and the diplomatic community who have themselves given so much in Afghanistan's cause, and particularly in the case of the 41 ADF members who made the ultimate sacrifice. And of course, the many more of the 39,000 Australians who served over there, you've, you know, you've done a wonderful job. And Jamila is actually, uh, and her comments about families, women now getting jobs, in, having jobs in parliament, uh, having jobs in, uh, importantly, in civil society, uh, being employed and, and properly treated and educated is a great um, uh, basis of uh, pride for us as Australians. But there has been calls in recent days from across Australia to society to increase the refugee intake from Afghanistan, just as Australia did for Syria in 2015. But China, after the 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre, or even the conclusion of the Vietnam War, and of World War II. Australia has had proud history of offering succor to refugees, a history that is being uh, truncated right now by this callous disregard, dog whistling and shambolic policy making. Prime Minister's opening gambit when Kabul fell to the Taliban last week was to admit that, and I quote, support won't reach all that is it should, all that it should. On the ground, events have overtaken many efforts. I wish it were very different. Well, it can be different, if only we make it so. Refugees have been the bedrock of modern Australia and have made us the nation we are. We are simply owe these, this to the people who have laid down everything for Australians in Afghanistan. News reports in recent days have quoted former Australian Army Captain Jason Skeynes who said that the delay in processing humanitarian visa applications meant that many interpreters, particularly those stranded outside of Kabul, could not be rescued now. Captain Skeynes was reported to the Guardian as saying, the reality is if the government had been committed to this locally engaged employee visa program 
efficiently instead of a lazy bureaucratic relaxed attitude processing applications, they would not be facing this huge evacuation and evacuation that the operation of the government just doesn't have capacity for. That was just last month, and yet the wheels ground ever more slowly. Captain Skane said veterans were, I quote, sick of the marketing of this government. Everything is marketing. Just tell us how many of our mates are left there. What are you going to do to get them out? Or are you just going to abandon them? This crisis, there is no time to dither. Just last month, the ABC reported a former interpreter who'd worked with Australian forces had been denied a visa to Australia on the grounds he was, and I quote, not considered an employee of one of the Australian government agencies. He said, according to the ABC, when I read the letter saying you are not eligible, I felt like my death warrant had been signed by the Australians. It is clear that the Taliban will capture and kill me whenever they get a chance. Well, even as recently as this weekend, locally engaged employees were reportedly told they did not qualify for visas and should contact a migration agent instead, before them being told that they would qualify for asylum after all. Well, we're at a moment in history where we can make decisions we can be proud of and which our children and grandchildren can be proud of. Or we can do the wrong thing. The choice is no choice at all, Mr. Acting, um, Acting Deputy President. It is Australia's moral imperative to act and to act swiftly by increasing our refugee intake for Afghan people. It's a matter of life and death. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. <laughs> Senator Shikoni remotely. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. I rise in support of this motion, and in doing so, I want to speak directly to those Australian servicemen and women, including members of the Australian Federal Police, who have committed and sacrificed so much throughout our country's long engagement in Afghanistan. I know that many of you may have been wondering over the course of the last week what your sacrifice was all for. Why did you and your comrades suffer the injuries that you did? Why did some not come home? After 20 years of conflict, exactly what was achieved? To those of you who have thought this, your thoughts are understandable. And whilst I can't pretend to know how to feel watching the scenes which we saw last week as the Taliban marched into Kabul, I can certainly appreciate the despair that must accompany these sites for you. To those who served, stand tall and let me reassure you that your efforts did indeed make a big and positive difference. Your work gave girls, boys, women, men and others opportunities that they had never had in that land before, freedoms previously unknown to them. Because of you, schoolyards were the place of children. Because of you, leaving home without a burqa or a male chaperone was acceptable. Your work gave cities, towns and villages the infrastructure that was so much needed the bridges, the waterways, the schools and the hospitals, just to name a few. Access to education must be one of the greatest differences that has been made. All this was your work. Thanks to you, international terror networks could no longer rely on Afghanistan to be a comfortable home for their hate-filled ideologies. Thanks to you, one of the world's most brutal regimes, Al-Qaeda, was dealt a devastating blow and Osama bin Laden was brought to justice. Your work has kept Australians safe. To those 39,000 of you who served your country in Afghanistan, I say thank you. To the 41 families who have lost loved ones in this conflict, no words I can say can take away from your grief. But know that the cause for which your loved ones gave their lives was a most notable one. 
that the price they paid was not paid in vain. It is clear that more needs to be done to support Australian veterans and their families following this war, which is why Labor has been calling on the government to proactively provide additional elements of support. Veterans are disproportionately afflicted by mental health concerns. We cannot shirk on our responsibility as elected members in this place to protect those who have protected our nation, our values and our freedoms. Australia is not that kind of nation and it is time that we spent greater focus on our veterans' welfare. And as I'll finish, for any veteran who is listening to today's proceedings or later reads these speeches in Hansard, please hold your heads high and remember our nation is proud of you, your hard work, your commitment and sacrifice. And we will never forget the immense sacrifices that you and our fallen mates have made. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Shikoni. Uh, Senator McCarthy, remotely. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Like the rest of Australia, the people of the Northern Territory were horrified to see the unfolding chaos and tragedy in Afghanistan. We have a large defence presence here in the Northern Territory, and many current and former members served in Afghanistan. My colleague, the member for Solomon, Luke Gosling, has, like many veterans, been horrified to see the Taliban surge across the country. The situation in Afghanistan playing out now is not their failure, not in any way the fault or responsibility of our defence forces or the many others who work to support our efforts in the country. Tens of thousands of Australians contributed to our mission in Afghanistan, which was largely successful. We built schools, roads and bridges, and a generation of young women received an education. And as Senator Wong said in her statement today, even the increase in the parliament and representation where there was no women, over 20% increase, our mission in Afghanistan would not have been possible without the support of the Afghan people on the ground, the interpreters, the guides, the cultural brokers. They are our comrades. Australia has historic links, as well as the modern connections to Afghanistan. 150 years ago, the first Afghans came to Australia largely as cameleers. They were employed to explore the arid heart of Australia with their ships of the desert, as the traditional horses and wagons used for such expeditions were not suitable for the harsh out conditions of the outback. The Cameliers were collectively known as Afghans, though a number of them came from other countries and regions as well. They played a major role in delivering freight and essential goods to the new settlements in South Australia and here in the Northern Territory. And the rich heritage of these Afghans is evident very much so throughout Central Australia in particular. Their names in places and their families like Saturdine, Muhammad, Satua, Khan, Maladad, just to name a few. The connection is there with the name of one of our most iconic rail journeys, the Gan Railway. We've seen other countries with a much larger contingent of locally engaged staff make huge efforts to move them out of Afghanistan and to safety. Australia did not, and this is to our shame. We knew, and we knew for some time, the international withdrawal from Afghanistan was coming. We had time to prepare an evacuation plan for our local support workers. We had time to get our diplomatic staff out but the Australian government is stumbling around caught up in its own red tape. There are reports and some applications for protection visas have been rejected because the applicants were subcontracted, not directly employed by the Australian government. This is just bureaucratic fiddling. People's lives are on the line. 
There have been countless reports of Afghans seeking help, being overwhelmed by paperwork and process, while their safety becomes increasingly precarious. The Prime Minister has claimed that everything was being done to bring these Afghans to Australia, but there is really little evidence of that. It is a relief to see we finally have flights going in, and I do thank the brave men and women of the ADF and the officials from the various government departments who are assisting the operation all at great risk now. Instead of creating bureaucratic mazes, the government should have been and should now be fast-tracking visas and evacuations for Afghan family members of Australian citizens and permanent residents. We must open up the thousands of unused humanitarian places for Afghans who are at risk of harm by the Taliban, including especially the women and girls. And we must ensure Afghans in Australia on temporary visas have pathways to remain and that they won't be involuntarily deported. I wholeheartedly support the call by the member for Solomon to open up Gladen Point here in Darwin to Afghan evacuees. The facility already has defence using it in a limited capacity for quarantine purposes. There is no reason it couldn't be a quarantine point for those Afghans coming to Australia seeking complete safety. We know we do quarantine very well here in the Northern Territory, in particular at Howard Springs. In Afghanistan, our Defence Forces did great things in extremely challenging circumstances and sometimes against impossible odds. It is coming up to the anniversary of September 11th when we will reflect and remember. And we need to do so with pride and a belief that we did what we could and that we must never abandon those in Afghanistan. Thank you, Thank Senator you. McCarthy. There being no other speakers on this motion, I will put the question that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. We now move to the MPI in accordance with the altered sitting schedule for today. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, eight proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Urquhart proposing a matter of public importance was chosen. It is shown at item 13 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? The proposal is supported. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers for today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly, and I call Senator Green. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be joining uh, the Senate from Cairns tonight um, to be talking about this incredibly important issue. Um, it is clear that we have been led down a path of complacency by the Prime Minister. This is not a race. Those were the words that he used and the words the Prime Minister will be forever haunted by. In what has been it become the most important of our times, at least in our lifetimes, where Australians have needed strong and effective leadership. We have been badly let down and we are all suffering the consequences. Half of the country is currently in lockdown. People are under immense stress. Workers are losing their jobs. Businesses that people have spent their entire lives building are closing their doors. And yet our Prime Minister said, it is not a race, it is not a competition. And he didn't just say that once, he said it repeatedly. Scott Morrison said the vaccine rollout was not a race on the 11th of March this year, and he said it three times. He said it twice on the 14th of March and again on the 13th, 31st of March as well. And why is this phrase so important? Why did it mean so much to the Australian people? Because it led to the complacency that this government has allowed to occur that has dropped our vaccine rollout down to the lowest level in the rest of the OCD countries. We are now seeing, as a result, 
the highest, highest daily COVID case numbers since the pandemic began 18 months ago. And we all saw those terrifying numbers in New South Wales announced earlier today of 818 cases. It is a dire and difficult situation for all of the residents, including my family who live in southwest Sydney. People are dying, children are getting sick. The burden on families and businesses is immeasurable. People are struggling to see the light at the end of the tunnel, and yet the government thinks that this is what they need to be talking about. Scott Morrison uh, says that he doesn't play politics with the pandemic, and yet we have seen time and time again uh, this Prime Minister uh, feel that he doesn't need to support a lockdown in New South Wales, but also crucify other states from imposing restrictions in an effort to save their communities from ongoing pain. And it was precisely that encouragement of the New South Wales Premier and her decision not to lock down this Delta outbreak that has caused so much damage to our economy and to our society. The fact is that we're in this position because Prime Minister Scott Morrison failed to do his job. He failed to do two things, fix quarantine and get the vaccine rollout right. This is, in fact, a race, and it has always been a race. It's been a race for survival for so many communities and so many people. But the stark reality of the numbers that we have seen in the last couple of days shows that Scott Morrison has failed. You only need to look at the vaccination rates of some of our most vulnerable Australians to understand this. If you're an aged care worker, a person with a disability, an Indigenous Australian, you have been let down by this Prime Minister. If you see that the data that was released recently showed that the two states with the largest First Nations populations, New South Wales and Queensland, are sitting at critically low levels of First Nations vaccination rates. As of last week, both were sitting at around 8%. And these people were priorities in, under this government. And today we're seeing startling figures around the number of staff working in aged care homes that are yet to be vaccinated. And we know that in the Melbourne Victorian lockdowns of last year, the fact that aged care workers carried viruses into homes was devastating for so many people and so many families. This government was fully warned about needing to vaccinate aged care workers, and yet the Scott, Scott Morrison said that it was not a race. Today, we have reports that in some facilities in my hometown of Cairns, that we've got vaccination rates of aged care workers sitting at less than 10%. Less than 10% after six months of the vaccine rollout under Scott Morrison. If you're an NDIS participant, chances are you haven't even had your first dose yet. Just over a quarter of NDIS participants have been fully vaccinated. First doses have only reached 44%. And these people, the NDIS participants that we are talking about today, were in the priority uh, 1A under this government. And yet, Scott Morrison said that it was not a race. These are groups that the federal government say are our highest priority and the most vulnerable people that we need to get vaccinated. Otherwise, we'll never be able to open up again. But, but Scott Morrison continues continued to say that this was not a race. The truth is, in times of crisis, people need a leader, someone that stands up for us, all faces the tough questions, makes big calls, someone that is decisive, someone that can offer hope. And yet what we got instead with this Prime Minister was, it's not my job, it's a matter for the states, I don't hold a hose. We get a Prime Minister that sits back and lets members of his own government ranks spew irresponsible drivel about misinformation, about COVID-19, about masks, about lockdowns. It is no wonder that there is hesitancy in the community when the Prime Minister has failed to stop these people saying that masks don't work, that lockdowns don't work, and that you don't need to get the vaccine. I'm not the only one that feels so bitterly and disappointed about the position that Australians find themselves in. I'm lucky enough to live in one of the best parts of the world in far north Queensland, but our town is hurting badly and it is a devastating sight to see. 
Cafes, which are normally full of tourists, are near empty. At this time of year, the lagoon pool on our famous esplanade is usually bustling with people, but right now it is sparse. The marina is full of boats as there simply aren't enough people to take them out. North Queensland's tourism industry is on the brink and there are widespread fears in the industry and the community that this is the end for many operators. They survived 2020, but now they will close their doors. A local tourism leader said recently, the tourism industry is on its knees. Another who closed their doors last week after operating for 30 years said, I won't be the last one. Further down in the Whit Sundays, operators are facing a similar situation. As one early beach business suggests, their struggles are far from over and the outlook is still pretty dismal. This has always been a race and the Morrison government must step up and provide certainty to North Queensland businesses as they continue to struggle in this pandemic from the devastating effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. We are at a crisis point now with this, these communities. The Prime Minister needs to face these businesses and give them a plan forward not just a vaccination plan or a plan to end lockdowns, which we know will happen eventually, but not for some time to come. We need a plan for support. And that's what I've been calling for in Cairns and, and in these speeches in Parliament, is for a, a wage subsidy scheme for these businesses. That is what they have been calling for. And extraordinarily, today we've discovered that the local member, Warren Inch, decided that instead of approaching the minister, instead of approaching the treasurer or the prime minister directly for this additional support, actually wrote to the state government to ask for support and said that the support that had already been provided by the Commonwealth government was inadequate, that it hadn't gone far enough. It is pretty extraordinary when you've got a member of this government knowing that it would be better to approach the state government for support than to go and ask for support from the Treasurer, from um, Scott Morrison. It is also pretty extraordinary that we're in a situation now where we know that people are going to lose their jobs and yet the Morrison government has failed to deliver support for these businesses. These are people who have supported the coalition in the past. These are people who've supported the local member in the past, but they have been hung out to dry under this government. What these businesses and what these tourism operators need is a wage subsidy scheme. They need that now because of Scott Morrison's failures. They need that now because we are in lockdown and we're not going to be out of lockdown for quite some time to come. Vaccinations rates are increasing, but not fast enough to save these businesses. We know how important it is for these businesses to get tourism support. And yet the government has failed to deliver on wage subsidies that will actually protect jobs. The local member, Warren Ench, said himself that this support that has been given so far from the Commonwealth Government is inadequate and falls short of what is required. So we are asking the federal government to finally step up. This is a race. It is a race to deliver support to businesses before they close their doors. Order it is a Senator race Gray, to get people vaccinated. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, well, I'm sure the good people of Leichhardt will uh, know that their MP, Warren Inch, is an outstanding representative who will always fight for their interests in this place and wherever he uh, has an opportunity to advocate in their best interests. And he's done that for many, many, many years, and I have every single confidence that he'll do it after the next federal election as well. Let's have a look at this matter of public interest. And the first thing I note about it is it's backward looking. It is backward looking. It's talking about what happened, what was said in March 2021. We're talking about this the last two weeks of sitting, and we're back here today. A matter of public interest that's backward looking. Looking at the past, it's not looking at the present, it's not looking at the future, it's playing a blame game on in the past. A blame game in the past. Looking at words that were uttered in March 2021. The Australian people have moved on. The Australian people have moved on. They're looking at today and they want to look towards their future. They want to look towards their future. So if Senator Green is interested in correspondence with the Premier of Queensland, maybe she should pick up the phone and talk to the Premier of Queensland about her comments over the last few days and of Deputy Premier Stephen Miles, which appear to suggest 
some sort of resiling from the national agreement which was entered into by the national cabinet. So maybe Senator Green needs to communicate with the Premier of Queensland, just as the MP for Leichhardt, my good friend Warren Ench, has communicated with, with uh, the Premier. Because some of the rhetoric coming out of Queensland is disturbing. It's political and disturbing. Let's look at the facts. Let's look at the facts of where we're up to actually at the moment. Where are we today? 1.8 million doses of vaccine delivered in the last seven days. 1.8 million doses delivered in the last seven days. I don't remember that being referred to in Senator Green's uh, discussion in her contribution to this debate. There was absolutely no recognition whatsoever as to what the current status is with respect to the vaccine rollout. No balanced commentary. How can someone take seriously a, a contribution in this place if there's a total lack of balance in terms of the representation as to what the current facts are. More than 85 per cent of over 70s are protected with the first dose of the vaccine. Over 85 per cent of that most vulnerable cohort already protected by a first dose of the vaccine, and more than 55 per cent have received a second dose. Going to the next cohort, over 70 per cent of over 50s are protected with a first dose, and more than 40 per cent have received a second dose. And that means more than one in two of the eligible population aged over 16 are protected with the first dose. Look at the facts, Madam Acting Deputy President. Look at the facts involved in the case. And if you want to criticise, if you want to criticise the existing government, make a contribution that's balanced, that takes into account the current situation, and then make some sort of constructive, constructive proposal with respect to moving forward. All of that was totally absent from Senator Green's contribution to this debate. It hasn't been absent with respect to the Prime Minister's, the Prime Minister's contributions. He said this. He might have said what he said in March, but he also said this subsequently. And I quote, I take responsibility. I take responsibility for the early setbacks in our vaccination program, full stop. End quote. He said that. So at least when you get up on the other side, at least when those speakers on the other side get up, recognise the fact that the Prime Minister has taken responsibility, but also recognise the fact, also recognise the fact that, and I quote, I also take responsibility for getting them fixed and that we are now matching world's best rates with more than one million doses. End quote. Also recognise that. Make a balanced contribution to this debate. Make a balanced contribution to this debate. And stop looking backwards. Stop looking backwards. Move on. Look at the current situation and provide something positive for the Australian people to move forward in, forward with. The Australian public is sick and tired of rank-based politicking on these issues. They really are, and the rhetoric is just dreadful, and it continues to be dreadful. We need to come together. We need to come together as a civic society and deal with these issues. It should be recognised. It should be recognised that up to today's date, Australia has done. Australia has done, as well as any country on the face of this earth, dealing with this, vaccine, dealing with this COVID-19 pandemic. We've done as well as anyone, as well as anyone, as a country. Just as we're uniting as a country to assist those poor Afghanis in Kabul and provide them assistance. As a country, we've done as well as anyone. Has it been perfect? No. But there was no dress rehearsal for one in 100-year pandemic. There was no dress rehearsal. So there will be mistakes. There will be things that need to be adjusted, but at least be balanced in terms of your commentary, because at least when you're balanced, I can have some sort of respect for the positive suggestions that come from the other side. Otherwise, all your contributions are just tainted with that rank politicking. The Prime Minister made some extremely, extremely positive comments today with respect to our pathway out of this pandemic. The first point he made was this. We need to live with the virus, not in fear of it. We need to live with the virus, not in fear of it. And that is absolutely crucial. The fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is that we are not going to eliminate COVID in the foreseeable future. We just won't. And the Australian people, the Australian people, I think, generally understand that. And we have to assist them in terms of coming to grips with the reality of the situation, which is well documented in the national plan, on a page, plan on a page. We're currently in phase one, the current phase, vaccinate, prepare and pilot. The next phase, once we achieve that 70 per cent threshold, 
is the vaccine transition phase, which, and I quote, and this is the important point, seeks to minimise serious illness, hospitalisation and fatality as a result of COVID-19 with low level restrictions. It doesn't seek to eliminate it because that's not possible. It's not possible to eliminate it. It seeks to minimise serious illness, hospitalisation and fatality as a result of COVID-19 with low level restrictions. And then phase C, once we hit the 80 per cent threshold of vaccinations, seek to minimise serious illness, hospitalisations and fatalities as a result of COVID-19 with baseline restrictions. And then phase four, phase D as it's referred to, manage COVID-19 consistent with public health management of other infectious diseases. We have to all get on the same page, on the one-page national plan. We all have to be on the same page if we're going to defeat the ramifications of this virus and move forward as a united country. We need to be on the same page. And it's there, it's there in black and white for all of us to follow and to support with our community. And if there are constructive, if there are constructive issues, if there are constructive suggestions from those opposite, absolutely make those constructive suggestions and, and make them, absolutely make them. But when you do it, at least be fair with respect to assessing the current situation and be fair with respect to how the Australian, Australia as a country, and I include local level government, the states, the federal government, civic society generally, the Australian people, be fair and balanced with respect to where we are today instead of running our own country down. It's quite deplorable, the rhetoric. We, we're not going to get out of this crisis with this sort of rhetoric. We are not going to get out of this crisis with this sort of re rhetoric. Absolutely not. This has to be a team game. It's got to be a team game, Madam Acting Deputy President. We cannot go indefinitely. We can't go on indefinitely in lockdown. We just can't do it. We don't have the financial resources to do it. We can't bear the mental illness that is, flows from these lockdowns. We're crushing people's mental health. Small businesses are being destroyed. Senator Green did refer to the impact on tourism in Cairns. And she's absolutely right. It's a devastating impact in Cairns. But we have, to, we have to unite behind the national plan and move forward. We absolutely have to. There's no alternative. There are absolutely no, no alternative whatsoever. And as we do that, as we unite behind that national plan, as we do that, we need to do it with mutual respect. We have to do it with mutual respect for the views of all those in the chamber and all those in the community. So many people in this country are, are struggling on so many levels, and we need to respect and appreciate that everyone has a right to their own views in our democratic society. We need to do it with empathy, appreciating how difficult the current situation is for everyone in this country. And we also need to look forward. We need to look forward in hope, look forward in hope rather than backwards in bitterness. That's what people are looking for us to do. To look forward in hope, not backwards in bitterness. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Seawitt. Thank you. And I've only got a couple of minutes before adjournment. Uh, we move to adjournment. I am looking to the future. I'm looking to the future of this country and the health of our population. And in order to do that, we need to get the plan right. And that plan is not right because does, it does not include vaccinate, vaccinating and importantly, targets for young people in the national plan. The government says we're going to open up at getting to 80 per cent, but 80 per cent is actually only 64 per cent of the entire population. And children and young people under the age of 16 are the ones that are now high getting COVID in large numbers. In Victoria alone, 112 children under the age of 10 have COVID. 112 between the age of 10 and 19. Over 200, I think it is today, in New South Wales, children, and yet children are not included in our targets. Children are not included in our targets. So until we include children in our targets, we will not get properly to 80%. Order. And if Senator Seawitt, uh, it being 7.20 p.m., I propose that the Senate now adjourn. Senator Bragg. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, I rise tonight to make some remarks about the ongoing 
uh, COVID issues in Australia. And I think what the Australian people are looking for uh, is clear leadership uh, and a, a pathway out of this 18-month nightmare, which for so many people um, has been a defining moment in their lives. If they've been running a small business or you're a young child at school, you may have started uh, at primary school or high school and it's uh, severely impacted your life. I mean, I think one of the issues we have in this debate is that there are people who work for large businesses that have been unaffected or people who are in the public sector who do not feel the weight of the decisions that are made by uh, state and federal government. And so in looking for that leadership, and I think that leadership has been on clear display over the past few days, uh, it is very important that we are honest with the Australian people about the prospects of getting to COVID zero. I mean, COVID zero is a dead duck. Uh, it cannot be achieved. Um, there is virtually no major city in the world which has been able to turn the Delta variant uh, into a COVID zero situation. And I think anyone who wants to perpetuate uh, this myth and this lie that COVID zero uh, is an appropriate policy objective um, is only damning people who run small businesses and kids who want to go to school uh, to a life locked behind the bars of their own home where they can't earn an income and they can't learn as they usually would. Now, I represent the state of New South Wales, uh, which has been dealing with a significant COVID outbreak. And I would say that um, the lockdowns there have had an extraordinary impact on people who are, uh, as I say, running small businesses or people who are uh, working, uh, people who are wanting to go to school. Uh, I mean, the, the cure is becoming worse than the illness. And I think that the, the, the remarks made by the Treasurer last week that uh, it is a fallacy, as he said, for anyone to think we can actually eliminate the virus is very important. Uh, as Friedberg went on to say, uh, we can't, no country has done it. Based on the vaccines and the efficacy we know today, based on the medical advice, uh, you cannot eliminate the virus. We have to live with it. And that is the message that the people need to hear, because that is the truth. We have to live with this virus, and the national plan gives us a way out of this. Most importantly, we have to get away from this idea that lockdowns are going to be appropriate going forward, uh, because uh, the impact of lockdowns uh, you know, is, is very hard to, to quantify in an, e in an economic sense. But the social impact, I think, is very clear, that it is hugely damaging to people's mental health, the inability to uh, visit a friend, uh, the inability to visit uh, a dying relative, uh, are things that uh, cannot be quantified. Now, I want to move on to this, uh, the issue about the different views on COVID, COVID zero. Now, COVID zero uh, is a policy that uh, is being pursued by the state of Western Australia, where the Premier of Western Australia, Mr McGowan, has said, we reserve the right to lock down in specific locations if absolutely ne necessary. Now, this is after Western Australia is meeting its 80 per cent benchmark of vaccination. Now, th this is absolute madness. And if this is a policy that Western Australia is going to pursue, uh, Western Australia will be a hermit kingdom. I mean, no one will want to go there. I mean, why would you invest a cent in Western Australia if they're going to pursue lockdowns even after they've met their agreed targets in the national plan? Um, uh, much has been written and said about the events of the past few months in New South Wales, but I have to say that I think that the Premier of New South Wales has been honest uh, and clear and upfront with the people. And uh, Premier Berejiklian has said in uh, the past few days that, of course, we want to see the cases go down. There's no doubt about that. But the number that we need to focus on is vaccinations. And when we've reached 70 per cent double dose, we will be able to live more freely. And when we get to 80 per cent double dose, essentially, we will have normalised the way that we treat COVID. You start to transition and you treat COVID as you treat the flu and in terms of how you record hospitalisations and the way the community is going. So that is, that is leadership because that is, that is the truth, that we have to get to the point where COVID uh, is treated just like any other illness. And people need to stop focusing on case numbers and focus on emissions into ICU uh, and vac vaccination rates. I mean, that is the only way. I mean, the, the only reason that you would want to 
maintain a policy of having these dreadful, dreaded lockdowns once you've reached 80 per cent vaccination rates is because you're addicted to the political power uh, that you have and the control you have over, the, over your citizens. Well, that, that is not the way that the Australian people can live uh, and will live in the future. Uh, now, if you look at the numbers today of vaccination rates, we have done well in New South Wales. Uh, we are going to hit 60 per cent in the next few days of people having had their first dose, and that is 15 points ahead of Western Australia. So my advice to Western Australia is that uh, they need to get on board with uh, getting vaccinated because that is going to get them, uh, hopefully, uh, to a position where they can have some more freedom. But who knows? Uh, with this fellow in charge over there, it sounds like he really has a uh, major problem uh, if he wants to pursue lockdowns even after they've received 80 per cent uh, vaccination. So, look, um, at the end of the day, the cost of the lockdowns uh, is $2 billion a week. It is not something that the nation can afford in an economic sense. Uh, and we have to get to the point where we can live with this, this virus. So I commend uh, the leadership and the plain speaking of the Treasurer and the PM and uh, Premier Birojiklian over the past few days, where, people, where we, are, we are being open and honest with the people that this is a virus that cannot be eliminated. It will be there permanently. Uh, it needs to be managed in a way where we reflect upon the numbers of people in ICU and the vaccination rates. We don't care about case numbers anymore. And the more that people obsess about case numbers and the, and the fallacy and the big lie of COVID zero, the more damage we're going to do to people's mental health and the more economic damage we will do to the whole nation. Now, of course, we are a Commonwealth of States and we don't want to see hermit kingdoms emerge in any part of our great Commonwealth. So we don't want to see Western Australia pursue crazy policies like COVID zero. We don't want to see Western Australia uh, flagging and lagging in its vaccination program. We want to see Western Australia remain a strong, connected state uh, where it has been a great contributor to our federation in recent times. Uh, so you know, we really urge our Western Australian uh, state government to, uh, to wake up to itself, uh, to forget about uh, COVID zero. Uh, it is not been possible for any country, any major city to pursue a policy of COVID zero against the Delta variant, uh, and certainly Mr McGowan will not, will not be successful in the long run, and all he will do is damage his own uh, jurisdiction, but also, I think, inflict great damage and great confusion uh, upon the Australian people, uh, where we now have a, a clear plan which is working, the vaccines are kicking off, and I urge uh, Mr McGowan to uh, get real and get a grip. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator Griff, remotely. Yes, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Two weeks ago, I spoke here about the disturbing history of chemical regulation in this country and why we need to pay close attention to what is going on. For too long, this has been a subject many of us have ignored. It's dry and technical, not something that naturally holds our interest. But chemical regulation is also vitally important important for the health of our loved ones and for the quality of our natural environment. When we don't pay close attention, special interests take advantage and tweak the rules in their favour. Tweaks that enable them to profit at a cost to everybody else. Just last week, the US Environmental Protection Agency made an important decision that throws this issue into stark relief. They chose to ban the use of chlorpyrifos in the United States. This chemical was patented by Dow Chemical in the 1960s and has been used around the world, including Australia, as a pesticide. It is highly toxic and damages the nervous system of insects such as beetles, fruit flies, locusts and worms. This has made it particularly useful as an agricultural pesticide. The Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority allows its use in Australia and the Australian New Zealand Food Standards Code implicitly accepts its use as a pesticide by allowing food to be sold even with chlorpyrifos residue, even with chlorpyrifos residue. While it is particularly useful in agriculture, it also has, a, also has residential uses as a way of controlling cockroaches, fleas and termites. But the problem with chlorpyrifos 
is the same thing which makes it useful. It is unbelievably toxic. It doesn't just interfere with the nervous system of pets, sorry, pests and other insects. It does the same thing with humans and especially children. Poor pyrifos exposure is associated with lower birth weights, slower motor development and attention problems. The risks and the harms are now well established, built on an evidence base that has accumulated over many decades. The science is clear. Chlorpyrifos is harmful and it is very, very dangerous. But chlorpyrifos is not just harmful on its own. It interacts with the other chemicals in our environments and our bodies. And importantly, it is not just toxic in isolation. Chlorpyrifos can interact with other chemicals and become even more toxic and even more harmful. Concerns over the safety of chlorpyrifos have been raised by scientists and medical experts for decades. Initially, those concerns were linked to accidental poisoning of children and side effects suffered by those applying the chemical. But over time, it has become clear that chlorpyrifos is a del, 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 I can't even say it, would you believe, developmental neurotoxin, a chemical that affects the development of a baby's brain. That is why the US EPA chose to ban residential uses of chlorpyrifos back in 2000. It is also why the Australian regulator banned the chemical from household use. But in regard to banning household use, it took us an unbelievable 19 years longer than the US for Australia to do so. 19 years longer. Almost two decades after the scientific evidence of harm became overwhelming and forced overseas regulators to act. Two decades in which the evidence continued to pile up. Two decades in which the regulator failed to act. Two decades in which a number of ministers and a number of governments failed to act. Two decades in which Australians continue to be exposed to this dangerous chemical. How many children were born in those two decades? How many were exposed to chlorpyrifos and now suffer from learning and de <laughs> developmental disabilities? How much pain and suffering could have been avoided if our government acted to protect our health and well-being sooner? We will never know. Last week's EPA decision was welcomed by many who have seen firsthand the devastating effects of chlorpyrifos. The US EPA has done the right thing, which is more than we can say for Australia's regulators. But it should be noted this outcome was in spite of considerable political and corporate pressure. 15 years ago, the weight of scientific evidence showed that chlorpyrifos was harmful at much lower concentrations than expected. Those expectations had been set by data produced by Dow Chemical, who hold the chlorpyrifos patent back in the 1960s. Regulators around the world, including Australia, relied on this data to determine how the chemical could be used, and they continue to do so. By the mid-2000s, the science was telling us this data was wrong. The US EPA was aware of the new evidence at that time, but they refused to act. The decision was ultimately one for their administrator, who is, in the US, a political appointee. The Obama administration only began the process of phasing out chlorpyrifos in 2015, in the last months of that presidency. The process was, not surprisingly, abandoned under the Trump administration, and the new Biden administration has done very little. It took a court to force the US EPA to make a science-based decision their ruling was scathing about the EPA's conduct, stating, and I quote, the EPA's delay exposed a generation of American children to unsafe levels of chlorpyrifos, end of quote. J. 
generations of American children to unsafe levels. This ruling ultimately led to the chemical being banned in the US. But it is interesting that the political leaders, both in the US and here in Australia, are often so reluctant to take action that protects public health. There can be no doubt that delays and inaction benefit industry players. 14 years of delay in the US, and who knows how many in Australia, must be worth a lot of money to Dow and its industry colleagues. Clearly, it is worth more to them than the health and well-being of Australians. The question we must ask is, when will Australia follow the lead of the American and European regulators and finally ban this dangerous and harmful chemical? And if the regulators won't take action, will the minister step in and force them to take action? I'm certain the minister would point to the reviews, the consultations, the engagements that have been undertaken and claim that the appropriate processes are being followed. But the fact is that farmers can still use chlorpyrifos. The regulator has 37 permitted uses listed on its website and more than 90 different products which use the chemical. It is legal for them to use these products on our food, food that can be consumed by pregnant mothers and will affect their children. It is time for that to well and truly change. It is also time for us to change how we approach chemical regulation in Australia. How many other chemicals like chlorpyrifos are out there? Chemicals known to be harmful but legal for use on farms and in homes. Chemicals that will be banned if regulators followed the science and were free from corporate and political interference. Chemicals that are just not safe. As I've said in previous weeks, we must adopt a precautionary principle in chemical regulation and assume a product is unsafe until it can be proven otherwise. And we need to do this immediately. Immediately for our own health, for our children's health, and for our environment's health. Thank you, Senator Griff. The Senate stands adjourned and we'll meet again tomorrow at 12 noon.